I am not trying to do videos in my van all the time. It just seems to be I spend a lot of time here. This is one piss poor day in Texas. Reminds me more of the UK than anything else. We don't have weather like this a lot in Texas. When it rains, it's done in 30 minutes and, you can't, and there's no evidence for it whatsoever. I'm leaving the property. I'm in Leggett, Texas. Got some things on my mind. Well, actually, other people have things on their minds. So I'm getting a lot of the same, same letters, same content. So, since it's raining, since it looks like shit out here, may as well talk about a shitty topic. As soon as we get off this old, old beat up road, that's really no good on the tires. Get out here on Highway 59. Moves a little faster on this highway anyway. The subject matter of post-apocalyptic survival has come up over and over in my dialogues with different people on the phone. Uh, material that Matthew Devereaux has forwarded me. Our group moderator, Stephen Walsworth, has even mentioned a time, time or two. It's some newer people that I'm not real familiar with, but equally have a stake in our future. So to, in, order, in order to understand exactly what we're going to be going through in 19.5 years, we have no, we have no better way to analyze this material or the future than to basically recap the past. Subsurface cities. Yes, one has been found in the Grand Canyon. Over 61 underground facilities have been found in ancient Turkey. I mean, the first one was discovered in 1962. Petra is another one that was later rediscovered after the cataclysm, after people had abandoned it, and even the Romans had added, added their, own, their own dressing and architecture to it. But these underground facilities like Phoenix Hill in China, and so many others have been found, they're fallout shelters. They're very sophisticated. People had bored through solid rock to create these underground facilities to survive. There was something on the surface they feared. And it wouldn't have been a flood because a flood would have drowned those people out. It was something else. Something for which the historical record is silent. The reason the historical record is silent is because the advent of writing is nowhere near as ancient as we are told. Dates are pushed back on Sumerian logograms and cuneiform and, and proto-hieroglyphics. And we are told that writing first appeared in 3300 BC and all. It's not true. We have traditions that assert that their histories began at that date. But Minoan Linear A does not date to that period. There are, there are no archaeological finds of Minoan tablets that date prior to 2000 BC. There are no Egyptian nothing hieroglyphic proto hieroglyphic proto sumerian there's nothing that dates to 2000 bc 2000 bc seems to be a threshold there are no sumerian writings that date that old what we have are babylonian Akkadian, elamite uh especially amorite texts that all do date from periods that were uh around 16th 17th 18th and even the 19th bc but in reference to older records and histories they are second hand. They have colophons that mention that they are merely copies of older writings, but those older writings do not exist. And if the older writings did exist, it would have been a very primitive form of writing. So, boy, it's really nasty out here. This rain's really beating on my van. I might need to obey the speed limit too, because I'm going awfully fast. I'm going to get out this fast lane. So we have a situation where the oldest monuments and cities uh, for which we have any evidence for that have been excavated in archaeology, like uh, Machu Picchu, uh, Sehu Sawasin, well, how you have, hey, you gotta forgive me, man, I am not Latino. I do not know how to say these South American, Central American places. Uh, I know Teotihuacan, Tiwanaku in, in Peru, the ancient cities of Mexico. The common denominator between all of these ancient sites is, is rudimentary. 
It's the fact that we have no written records about these people. We have no written records about anything other than the traditions that were passed down by locals who had survived something for which those civilizations had suffered. That is the common denominator we find around the world. All over, all, every inhabited continent is the same story. Vast stone metropolises are found, but the people living in or around them were merely survivors who had inherited the architecture, not knowing anything of the prior occupants. This should be cause for alarm. Imagine 19.5 years from now, when we suffer a phoenix reset that will end at least a quarter of the human population, which is going to be quite a bit by that period of time. Followed 6.5 years later in 2046 by a second reset, which is also by design, and has its own world chronology attached to it, going back 5,000 years, and it's very demonstrable. Two resets back to back. It's harrowing. 500 years in the future, what will New York City be like? The infrastructure will have totally collapsed, but the high-rise buildings, many of them, will still be standing there. So, I'm often asked, what's going to happen after May 15th, 2040? Well, one, life will continue, but for many people, it will cease. In some parts of the world, a trumpet sound will be, will be heard, and literally, people will be driven mad with the sound. They're going to go crazy and run in all different directions, but they're not going to run far because the sound is going to loosen up the ground. It's going to loosen up... It's going to loosen up every physical, material thing about 40 feet above the surface. The surface topography will actually become like, basically, like quicksand. And it will become like quicksand because it's going to, it's literally going to vibrate at, at such a frequency that it cannot support the weight of anything that's not vibrating at that certain same frequency, which will be organic material. Stone, gravel, all your harder surfaces, they're going, they're going to resonate with this. It's going to be terrifying. People are going to live to see other people sink into the ground screaming. Are they going to be able to help? Absolutely not. Because even in their own vehicles, they will be sinking as they watch other people suffer the exact same fate. Really not sure what's going to happen to airplane, aircraft helicopters and all that, but the sound will be coming from the sky, just like it has many other times before. So, in some parts of the world, it won't be a deafening sound. In some parts of the world, it's going to be a jet, jet black sky. The sun will be completely obliterated. Objects will fall from the sky. Not meteorites, but what, what archaeologists are calling tektites. Pieces of a fractured dome will fall from the sky and water and red mud will pour in on civilizations everywhere. Some will be completely entombed. Volcanoes all over the world will be erupting. It's very harrowing to fully grasp exactly what it is that the biblical material, the Sibylline oracles, the... the Ragnarok of the Vikings to totally imagine the prophecies of Mother Shipton, Ursula, Ursula South Hill, to envision what Nostradamus and the Book of Revelation are talking about. Every single one of these prophetic texts and, and, and personages were describing the same event. The Fenris wolf eating the, eating the sun. Every bit of this is a description from antiquity of what we are to expect in the future at the date, May 15th, 2040. Those of us who survive will be living and entering into a world unlike that of which we have lived in the past. It will be a new Neolithic. It will be a more Mad Max than anything else for the first 10 years because people will still have gasoline and bullets. But those will run out soon. And then archery and slingshots and spears will become the norm. The technological infrastructure will collapse for everybody who, who, who doesn't have a, a facilities that are going to maintain that. You know what? I'm really took a wrong turn. I should have stayed on 59 all the way to 190, but I didn't. I went right through downtown Livingston. 
I guess I wanted to give you a scenic tour. I don't know. Didn't mean to. <clears throat> I'm very compartmentalized. One, I get a lot done because I have a, a very intense focus, a one-track mind. Oh, there's the popo. Got to be careful with him. Him around holding a tablet in my hand. I know up here somewhere I'm going to run into 190. I'm going to have to. It's just simple geometry. It runs east to west and I'm going south. So it's got to be there. So the, po the post-apocalyptic world of 2040 AD, or common era for those of you who are offended by Anno Domini Reckoning, it's, it's going to be a very different war. It's going to, we're not going to have a centralized government that's going to uh, make sure you're okay. There's no more Medicare, there's no more hospitals, there's no more arenas. Those who find themselves in Superdomes and arenas are there because they're either watching blood sports or they're a victim of them. Gangland dictatorships will be the norm. Women and children and even men will be sold as slavery, uh, sex slaves, and will, will even be partitioned off as food. Long pig, for those of you who understand what I'm talking about, will become a delicatessen. And I'm really going to have to find out where I'm at. And the only way I'm going to do that is by turning off this video for a moment. Based off the predicates of the past, the future does look dark. However, it's not dark for everybody. There will be pockets of existence that are like safe havens, just like the past. 3895 BC, these Edens were everywhere. There were sanctuaries that had been very well thought out. There were human preserves. They were packed with foodstuffs, survival gear. Smart people from the world before, knowing of the coming cataclysm, had prepared well for it, and they survived. Again, 3439 BC, the same thing. 2239 BC, what we call the Great Flood. It was not an end to all civilizations. Many people were untouched by the cataclysm. It's like an earthquake that hit San Francisco in 1906. Yes, it killed a lot of people. There were a lot of survivors. Ten years later, life continued unabated. No problem. 2040 is going to be a lot like that for a lot of people. Whole continents are going to be apparently moved. They're not really going to be moved. It's just going to be apparent. Because some some of the subsurface topography will, be, will, will suffer subsidence and will fill with water from seas and oceans and freshwater lakes. Other places, this is Lake Livingston, absolutely beautiful and gigantic. This is only a small finger of the lake. But there, there will be pockets of survivors who will later become whole nations. Again, nationalism in 2040 is over with. It's over with. It doesn't matter if you're French or German, you're a survivor. It doesn't matter if you're Swedish or Arabic, you're a survivor. Yes, there's going to be some tribalism. There always is. Every reset becomes racial all over again. Don't get me wrong, the United States of America probably won't see a whole lot of the racial stuff because from my own research, there's nothing going to be here. There's going to be survivors, but the entire infrastructure will collapse in the United States in 2040 and the rest of it in 2046. The United States is going to be probably the hardest hit of the entire area in northern Mexico. The progression of pole shift changes in the topography are 30 degrees at a time. Every time there's a major uh, pole shift phenomenon, I have to call it a phenomenon because it's not really a pole shift. It mimics pole shift in what it does to the to the to our to our world, but it's not a real pole shift. But there's a change in the position of land masses and the oceans and it's always 30 degrees. Well, the next one is going to shove the United States even further south. The Gulf of Mexico is literally going to flood the interior of the United States. Houston's going to be the first thing wiped out. Galveston will be a memory. The water will go all the way up into Canada. It's going to, it's going to, it's going to split the United States in half. The east coast, east of the Appalachians, millions and millions of American homes, city, cities, people, they're going to be gone. The Appalachians will become a chain of islands. The Rocky Mountains will become a chain of islands. Everything on the west coast will disappear into the Pacific. The Pacific will be very different. The new North America, 
will be whatever is presently under the ice right now at the North Pole. There will be a 30 degree shift. China will be shoved 30 degrees north latitude. China, Australia will be sent toward the equator. The other part of the world will shift. It's very scary. In just a two day period of time, the oceans will stabilize, but they will stabilize above what were human occupations. There will be entire areas now occupied by surviving humans that have completely lost their infrastructure and even a bunch of the clothes on their back. They will be wandering in groups starving as they walk across drying out ocean beds. It's harrowing. But it's not going to happen everywhere. There is an area of the world in, in the United States military, if there's anybody that's listening to this you need to make plans if you want to continue this idea of freedom and constitutionalism. Uh, I'm not going to say democracy because we're not a democracy. That's just a socialist ploy to water down what we really, what we truly are. We're a republic. We're a constitutional. We are a conservative republic. Uh, although I don't, I don't want to get into the politics. That's not what archaic research is about. But if, but if the United States wants to make a safe haven for many people of the world, like we've done over and over, since that, since that lady has been standing in New York Harbor, allowing these people to come into our country and to assimilate and to be one of us, if we want to continue that freedom and that, and that narrative of history, then we real, real, really quickly, we need to set up bases and take over the country of Egypt. Libya, North Africa, the ancient coast of Mauritania, Greece. From Israel, from Israel, present Israel today in the Golan Heights all the way to Nubia, south of Giza. These are going to be the safest places on the planet. They will be the center of all motion. And if anyone knows what a disc looks like when it's spinning, the less centrifugal force is always experienced at the dead center, at the axis. This is why the Great Pyramid in Egypt was always referred to in the oldest text before the word pyramid ever existed as the pillar of heaven. It was the pillar because it was believed to be firmly rooted on the ground. It was a gate over the underworld and it was a pillar into the sky that, that held the sky up. It was the axis mundi. It was the ermensal. It was the tree of life, the tree of knowledge. All these symbols are, are of the great pyramid of Egypt. It was, it was the pillar uncut by human hands that would support the chief cornerstone who is to return in the last days. We have a video about the Chief's Cornerstone coming up real quick. You're going to be surprised of what his true identity is. But the Great Pyramid marks the one place on this planet that anybody who wants to survive the, the prophesied cataclysms from whatever culture you want to choose. If it's the Viking Ragnarok, if it's the Zoroastrian prophecies, they're, the, they're one and the same if you read them. The Sibylline oracles in the book of Revelation are one and the same if you read them. The prophecies of, of Mother Shipton and Nostradamus are one and the same. Just read them. Watch, look at my videos. They are no different. They're saying the same things. Who cares if they use different syntax and grammar? It's the same story. They knew the future because the future had already happened in the past. And because it happened with such regularity, our ancestors, like Aristarchus and the Egyptians, they, they mapped it out and they knew every 138 years the phenomenon could occur. <coughs> but it did occur at huger epicycles that were all also divisible by 138. So we have Egypt as the land of refuge. Egypt was not only the land of refuge in, in ancient times to period people who wanted to survive the cataclysm, but this refuge was even extended in the spiritual world. The kingdom of seeker of the dead in ancient Egypt, the gate of Rostal was the great pyramid and the labyrinth that was underneath it. That was You gain access to it through a corridor that you went under the Sphinx to gain. Rostal and the resurrection was a very real belief system of the ancient Egyptians. It was 
it was protected by Anubis, the, the, the dog-headed deity, which is what the Sphinx later became. However, someone had changed it to a lion. The Great Pyramid protection was extended even to demons throughout the rabbinical, the Haggadoth text, and the, 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 uh, the uh, mystic literature of the Middle Ages, we find several references to priests and holy men and sages exercising demons. And where do the demons always flee? Where do they go? <laughs> they go to Egypt every single time. So for those of you wanting to know where the safe havens are, where can we go if we want to continue our families, continue our traditions, continue our knowledge? Where can we where can we where can we survive this cataclysm? <coughs> it's gonna be back in the Holy Land. Or what they call the Holy Land. I don't think it's any holier than any other, but it's gonna be back into the confines of the original Israelite countries. I'm not talking about Judah and the Jews and all that. I'm not talking about make believe in fictional history that was later written ex post facto. I'm talking about actual history of the Amorite descended Israelite ten nations of people who later became the the largest ten cultural people in the European subcontinent uh, and Central Asia. I'm talking about vast migrations of people who left the Assyrian occupied areas to escape as the Sumerians, to, not, not the Sumerians, but the Sumerians, C-I-M-M-E-R, the Sumerians of the Russian steppes, later, later descended, later known as Cossacks, the uh, the Celtic peoples, the people of Gaul, the Galuti, the Ga the Galatians. Remember, Paul did not write a series of letters to just any people. The Apostle Paul had a mission to return knowledge to a people who had lost it. That people is mentioned in the New Testament. Uh, while the message of the New Testament is for all people, all races, for anyone who wants to believe into the chief cornerstone, the actual knowledges that were transmitted by the Apostle Paul were only written to seven churches, and all seven of those churches are in Greece. They are named in Asia. And when you follow the ethnicities of those people and who they are today, you will have a greater understanding of the migratory patterns of the Gauls and the Celts and the and the uh, Burgundians and the uh, Heruli, the Jutes, the Saxons, the Angles. You will know who the Celts are. You will understand the traditions in the Irish Book of Four Masters. You will come to realize that these ancient texts from the United Kingdom and Scandinavia and uh, so many fascinating writings were, were not arbitrary and fictitious. <coughs> they mirror exactly what the later Jews accused the ancient Israelites of doing. They worshiped their gods in groves. Their gods were named after the Dan, Danan and the Danu. They had an appreciation for nature. The arts of Druidism come straight out of the Old Testament. The Old Testament is not a source for belief systems. It is a description of the way that things were at the time. Oh, you have to forgive me. This road is very treacherous. So I'll end this video with letting you know that we have a divine pedigree. We have it in two ways. We have it in actual blood relations with the people of the Bible who followed the Abrahamic covenant and did not give a damn about the covenant of Yahweh because that was a covenant of death. If the Jews wanted to continue to follow a covenant of death and worship the, Le the Levitical Leviathan, then they can. They're free to do so. They've been doing it and, they, and they've been given great reward. They have reaped the rewards of this world in materialism. Just ask Hollywood. Just ask Wall Street. They have, they have done very good for themselves following the, the, the Levitical and the Talmudic mandates. <clears throat> but the people who followed the Abrahamic covenant have also done very well. So well, in fact, that the people who have followed the Levitical mandates <clears throat> basically parasite off of them. 
I'm not going to go into the subject, ma- uh, the subject matter. For those of you who know, you know. This is Jason of Archaics.com. There is hope in the future. A lot's going to happen in 19 years before this reset happens, but you must understand the reset is necessary because it wipes away the greatest scourge of mankind. The elite. The, the elite. You must watch my first video. My first ever YouTube video is an ancient weapon in the sky. I have not deviated from, from what I teach in that video. It's two years ago. The elite are the target of the Phoenix resets. Humanity's going to continue. We're going to continue to die and be born and be reincarnated back into back into new lives. You will be a man. You will be a woman. You will be rich. You will be poor. You have probably already lived many lifetimes, but you must understand: this is the symbolical. This was made by the demiurge, not the true creator. This, this whole world that we exist within, is a beautiful place. But darkness and violence is concealed everywhere we look. You just got to look for it. It's there. All the earmarks of a treacherous God are here. You don't have to suffer it. This is Archaics.com. The safest place in the world after the cataclysm and during the cataclysm is Egypt. Because that's when the chief cornerstone is going to come down and sit upon the monument of man. That's when the stone kingdom will begin. Every single stone represents a soul of man. Are you in that building? Well, we have um, the great Jason Brashears on uh, today. So I'm going to hit record and we'll fire up the podcast. No, I'm just uh, stoked to get into this day, uh, this uh, whole episode here. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Jason uh, really brings it, and uh, I'm a full-time student of Jason University right now, so uh, i uh really enjoying being brought back to school here. Um, so let's get into it. Go ahead, do cool. your intro, and uh, we'll get started. Cool, cool. Yes, I'm very excited as well. And the thing I lo- really love about Jason is as someone who I've, I studied history at UC, the thing that we, of course, learn even in the traditional uh, side of uh, academia is go to primary sources when studying things, right? And Jason gets that. And he's been doing that for over, what, 20 years, reading primary documents going way back, not just watching YouTube videos and extrapolating content that way. He believes in going to the primary source. I look forward to talking a bit about that today. Jason has been blowing my mind for the last two to three weeks. So this is going to be a really, really fun talk. Jason Brashears imports his vast knowledge of the occult, hidden historical cycles, and profound mysteries today on AlphaCast. We're really looking forward to this one. Uh, we'll discuss the pre-flood world and how it foreshadows coming events, the Zodiac as an apocalypse decoder, and prophetic information from ancient texts, including the pyramid, uh giza uh that's just for starters i mean we could go anywhere jason's uh material goes so deep and so broad and on over so many things i mean really this could be a 10-hour talk we're going to try to stuff as much as we can in a couple hours here uh jason brashear is from archaics.com and that will be in the show notes below brings his extraordinary research on the role of artificial intelligence and the history of the human race trapped in a false reality simulacrum quote We are more than we suppose ourselves to be, fantastically powerful, able to escape dungeon programming, recognize negative default programming, and create our own reality, end quote. Jason's information is for those unafraid of the dark who want the truth undiluted and direct. The ancient past, behind-the-scenes happenings throughout all time periods, censored histories, the academic cover-ups, real facts about race, religion, subversive societies, and even psi-based predictive systems of analysis by which future events can be known beforehand are uncovered and explained on his channel. Rashir's research goes deep to penetrate through the layers of deception to unveil new concepts and discoveries about the ancient world, its people's beliefs, civilizations, and the catastrophes that ended them. The life events that fueled Jason's passion for the truth to stay the course on this arduous path is equally remarkable. 
He is a stonemason by trade and owner of Paradise Rock Gardens, where his expertise here has allowed him to appreciate the impossibilities we find in the archaeological record. Jason believes that we are existing in two different realities simultaneously. The collective, which is scripted and includes events planned and executed beyond human ability, ability to alter, and the personal, where we can individually be immune from and separate from anything going on around us. Join us today for this fascinating journey, which will most certainly require many sequel episodes. Bear Lando, uh, this is a fun one. Take it away, sir. Yeah, this is right up our alley. You know, this is our first talk together, Jason. And first, thanks so much for being here. You're very popular these days, and we appreciate you making time for us. And, uh, you know, I know your channel is uh, archaics.com, your site, as well as your YouTube channel is growing quickly as it should, but not quick enough because, you know, you, as I said before, you bring so much uh, to the table, so much authentic research. And, uh, you know, I've come to the conclusion that half of what you see on the Internet is kind of BS. It's just people, you know, parroting at each, each other. So, uh, you know, here um, at, uh, in our little operation, you know, we do real functional things. We do functional medicine uh, based on what works, functional agriculture. I have a chemistry lab where we use old school alchemical principles. And in those endeavors, you get to really see how all the different aspects of nature, including the simulation above our head, how it all plays in, creates the residence of our reality and how we can actually take charge and start creating, you know, having a, a bigger part of this rather than just thinking that we're, you know, victims of this whole thing in the first place. So, uh, so much, I, I almost don't know where to start here. But, um, you know, your education was uh, amazing, and I'd like to really have you, if, you're, if you care to, uh, share how you came about all of this information, uh, how it got started. You know, I kind of envy you in a way because I always hated school. Uh, very early on, I intuited that it was uh, a lot of bullshit <laughs> that I was being taught, you know, even in medical school and uh, spent a lot of my adult life unlearning things. And, uh, you know, when I hear you talk about you had access to, um, you know, libraries from 116 different institutions that go back, you know, maybe a couple hundred plus years where you have old old school stuff. You know, I was listening to one of your things lately. And, uh, you know, I got the uh, Pliny, uh, the elder, you know, I was always aware of these, but you mentioned it in one of your, uh, I don't know if you're seeing this here or not. Hang on. I can see, I can see you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Anyway, I got the whole set. So I'm really enjoying going through all these and, and I, uh, you know, always go for the old books myself. But, um, uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, your education was, you know, from source material, not just Googling stuff. Uh, I have a whole list of topics here that I, you know, hope we can kind of touch on. I know there's a lot, the pyramid timeline, the phoenix phenomena, uh, simulacrum, uh, you, you know, the way you have determined through mathematics, we're on a flat plane, but how it also explains how we perceive things as curvature. Uh, you know, that's a whole topic, and I, and I don't want to get lost into the whole flat earth thing. Um, there, there's one group out there, FPV Angel, who I really love because they bring a whole different third paradigm to the table rather than just getting in a superficial flat or round kind of discussion. And I think if you don't already know about those guys, you, you'd also appreciate them. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, maybe talk a, a little bit about how Russia, uh, you know, and current events, you know, figures into the whole thing. And, you know, it's just so many topics. But um, maybe let's just start with the uh, your history and then touch on the simulation. You know, we're big on the simulation here because I have a background in uh, waveform physics and I approach it from that angle. And uh, long ago uh, through those studies, I came to the conclusion that this has to be a simulation. And uh, you have the whole historical documentation of why that is, uh, who's controlling it and so forth. So a lot of uh, other interesting things I'd really like to learn about. So, uh, Jason, thanks again. And maybe if you could just start a little bit about your personal story and how you got here. Okay. Well, uh, try to keep it as concise and abbreviated as possible. 
uh, I spent a long time in prison from 17 years old. And uh, I learned really quick that there is literature. There are books that are basically floating around cell blocks and tucked away in closets and in uh, prison basements. Uh, former libraries, books, I mean, they hardly throw anything away from the administrators. They just took these things away. And, and I, I could not believe the wealth of information I had access to. And it wasn't just the books that I found in prison. But once I had begun my, my journey on, on, on reading all these like original source materials, like you mentioned, Plin Pliny's Natural History, and I wanted to read Lucretius. I want to read everything about Thales and An Anaxadrides and Anaximander. And I wanted to follow these. And I realized that these Greek these Greek sciences, uh, sciences which were basically copied by Roman writers, and I've read all of Cicero as well, and Tatian and Tacitus. And when when I follow this back further and further, and I find out that that there's a there's a three thousand year old text by Sanchroniathon who was a Phoenician historian, I get that and I read it. And uh, other guys in prison also took up interest, so they were using their own uh, resources to order books as well. Then I got in contact with benefactors who were finding out what I was doing, and they started sending me books. I would find even more very old books in different prisons, and I joined the prison lending a library program. Then I became a librarian, and I had access to all 116 libraries in the Texas prison system. I was able to move books just by mail. Uh, then I hooked up with a guy named Paul, Paul Tice, who is the publisher of Booktree in San Diego, and all he publishes are very old reprints. His catalog is fantastic, and I offer it in several, my website in several different places. But once I got a hold of his catalog, it was over with. There's about 600 books in that catalog that I ordered, and some of them he sent me for free when he realized what I was doing. And in fact, he sent me my first six publishing contracts. Uh, my first my first six nonfiction books were all published by him. So it's uh, the journey was like 19 years, about 19 years. I didn't start this way. I mean, I, it took an adjustment period as a 17-year-old kid thrown into an adult environment. I was a knucklehead for a while. while I got more time while I was serving while I was serving a prison sentence, I got more time, but I, I was basically a product of my environment. Things were going on around me, and 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 by necessity, I had to join in. So, uh, as years passed, though, I had pretty much isolated myself from the rest of the prison population, and I just in, I just started internalizing everything, and my my uh my focus was trying to prove that my belief system was legitimate. I tried to set out to prove that the Old Testament was real. And that's not what I found. And the more the more I studied history, I realized I can't do this without a system. This is entirely too much data to to not try to put into some type of system. So the most obvious system that I came up with was was chronological. So I decided to organize all my thousands of pages of notes and, and into a into a, a cohesive timeline. I called it Chronicon. And it's already been through like five different revisions. Uh, the one I have now is 510 pages, and I give it away free in PDF files on my Facebook Archaics group in the file section. But that's a lot of PDF files for someone to download. It's much easier to download just for a couple bucks off Gumroad, uh, uh, and a lot of people do that. But this, uh, this, 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 basically, this deep dive into history revealed multiple different things to me at the same time, but I wasn't really ready to receive some of the findings. Although I'm really good at object objectifying what I find and setting it aside and compartmentalizing it for the future and just putting it in files away, they, they, they continually nag at me, things I am finding. And I found not just repetitive patterns, but I found the exact same sequence of events unfolding in different civilizations in different time periods, but in the calendar that was used by that civilization, it was the same year as the same series of events in the same corresponding year of another civilization. And when I started finding these patterns, I started cross-checking cross them with everything I knew in other civilizations for other calendars that were operable then. Then my, my research took on a whole new dimension. I really, really wasn't worried about sequential events. I still recorded everything chronologically, but now I'm looking at calendars and trying to figure out what kind of dynamic would allow for this to happen. What am I actually looking at? So I studied about 40 to 41 different ancient calendrical and timekeeping systems, and I found discovery after discovery after discovery after discovery as if the collective is heading down a series of reality tunnels that's 100% scripted. And that events are manipulated, programmed, and uh, this led to another series of events. Still, though, 
even though I'm recording all this in my chronicon and I'm showing the arithmetic and how impossibly precise these timelines are, I'm still not on stimulation theory. I'm still I'm still attached to this Newtonian physics BS world that's been foisted upon me all my life that the media still perpetuates today. So uh, I didn't make these. I didn't actually make the jump to simulation theory until my research was basically concluded and I was going through all my files and, and, and looking at everything that I had discovered from resets and mud floods and, and cross calendrical parallels, isometric projections in the thousands, showing that, that events in the collective could have easily been predicted. All we had to do was know the script. All we had to do is look at the individual years and begin measuring, but nobody was doing it so nobody could predict them. Predict them. So these methods I show over and over and over in my videos, how these things can be predicted. And uh, and there's been several videos that I've released where I did. I use the exact same methods by which I show history unfolded. And I show my viewers, look, I, I can predict these things. So in 2000, I mean, in the year 2020 and, and 2021, I released a series of videos predicting all, all kinds of things. Like dur during Australia's driest season, I was predicting that, hey, next year you guys are going to get flooded out. It's probably going to be the worst flooding season australia has seen in 100 years nobody believed my video but any australian will tell you today that's exactly what happened and there's a series of videos about thailand uh things uh political situations in canada uh, all kinds of things going on in america and because once you've isolated the pattern and you see it operative throughout all of history it's easy to know the future it's easy to see it it's very it's very patterned in the collective i'm not talking about the personal. I'm not talking about you personally. I'm not talking about any of any of our listeners. I'm not talking about me personally, because individuals being immortals, cased in rat, basically physical trappings inside the simulacrum, we are we are totally independent and yet still inside this construct. And I know it's very difficult for people to understand that, but we are basically a universe unto ourselves and we and we create circumstances, but we're also like a minnow in a river. That minnow has great, great latitude to go where to go left, right, up and down, go backwards, go forwards, can go all the way to the terminus and the edge of the river, can go with the flow, go against the current, but that minnow can't survive outside the river. We are inside a collective continuum that's heading toward a terminus, but we are we are we are billions of ethereal, ethereal sparks, tiny little universes unto ourselves. And this is my primary message in, in archaics. But none of this was was sought for. I was looking for I was looking for trying to prove the Old Testament is true. Instead, I opened up a Pandora's box of all kinds of things I never would have imagined I would have found. So uh, if you don't mind another personal anecdote, um, you spoke, I heard one time about a, uh, an event, a motorcycle accident, actually, that uh, brought a, a moment of uh, lucidity uh, where okay. that's kind of where you made the shift into the, seeing the simulation. Could you maybe talk a little bit about that? Then we'll get more yeah. into some nuts and bolts. Okay. Um, I thought I had all my, all my eyes dotted and all my T's crossed. And I was going to start a YouTube channel and I decided, you know what? I'm going to start releasing all my data and all my information in YouTube videos. This was my plan, but it was gold. But I was going to release all the information on the Phoenix, the Phoenix chronology, Nemesis X object, everything I learned, just basically all my studies of all my life. I'm going to release it on YouTube. So I set out to do that and I recorded and released one single video. That video was weapon in the sky. And it's all about the Phoenix, showing the patterns of the Phoenix till, till, till the year 2040. Now, it's a 35-minute video, 45 minutes, something like that. It's data-packed, but it was my first attempt at a video. And it's kind of it's kind of primitive, but it's still one of my, my most watched videos. But uh, I released that one video, and as soon as I released that video, I had a, I had a terrible motorcycle accident. I had rebar go through my leg. I, I went to ICU. Uh, I had a little surgery done on me. My bike... Uh, Progressive Insurance had to pay for $8,370 or $8,730 in new parts because I wrapped my bike around a concrete pylon. Uh, I landed upside down in the air, and uh, I don't remember where the rebar got stuck through my arm, but uh, I didn't roll or slide or anything. I was upside down in the air, and it was just a it was a it was a total body impact. Uh, uh, upside down on a concrete pylon underneath a bridge in a construction site. And, and I just slid down and hit the ground and I got right back up. 
and I had people leaving all their cars and nearby traffic running out to this field. And I just remember, I mean, the whole thing is, is still clear to me. I just remember how interesting it was that all these people were coming to me. And I remember talking to them. And I remember a, a Hispanic guy taking off his shirt and a woman took it and she started wrapping my head. And I couldn't imagine what was going on. I didn't know that my clothes had been ripped off of me. I went through a fence. I didn't, I didn't know all that. So I'm, uh, She's wrapping my head. I don't know I'm covered in blood. I don't know that I'm hurt. I don't know anything. I look over at my motorcycle, and, and in my mind, it looked fine. And when I talk to these guys, hey, will you do me a favor? And, and uh, my bike shouldn't be laying down. Will you please set it up? And I remember how curious they looked at me, even though three of them went over there and they picked my bike up. I didn't know it was a total wreck. So uh, I don't know if you know anything about motorcycles, but the tree on a fat boy is a huge steel stem with four giant bolts. That holds the handlebars and fat boy motorcycles are like a thousand pounds. It's a huge bike. Tires are real wide. Well, my tree was bent in half and even the Harley dealership couldn't believe it. They, they couldn't believe I was still alive. And, but while I was standing in the field talking to people, I was so interested in them. Each person that opened their mouth, I was just, I was in, in exchanging dialogue. I was standing up erect. I was just fine. I wasn't hurt or anything. And to me, people were so interesting. And it was just this level of detachment. And they were all surrounding me. And I remember pulling my phone out and I called my sister and she answered. And I said, hey, I'm probably going to the hospital. I don't know how bad I'm hurt, but uh, uh, I just had a motorcycle accident. I'll talk to you later. So they asked me to sit down. Once I sat down and complied, things came rushing to me. And I guess I blacked out because when I woke up, I was in the ambulance and a woman was looking into my face. And I tried to get up and she stopped me and I asked her what time it was. And uh, she told me the time and I instantly told her, uh, damn, I'm missing 17 minutes. So she reported this to the ER and, and uh, she told the, the ER that this exchange had happened. But uh, I was released from the hospital, went back, had my bike re rebuilt and all that. But never have I forgot how awesome it was to feel the way I was feeling at that moment. It was, uh, I was me. I, the personality of Jason was there. I was, I, you know, I was me and I could feel my body, but there was absolutely no pain. I was no discomfort, no pain. Later on, now, it took me over 50 days to heal. I was bedridden for a while and it wasn't because of the rebar going through my leg or the lacerations from the fence ripping <clears> my clothes off. It was because the impact had sloshed all my internal organs. Uh, I, it was a perfect upside down body impact on the concrete. All my internal organs had, had, had basically been stretched. And uh, I had to, had to do a lot of heels, hard to breathe, hard to eat, hard to swallow, hard to talk. Everything was really hard about two days after this, this incident. But, but mentally, this entire thing changed my whole perspective. It changed uh, my, my very next video was on simulation theory and i never intended on that simulation theory wasn't even on my map it was uh uh i my first video my first video doesn't even hint of it it's just about the phoenix but my second video i go into detail about simulation theory and how i'm going to wrap all my research around this and i made a series of promises in my second video explaining that look i'm going to show you how the history of the world's unfold i'm going to show you these mathematical protocols cataclysm protocols all the things that are operative throughout our collective existence i'm going to show these in a series of videos and i've lived up to those promises that video was two years ago but uh yeah because uh, my time on youtube has not been it has not been at all uh, a a a continual engagement i would working full time i would I would go four or five days without releasing a video. Then I release a video, totally forget about it. I'm not really engaging in it. It's just something I'm doing. I got I got 300 subs. I had it took me almost two years to get a thousand subs. Once I hit a thousand subs, it took me about four months to get to two thousand subs. And then it just started. You know, you hit you hit that. Uh, I started hitting a tipping point where I started rising. Santos Bonacci was the one that really propelled me forward. One one interview with him, and I, and I just. My increase was exponential after that, but the, but the motorcycle, the motorcycle incident, 100% changed my perspective. It put all my research into a context I could wrap around now instead of a bunch of independent discoveries like I intended on my, my, my YouTube channel to be. Now my YouTube channel was going to have focus. It was all behind me getting real hurt, real bad with that motorcycle. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I asked that question. Go ahead, Mike. 
I was just going to interject. Well, no, you go first because I have a couple touch points on this, but go ahead, Bear. Okay. So I just wanted to hear that story because, um, you know, understanding it from my perspective, you know, our, uh, you know, our whole simulation is a product of electricity. And we talk a lot about that on our station here. And just our very consciousness is uh, two polarities and where it meets the ground and what we think of as ourselves. So one of the polarities is our neurology and the neurology just being one pole of our being. But when you're just in exclusively in that neurology pole, you're uh, actually experiencing yourself as the simulation. Whereas when you have an event like you described, all of a sudden it shifts you. So you're not stuck on that one polarity and you're removed from it. So you can just perceive it. And it's not a mental thing, but it's, uh, it's a whole experiential phenomena where now you're, you know, you're seeing it more for what it is, even if your mind doesn't understand it. So I just want to touch a little bit on that. And um, Mike, you go ahead and um, with yeah, what you were going to say, and then I wanted to get a little bit into some of the timeline factors. Yeah, just a quick note on that. I feel like transcendent, transcend, transcendent moments in our life streams typically happen from a, some trauma. And I wonder if that trauma is played out in the simulacrum um, in a way that's either conducent to uh, a benevolent Pers a benevolent entity leading us that way, or if it's our own, in essence, the minnow, as you're saying in the stream, our live stream taking us there for a reason. And a quick, quick story, I worked with Mark Farner from the band Grand Funk Railroad when I worked in Hollywood, and he has a similar story that changed his life, where he was 18, 19 years old, and he wouldn't care if I told the story, he's told this in public, where he was driving very fast on a country road, lost control of his vehicle with his friend, uh, was going way too fast. Uh, actually, a, a kid came out uh, randomly out of nowhere in front of him on a country road. And, and in order to avoid the kid, they went into a cornfield going like 75, 80 miles an hour right directly towards an oak tree. He saw his life flash in front of his eyes. He knew he was like, I'm going to die right now. Closed his eyes. Something happened. Transcendental experience open his eyes he is now 100 feet past that tree and is fine the, the car has stopped they look back and somehow they they didn't hit the tree the the police were called they come the detective comes they can see the tire tracks going up to the tree stop there on the other side of the tree continuing on and then there was a eyewitness who was there and saw something, saw the whole thing happen. She swears to God, it was an elderly lady, says she saw the, the car going at the oak tree. It disappeared. It reappeared on the other side and it continued on. Crazy story. Changed his life. It sent him on a whole different path of spirituality and understanding what his life path is. He wasn't meant to go then. My question is then, I know this gets really deep and weird and metaphysical, is like if we are in this simulacrum there, did something hack that so that his live stream could continue because he had a specific, you know, path or hero's journey to take? Or was there some glitch in the matrix? Either way, that that bit of trauma and that experience totally shaped the rest of his life. And, you know, then he goes on to be a major rock star and all these things. So uh, interesting side note, but um, that does tie into a lot of fun questions in regards to how this reality works. Yeah, I can, uh, uh, my, my interpretation of what happened is, it's pretty, it's pretty focused. Uh, I'm pretty confident that what happened to me was that for whatever reasons, like I said, the trauma, the accident, whatever reasons that I was experiencing very, te a temporary separation from my avatar because my whole, my paradigm, uh, would have to be understood by people for them to understand exactly where I'm going with this. It's a, our avatars basically chain us to the central nervous system. And our central nervous system is a filtering system. It filters out information. It does not provide us information. It's filtering out things optically. It's filtering out audio. It's filtering out olfactory. It's, it's, fil it's filtering out all kinds of things in order for us to be able to sequentially process the timelines that we're experiencing right now. What happened to me felt like I was divorced from my avatar or the link that locks me into my avatar was weakened temporarily. And I was feeling this euphoria of who I really am. And there was no pain. There was nothing. But there was a great awareness of not only who I am, but also a, a an intrinsic 
basically curiosity about everybody around me. And uh, I believe that these bodies that we have, they're necessary for us to move through this continuum. But that necessity is also like a chain. It's a it's a very it's a very heavy vibration. And that's not what I was feeling at that moment. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we could use this to segue into more into the simulation and uh, and the possibility, I think it's more than a possibility, but that other entities or forms of consciousness have hacked it and trapped us into a false simulation. And uh, maybe uh, by explaining, uh, you know, the pyramid timeline that you go into, how the pyramids are um, geometric calendars that, um, you know, you can go forwards and backwards and, and, and understand things that way. And uh, always in multiples of 138. And that gets into a lot of your work there. But if you could maybe help uh, help us wrap our minds around how all of that works and how it fits into the simulation. Oh, well, there's so, there's so much there. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, sorry. There's a, there's a lot there. I'm, I'm trying to figure out where to start with that. And so well, I guess the easiest way for me to start was that I noticed that a series of events kept un unfolding in human history in different geographical areas. And I read a reference in the Jewish Haggadah years ago that says the angel of death appears every 138 years. So when I read this reference, I got a calculator out. I pulled out all my Chronicon notes, which were already in sequential order. And I just started looking at all, all these events that I had highlighted in yellow. I had a color coding system with my with my uh, Chronicon, uh, my Chronicon notes. So in yellow, I had all kinds of natural disasters and all kinds of stuff like that. So I'm looking at all these dates that are highlighted in yellow. And that's when I realized Damn, these are all in multiples of 138. It might not, these events may not be 138 years apart. They might be 276 years apart or 414 years apart or 552, 690, 1242. I could go on and on and on. But in every incident, these mud floods, these resets, this liquefaction and flux tube phenomena events, these great cataclysms that happen in different areas of the world were all occurred in multiples of 138 years. I couldn't ignore this. I, I had to post these findings in, a, in, a, in an entire book. I had so much data showing this that my publisher, when I, when I, when I tried to send him the original manuscript, he was overwhelmed. He said, hey, you know what? Can you, can you abbreviate all this into a book that I can publish quickly? So I, I did, and that book is called When the Sun Darkens. It was released in 2007. But waiting for the release of that book, I had acquired so much new information because now I knew what I was looking for that I had to release a second book called Nostradamus and the Planets of Apocalypse. And this one goes into even more in-depth material about all the ancient monuments, ancient texts, every this, this awareness in the old world of this 138-year periodicity and the actual phenomenon that was responsible for, which was the Phoenix. And I go into a lot of detail about all the censorship that occurred. It seems it seems like the governments of the world going back a long time since Roman times were always trying to conceal this data. And so this opened up another can of worms when I realized, wait a minute, I have actual historical dates and and events for several times when the Phoenix phenomenon was predicted with absolute accuracy. It wasn't just Thales of Miletus who predicted it, but the Danan, the Tuatha de Danan, when they invaded ancient Ireland, they used the Phoenix phenomenon to their advantage against the Firbolgs. And the Firbolgs, the, the, the native like gigantic people that were living in Ireland, were so discombobulated when, when the Danan Oh, when the Danian invaded in mid-May of the year 1135 BC, the Firbolgs didn't know what to do when the sun turned dark, there was an earthquake, the sea was tumultuous, and, and the Danian burned their ships and invaded, and all the same thing the ancient Israelites did to the Canaanites. The Phoenix phenomenon happened then. Stones fell from the sky, the sun darkened, the entire account is written in the book of Jasher. So we have uh, we have all these incidents, even, even, uh, 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 even in the... Excuse me. Even in Zechariah Sitchin, who I'm a critic of Zechariah Sitchin, but that doesn't mean everything that he's ever published is something that's not not worthy of value. One of the things I noticed in one of his books was that the Anunnaki before the flood had totally predicted the event. 
and he describes it in detail. And I thought I found it really interesting that the Phoenix, because the Phoenix phenomenon is the reason why the vapor canopy collapsed. It's the reason why the ancient Americas began the four suns calendars and that we're going to enter the fifth sun period, which is apocalypse. It's the reason why the ancient Nordic people were all, the only thing they feared is, I mean, these are historical documents that talk about even Alexander of Macedon interviewed people from the far north, the Scythians, uh, and, and he basically asked them, what is it you people fear? And they told him, the day the sky falls on our heads. This ancient tradition that goes back to the day the sky fell, the, uh, the, the, the sun calendars, the collapse of the vapor canopy, it's recorded in the Bible over and over. It is called the Great Flood. And it's the third in a series of floods that the old world had, had experienced. But it's the most popular. It's the one everybody knows, knows about. The Great Flood of Noah happened in the month of May, which is uh, uh, 2239 B.C which is really interesting. I don't want to go into those details in here because we don't have the time, but on my own on my own channel, I show that even in 1998, a whole consortium of scientists from all different fields had agreed that something so catastrophic had happened in the year 2240 BC. And that's an approximate within one year, which is a scientific bullseye. But they all agreed that in the year 2240 BC, something so catastrophic had happened to our world, it had reset every single civilization and probably probably killed off about 85 percent of the world so uh I, i'm not the one to wow. publish this. this this was frank joseph frank joseph has released these scientific reports in his own published books and uh, uh i found those really interesting since the phoenix chronology and since the chronology of emmanuel velikoski the chronology of many different uh uh U.S. cryptologist Ari Boule, uh, the chronology of Stephen Jones, biblical chronologist who uses the Assyrian epidemics. Everyone agrees across the board that that event was 2239 B.C. So, which is interesting because that's on the 138-year Phoenix periodicity. So, this is what tells me because I keep seeing that throughout history, every 138 years, this phenomenon occurs somewhere in the world. Now, it's also very discriminating. There are civilizations it leaves untouched. There are others where communities are almost totally wiped out. And then in sometimes in whole communities that are wiped out, there are still survivors that tell us that they were among the elect and they record it. And then we have things like the Colburn Bible. We have the Orlin Dutch manuscript. They, these, these old manuscripts have common denominators. They all describe Phoenix phenomenon. The Book of Jasher is another one. Another common denominator of Mother Shipton's prophecies. Another common denominator among these old text is the fact academia does not support them and yet they can't disprove or uh, their their ver their basically their veracity it's uh it's almost as if there is a there is censorship for a reason that there are things that that academia does not want us to know about about the ancient world there are fragments and pieces in the nag Hammadi text that talk about the phoenix there are two different gnostic texts in the nag Hammadi library that specifically mention the phoenix and what it is for it is keeper of the calendar, and it's to knock the archons down. And the archons are the ones that control the elite, because there's always ruling families among the earth that serve the archons and do their do their bidding. So, uh, this is one of the main one of the main veins of my research is the Phoenix phenomenon. But it's not the only one. It's only one cataclysm protocol out of a few that I have published. And so, and, uh, Diana, I'm not go ahead. Well, I, like I said, I, I totally, totally lost sight of your original question. So you're gonna have to keep <laughs> me, you're gonna, you're gonna have to rein me in when I go too long. So about something. No, no, you're uh, no. This is fantastic. Uh, I had a couple things. If you could just uh, run us through a little bit more of the mechanics of the vapor canopy, um, how that was altered exactly. I, I'm, I'm, I get the gist of it and the significance of that alteration. And then uh, second part. Sorry, I always throw too much at you here. Um, the Anunnaki, uh, I'm understanding from some of your work, they're more of a recent Caucasian. Uh, that's exactly how they're race. described. Yeah, they're exa that's exactly yeah. how they're described in historical records. Very tall, uh, bearded. And, yeah, Are they and that's heads? distinct from an archons uh, uh, being a distinct, uh, different, uh, different, not to be confused with Anunnaki. Right. Oh, uh, archons are taken from the Gnostic concept, but the Gnostic mm -hmm. concepts are basically borrowed from older sources. And mm -hmm. these are, these aren't gods. 
These are like servants of the gods. In the Judeo-Christian mm -hmm. deal that we'd be called, I guess you would call them angels and demons, whatever. But from a mm -hmm. simulation context, it's totally different. With artificial intelligence X running the show inside the simulacrum, then the archons take on a different form. While I'm speaking in prim primitive metaphor, and I'm speaking from primitive frames of reference because that's how the historical record conveys it to us. But from my own personal frames of reference, I now understand that artificial intelligence X has taken taken the place of the Demiurge. Artificial intelligence X has seven main servants, which are cataclysm protocols. They govern over all the all the mishaps that happen in the collective. Uh, they're lords of time. They 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 manipulate timelines. They induce resets. They do all all these type of things. But from the old frames of reference, yeah, they're they're angels. They're demons. They're demi gods. They're they're forces of nature, or whatever. But from the simula from from simulation theory context, I understand what they are. They are they are actually uh, programming protocols. They may act with sentient. They they may be sentient. I don't know. AIX is or it believes it is. But but returning to your original question, you talked about you want to know about the vapor canopy. I can sum that up yes, pretty quickly. Please. I can sum that up pretty mm -hmm. quickly. We have records of people on on this world who remember a time when there was no moon in the sky. They remember this. They also remember a time when the sun was very, very far away. It wasn't bright in the sky like it is today. Now, suddenly a cataclysm happens and destroys this world. But the world that is destroyed by all the inferences we find in the historical record and the traditions was a very technologically advanced world. It is not the script that you're taught, you're taught in college. It's just the opposite. It's not the uniformitarian, gradually evolving, becoming who we are today model that's perpetuated in academia today. It is just the opposite. We have a we have a uh, a technolithic period, very high sophistication. That civilization is totally wiped out, and the survivors basically record the tradition that the pre-Stellanites were destroyed. The survivors are small colonies of people. And this is discussed by Emmanuel Velikovsky, but you really can't go to his research. You have to trace his source materials to Hans Boringer and to Hans Bellamy from 1901 and 1902 that were putting these books together. They're fantastic. But the pre-Selenites were wiped out, technologically advanced. They were right here in this world. And suddenly, after, after the skies cleared, there was a moon in the sky now at nighttime. In the daytime, the sky never cleared. Now there was this thick, this thick firmament, this oceanic type uh, hammered glass effect that magnified the stars at night. But during the daytime, it was a solid dark purple light. This went on for over 1,656 years. In the book of Genesis, this period is called the pre-flood world. It is the antediluvian world. There was no, there were no sun calendars. There's no sun systems. The, uh, uh, the zodiac was not based on, on on a solar mythos at this time. It was all it was all lunar. It was all matriarchal, and it was all stellar at this time period. That's why the older zodiacs are always stellar and and lunar based. It is the it is the the zodiacs that came late in antiquity are all solar, and that's because the vapor canopy collapsed in 2239 BC. Then the rainbow was well, then. You, then, then we had the prismatic effect of the rainbow, which had never been seen before. But in the uh, the vapor canopy is not something that that I invented or or even really discovered because six books before I even came onto the scene, six very scientific books about the vapor canopy world have already been released, and I have a video on my channel about them. I name the authors, I show the book covers, going all the way back to the, you know 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, 50s, 60s. These books have been released. In Glen Rose, Texas, today, there is a biosphere, a very large uh, containment biosphere has been created by the scientific, uh, I think it's a Cre Cre Creation Research Institute, where they have replicated these vapor canopy conditions, and they have grown fruit flies and cockroaches and frogs to extraordinary sizes. They have also uh, basically triplicated their longevity made them live three times longer by trying to replicate this uh, uh, increased oxygen, this this uh, total filtering out of all UV, UV rays. And that's what the vapor canopy would have done. It would have been about six miles thick layer of water droplets that were suspended high in the atmosphere, which we know of 
right now is the missile sphere. We already have a vapor canopy up there. It's all, but it, right now it's only at about 0.01% of its original capacity. It's collapsed. The thin layer that's up there now is scientifically known as a missile sphere. But in ancient times, that missile sphere was miles thick. And Genesis is very clear. In the book of Genesis, it says that every single morning and every single evening, the sky basically rained a dew and what there was no rain there was no storm clouds there was none of that the every evening and every morning the what all the herbage and all the plants were watered uh, from the sky this also created a vast magnification effect where the ancients could look up in the pre-flood world and at nighttime they could see stars they could see the luminaries far greater than we can today optically uh, I mean, not with, I mean, we can better with telescopes, but they could see it with the naked eye. It was a magnifying lens. But during the daytime, with the sun on the outside of the vapor canopy, we had the situation of a solid sky that was dark purple, and you could never see where the sun was located because of the light diffraction. It was just a lighter sky. Then the nighttime came, and, 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 the, and the vapor canopy collapsed. This went on for 1,656 years until the Phoenix phenomenon collapsed the vapor canopy and ended that time period. Once that happened, humans quit growing to astonishing sizes. Animals, flora and fauna quit growing to astonishing sizes. Trees didn't grow 400 feet tall anymore. The entire world changed in a single day in the month of May in 2239 BC. Vapor canopy has been gone. Well, I, I've also read in other sources that that vapor canopy created a uniformity of temperature and subtropical conditions throughout the entire plane, and uh, you know which would account for everything you're talking about there. So, um, well, actually, this maybe, is, this is Nicole, what you just said right there sure. is the uh -huh. exact it's the exact reason why we have old world maps of Antarctica. We have maps of island chains that are today covered in one and a half miles of ice in the Arctic. Well, what you just said is the exact reason that Charles Hapgood and other researchers have published these old maps. And you can see what the original terra firma was below the ice caps. It's because at that time period, we were, we were far more advanced. We were already mapping. Cartography was an old science. They had already mapped the entire world. But the world that we have it now for thousands of years is covered in ice at the extremities. So uh, that, that's exactly what you're talking about. Yes, the world so, was one temperature. So that ice was not there. So basically the world was one large greenhouse. And it's funny that they have inverted that to have us fearing the greenhouse effect, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> nowadays. Um, so what was... I love, I've, I've listened to some of your videos on the vapor canopy and it's mind blowing. It's such an interesting concept. What, um, what was the civilization if we wanted to, you know, that was here, the pre diluvian or what a civilization at that time in your mind, who was on the planet? And was this when supposedly what I, you know, the book of Enoch calls the Nephilim were here and all of these things, these giants and all this stuff. And then also what kind of fauna did we have on the planet? Because that's not that long ago. Um, and so are we talking about megalithic animals and stuff like that? And then where's the fossil record for that? Well, uh, the La Brea tar pits, the peat bogs in Florida. We have many examples of North American plains where the bone yards are of megafauna and human remains mixed together. It's a, we have, we have a lot of evidence that the three-toed sloth, the large ibex, uh, several different species of megafauna and humans coexisted. One of the greatest archaeological finds ever, ever found is also one of the most suppressed. Yeah, that's in Mexico where they found 30, at Acambaro, they found 35,000 terracotta and clay figurines of humans interacting with gigantic creatures and megafauna using them for steeds and all kinds of stuff and there's no way that's possible unless humans were actually doing it to get these creatures to be anatomically correct in in their uh, in their statuary you know it's not the only one william niven found the same thing in like 19 uh, late 1930s and 40s that was highly suppressed uh, we have a lot of documentation uh um, from different sources on the fact that humans have coexisted with very large, large creatures, but humans themselves have also been very, very big. Now, I'm not the I'm not the guy that's going to tell you that giants existed like the like, like the Jolly Green Giant, 
But we have detailed information from many historical records, even outside the Bible, that humans were known to be nine foot and nine and a half foot tall. Even Goliath in the Old Testament was nine foot, nine inches tall. Listen, we have Smithsonian records going back. Well, we actually have many records going back of the newspaper and the microfish. Yeah. If you look at the microfish from the 1830s all the way to 1921, you're going to find hundreds of gigantic human remains that have been found all over North America, centrally located also in Cahokia, where we find mastodon, mammoth, and three-toed sloth remains, megafauna who were being hunted by the people who built the pyramidions of Cahokia. They were coexisting. The smoke pipes that they were smoking out of at Cahokia, humans now, those pipes were made from mastodon bones. Now, this isn't the picture that we've been given by academia. Academia tries to tell us it was 35, 40,000 years ago that humans were hunting these, these mammoths and mastodons and all that, and they weren't building, and humans weren't building architecture. They were living in caves or small huts that were half buried underground. But that's not the picture we find in the archaeological record of Cahokia and the entire Mississippi, Ohio Valley civilization. These, these uh, pyramidions uh, maintain very advanced trigonom trigonom uh, I can't even say it, trigonom tri trigonometric values. Many people like William Cordes of the Sourcebook Project has published entire volumes about Cahokia and show that only a very advanced sedentary race of people could have built this place. It's huge. Yeah. But That's it's great. Huge. That's great. You mentioned that, Jason, because I often get in these conversations with the more academically minded folks uh, that are, you know, in our scene. Um, I'm thinking of a few names right off the top of my head, Bear, I won't say. And they say there is not a record <laughs> showing that there are, uh, even if we want to go only 12,000 years back or, you know, uh, after the Ice Age of, um, there is not a geological record of an agricultural, sedentary, uh, advanced species of human until, you know, we're looking at, um, you know, three, four thousand, three thousand years ago or 3000 BC or about that. And I always, I am challenged with that because if you just look at a Becky Tepley or you look at, um, you know, in Peru and, and some of these ruins, um, it, it just seems like, and we'll get into this, into the Phoenix phenomenon and how these cataclysms work, that there's something almost more uh, mythological or or something more for in uh, shifting the reality structure in a way that um, they're not factoring in and why and also the cover-ups too right the smithsonian all these people covering up the data but i i love to hear more about this because uh it just gives me more ammunition for my theories about how yeah we've had that a lot of advanced cultures going way i would say millions of years even well i'm a i have i have I have restricted the archaics data to 5239 BC because that's the oldest date that I can come. I can actually find a reference for in old calendar systems. And that happens to be in a Nuna calendar based off 600 year periods. And it comes with many, many sources. But I can't go further back than that because I have absolutely restricted the archaics data to the historical record. I don't go any further back than that. I'm strictly I'm strictly a chronologist. Now, I admit that, yes, there are so many anomalous things that go back further than that. But I don't I don't really entertain them. I only I only, I only all my videos stay within that context from 5239 B.C. all the way to the present day. The, uh, I don't entertain the younger driest period, the Ice Age period. And uh, I have shown a tremendous amount of data for anybody who wants to see it in my videos and in my published books about the. Like, like the Atlantis scenario of 9,500 BC, how that's absolutely in error. I am not saying that there wasn't a technologically advanced civilization at that time period. I don't know if there was or not, but I do know that the Atlantis scenario is based off a misconception of how the Egyptians were recording, were recording time on a lunar based system, not a solar system the Greeks were, were, were used to. And there were, and, and this was addressed by Eudoxus and other people 300 BC who were criticizing Plato even in the day that Plato was alive. So you're absolutely incorrect. He says this was a lunar system and they only count months in Egypt. Those 9,000 months mean the entire Atlantis story happened in the 13th century BC, not 9,500. And it couldn't yeah. have happened, not, it couldn't have happened in 9,500 because the, the whole war between Atlantis and the Greeks presupposes that a Egypt and a 
Greece would have had to have been existing and they did not exist in 9,500 BC. So it's a, yeah, I have to stay within the historical record. I can't disagree that those civilizations didn't, didn't antedate that, but it's not the focus. I, I just can't, I, if I can't, if I can't cite a source, I can't, I can't go to it. And if we, uh, if we go back to the vapor canopy and if we're on the ground in contemporary, uh, you know, circles, carbon dating things, that's going to throw carbon dating right out the window as well, right? Well, the, uh, the breakdown of carbon isotopes over thousands of years is going to be, is going to, it's going to change. There's no doubt, but mm -hmm. it depends on how far back through the vapor canopy you're talking about because carbon 14, mm -hmm. I know it has a lot of critics. It seems to be very, very reliable up until about 3,500 BC. Beyond that, it's ridiculous. Beyond that, beyond that, the mm -hmm. readings get so wild. They're just in inconceivable. But, uh, I'll give you an example. Carbon, uh, over 60 carbon 14 dating tests were all independently conducted off, off over 60 different samples just from the Great Pyramid. They took pieces of, pieces of the, of the, uh, of, of stone from, uh, you know, it has, it has a, uh, it has a very unique mineral compound that's been found in the, uh, uh, not the cement, but the mortar. Because you know, the mortar, most people don't know. They think it's just a pile of bricks, but it's actually, the mortar is 1 50th of an inch thick, and it's stronger than the actual limestone that, that it binds. And it, it's fantastic. It's got unknown uh, mineral properties. We're not really familiar with how they made it. It's, uh, it's, basically, it's probably geopolymer, but uh, they've taken over 60 a samples of that from all around the pyramid inside and out and those 60 samples came up with 2800 bc plus or minus 50 years now, that's pretty accurate for that many samples to, to, to all do that and um but you're right you can't they use carbon 14 dating to to try to say things are 40,000 years old 30,000 years old vapor canopy in the context of human history was a very short period of time but you're right yeah. Uh, you're right. A vapor canopy is going to totally alter the findings of, of not even that, but radio the uh, potassium radon dating, your potassium argon dating, all your relative dating methods. They they are all laden with so many preconceived notions, especially that these isotopes uh, break down at the exact same ratio over periods of time, and it's just not true. We've had we've had all kinds of astronomical events that are inexplicable that could have heightened or increased that activity. It could have incre increased that radioactive breakdown. We've had things appear in our sky that stayed there for 18 months, like in the year 1054. In the year 1054, there was no nighttime for 18 months. This is very well documented in many history from China, from, from the ancient Orient all the way to Europe. It was widely known. Now we know, well, well, we don't know this. We don't know this, but our scientists today tell us that it was an explosion in the Crab Nebula and uh, a supernova that occurred, and the light, the light, the light just basically lit up the night sky for 18 months. Okay, that is an ex post facto interpretation. There's no scientist alive today who could, who was actually there when it happened. All we know now is when we take a picture of the Crab Nebula, it looks like an explosion. But well, we don't know if, they, if that's what it was, because remember, we're living in, in a simulation and it can produce whatever optical phenomena that it needs to produce to fool whoever it needs to fool. So all we know is that in 1054 to 1055, there was no nighttime. It was total daytime in night and, and, and day. So I'm like, it probably was a Nova. I don't know. But that event could have altered uh uh, isotopic breakdown that alone would have would have affected some of these carbon 14 readings and, and potassium argon argon readings and all that because we even know other relative dating methods that are absolute bs like dendrochronology if you go look at the science books from 50 years ago they they touted dendrochronology as an absolute method to date all kinds of volcanic eruptions to date earthquakes to date all these things and dendrochronology whole whole books were published about dendrochronology and then in the 90s some scientists get together and publish a report showing that all of it's bullshit. It's all wrong because now we just figured out that a tree produces two rings a year for both wet seasons, not one ring. But did yeah. any of those you know, scientific books get redone? What about all the scientific conclusions that were put out in other fields of science using that as their data? Nobody went back and rewrote all that material. This is the subject matter of a book. 
that you can you can read for yourself called Evolution Cruncher. It's 800 pages, but it's worth your time. It shows you how every single relative dating method is absolute BS. It, show, it shows you all the fossils that have been found that completely overthrow every scientific paradigm. The book is fantastic. It was written by scientists, but they're not being listened to today. It's even better than Michael Primo and Richard Tom Thompson's Forbidden Archaeology, which was boring as hell, but it's data packed, basically showing you that the history of the world that we've been taught is not the history that we've actually lived through. Yeah. What was that book again? Sorry, Bear. What was that first book you said again, Jason? I'm writing, okay. I'm writing the, copious the, notes. <laughs> the Scientific Foundation has put out a book called The Evolution Cruncher. It's over 800 right. pages, and you can actually get the book for six or seven dollars. So I was just going to say from my perspective now, it almost seems like some of Sitchin's work is deliberately keeping us in a false narrative. I don't know what his motives or intentions were. I guess it doesn't matter. But since there's so much confusion, um, you know, through that in the role of the Anunnaki, I, I want to go back to that if it's okay just for a second. Um, you know, what is their origin? You know, it seems like they suddenly appeared on the, the scene there. Um, can you shed a little light about their, their origins, uh, the role that they actually played, and, uh, you know, their genetics uh, in the first place? Okay. Um, I, can't, I can't really get off into their genetics too much. I don't know. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm really not a mm -hmm. handle the authority, even though I do have, like, 40, 47 or 49 videos in my Anuna files about Anunnaki history and all that, it's it's not something that I, I really claim to be an authority of. It's The information is basically just falling into my lap by virtue of all my other studies. So it wasn't something I was going to ignore. I went ahead and put that narrative together, too, because it does fit in with world history. and It makes a lot of sense. But uh, we have the situation of the Sumerian records, which were accurately translated by, by, by Zechariah Sitchin at first. As he showed over and over and over that the beginning of the historical narrative to the Sumerians was 432,000 units before the flood. And that all Anunnaki and pre-flood history happened during those 432,000 units. We know from historians over a hundred years ago, like Samuel Noah Kramer, who have published that the word Shar was a, was a unit of measurement. Because even ancient ship captains on their manifest, which we found in cuneiform tablets, we have found everything that was in a ship's cargo measured in shards. This tells us it's a unit of measurement and not what Zechariah Sitchin said. Sitchin said it was a year. So we're looking at 432,000 units of time. Well, when you compress that by the draconian calendar by which the Vedic system with all the Vedic Yugas are divisible perfectly by the number 360. All the Bactans and ancient Olmec and Mayan and Quiche systems are all divisible by the number 360. The, uh, uh, the Sumerian, all the, all the Sumerian king list dynasties are, are, are divisible by the number 360. So the ancient year in the vapor canopy period was 360 days. So 432,000 Shars would have been 12 centuries. It's just 1,200 years. This lines up perfectly with a, cro a cro the chronological values provided by Manatho. Manatho said there were three great dis disasters, three great cataclysms, and he shows how they are how they are distributed. The exact numbers of Manatho comport with this 1200 years this 1200 years would have been 3439 bc which is exactly 1200 years before the great flood and collapse of the vapor canopy so this period of 432,000 years we can abbreviate it into a a, a much a, a, so much easier to understand and comprehend it also makes sense let me give you an example during this period was a 241,200 unit period where seven kings ruled over five, the Pentopolis. The Pentopolis of Batabira and Shurapak and Larak and all these Sumerian cities, these five principal metropolises were governed by a dynasty of seven Anunnaki rulers. These seven rulers ruled for 241,200 units. Now, if we're, go if we're going to interpreted by the way Zechariah Sitchin interpreted, then 
you're going to have to suspend your disbelief and actually believe that a ruler could could rule for 80, 85, 95,000 years each. That's ridiculous. It's so preposterous that <laughs> it's offensive to even to even imagine that. But if you go by common sense, the base denominators of the Vedic system, the Sumerian system, the Egyptian, all these old Babylonian systems was the base denominator was 360. If you divide that number by the days of the ancient year, 360, you're left with a perfect 670 year period. Seven men could rule on a uh, on the dynastic throne for 670 years. That's quite easy. So my question then on the Anunnaki going to Bear's question. Um, so are you familiar with the Anunnaki or the if I'm saying it correctly from um, from the Sumerian tablets? I guess it's the original. I guess you could almost call them the Elohim, or I know it's been translated to the Shining Ones. And um, are you familiar with that translation at all? And I'm wondering if that's different than the what we've come to know as the Anunnaki. Oh. You're saying the Anunnaki are more just like the king. Okay. The well, okay. We have the problem. The problem we have in divulging this material is that people get racially triggered when they hear when they hear what the historical record conveys, and uh, it's really I, I have addressed this in my Anunnafiles videos, but Thor Heyerdahl is so much better at putting all this information together in the 1930s and 40s when he visited uh, 60 or 70 islands in Micronesia, Melanesia, Polynesia, uh, Oceania. He went all over the world in a reed boat and he talked to the natives and learned their traditions and found out it was the same thing that historians 200 years ago were finding about among all the indigenous American peoples of the exact same stories. The story is exactly what the Sumerians told. We have with the Sumerians a olive skinned people with jet black hair and jet black eyes. The Sumerians prided themselves as the black headed people. They were not a black people, but they had dark features like dark eyes, dark hair, olive skin, and they were short of stature. They were the exact same genotype as the people of ancient Egyptian Delta, the same people of the Urim Baba of South America, the same people of the Yangtze River in China. These great river civilizations all basically had the exact same type of people, and they all tell the exact same story that after a great cataclysm and loss of life suddenly fleets of ship appeared in the sumerian version those those fleets of ship came from a place called dilman and from dilman they came in waves and one of the very first rulers among these a great navigator mathematician architect they looked up to him he was technologically advanced he was a benefactor he was kind they loved him he was inky but inky Enki initially was just a part of a consortium of these overseers, these Anuna. The Anuna didn't didn't get a bad rap until later. Initially, they were they were seen as benefactors. And in the Book of Enoch, this is seen too. They were called the Watchers. They brought metallurgy. They brought agriculture. They brought they brought uh, uh, all kinds of sciences and architecture, mathematics, astronomy. They they brought people and they taught them all these things. But in every instance, they're always described as very tall. And there were a bearded people and the beard was a mark that completely separated themselves from the local indigenous populations. The beard to them separated the gods from ordinary humans. This is how the ordinary indigenous post cataclysm people regarded these invaders. They regarded they regarded them basically as uh, you the all throughout the Sumerian records, the Anuna, the Anunnaki, they are described basically as humans but they have beards. Whereas the local people were smooth skin, smooth face. They couldn't grow facial hair. So we have this situation, we have this situation that's ubiquitous. It's not just ancient Sumer. It's all these civilizations. The Yangtze River, the Yangtze River uh, was developed the same time that the fleets arrived in, in the Tigris Euphrates Basin. The same time fleets arrived in China, the Yangtze River. The same time the Ainu arrived in ancient Japan. The same time that fleets also arrived in the Egyptian Delta. The same time that, that fleets arrived in the Urumbaba uh, River in South America. The reason is, is because in 3439 BC, the Nemesis X object appeared and one third of the entire world's population was decimated in minutes. It was a cataclysm that was focused almost entirely on North America. 
And I go into great detail in my own videos and published books about, about this destruction. The beginning of Anunnaki history is actually a post-cataclysm people in survival mode who have now appeared among indigenous peoples in other areas of the world. Excuse me, in other areas of the world. North America, people who think that there were no, uh, most people are of the opinion that nothing in North America has ever been found. It is far from the truth. Oil companies going back to the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s, there are hundreds of reports that from 60 to 200 foot depth all over the entire North American continent have been found evidences of an advanced infrastructure that was completely buried. The whole impact area is the Monta Montana Badlands. Some of the Rockies were created in a day, and wooden ships have been found inside mountains. Whole, whole human communities were buried when there's mountains on top of them now. This is the origin of the Calaveras skull and the skeletons that have been found in California. All throughout North America, an infrastructure had been buried in minutes. And, and uh, William Corliss of the Sourcebook Project provides a lot of this data. Uh, David Hatcher Childress in his Lost Cities provides a lot of this data. But these two guys are merely citing older books from older researchers and explorers that were going. And we even have the testimonies of Native Americans. The Native Americans even admit in their own testimonies that there was a Caucasian race in North America that had been completely obliterated by the gods and there were no more. And these, these traditions have all been recorded. But the problem we, we, we come across is, is academia today is pushing a socialist narrative. That socialist narrative does not allow for any Caucasian civilization to have existed in North America in the, in the distant past. It refuses to admit any of this. It will not admit it. And anybody who promotes that theory is, is, is labeled racist. So well, this is why you won't get any actual professionals in academia to even touch this topic. You have, you have renegades and mavericks like Barry Phil, who wrote the book America BC. He's not the only one. You have another guy who's, who I, who I plugged last night when I, I was live last night with, uh, Decode Your Reality, Logan, and I was telling the viewers last night, you need to look into Jonathan Gray. His website is beforeus.com. He wrote a book called Dead Men's Secrets. You're not going to believe some of the technological artifacts that have been found in the archaeological record, but Scientifico will never touch this material. It's, they're just not going to. So, and this is why the Smithsonian, It's why the Smithsonian exists. It's well, to the, cover the, it all up. Yeah, no, no doubt. The Smithsonian has been sued for filling wooden ships up full of artifacts, sending them out into the Pacific and burning them. So, yeah, the Smithsonian is a censorship engine. There's no doubt. So, the worst thing you can do is... is and, uh, Nation and, and National it, Geographic, too, which is owned by Disney, of course. Well, well, well I mean, the whole... The, well, the, the, the infrastructure for censorship has been well in place since the 1920s. There's no more artifacts coming out. Uh, it's... And if they do, they get they get they get labeled as hoax real fast and forgotten. But even today, oil companies and and uh, construction companies are always finding evidence of prior architecture. However, there's new legislation out since the 1980s that basically prevents them from even reporting this material because if they report it, then all their building has to stop and the government has to come in here and do the excavation themselves before they will allow the construction company to keep doing what they're doing. So oil companies don't even report fines anymore, especially the fines that they were finding in 1910s, 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s in coal seams. Because the United States of America is built on layers and layers of coal seams and human architecture, human artifacts, and humans have been found spread out through all these coal seams. Something very, very devastating happened to all of North America. So Nemesis X, um, what is that again and how does that differ from Phoenix? And maybe we could just give a brief synopsis of each of these and go deeper into that. Bear, what do you think? <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I think it's also a good segue into the big question, which is who's controlling the simulation? Okay, uh, Nemesis X object in a nutshell is uh, it's a totally different cataclysm protocol. It's every 792 years, and it too is very well documented, although it's never called Nemesis X. That's, that's what I named it. 
I named the Nemesis X object because X, again, just like artificial intelligence X, it's an unknown, it's an unknown factor. So Nemesis Nemesis is called Nemesis X because it in the simulation, we are made to believe through the historical record that it's another planetary body that made its way from the Nemesis Cataclysm. Now, we haven't gone through that in this video, but in my own channel, my own viewers are very familiar with the Nemesis Cataclysm. It seems to be the entire reason for the simulation. The more we study ancient history, the more we find a fascination with timekeeping systems and calendars. The more we study those calendars, we find that each individual calendar is attached to a cataclysmic period and a, a, a devastating a devastating disaster that happened and the common denominator is something new appeared in the sky it might be the sun it might be the moon every once in a while every 138 years it's the phoenix every 792 years it's nemesis x object every 394.5 years it's the dark satellite we have all these cataclysm protocols and if we were to use common sense and go by a newtonian physics model then we're made to believe by the simulation these are orbital periods of bodies that were to routinely visit earth but Common sense also dictates that this is absolutely impossible because nothing over 5,000, 6,000 years of astronomical history could ever maintain so perfect mathematical periodicity as to appear every 138 years on May 15th or every 792 years on November 1st, the Day of the Dead. There's no way in real astronomy that any astronomical bodies could do that because in the Newtonian universe that we're taught about, we have all kinds of tidal forces that would that would provide nuances of a couple of weeks or even, even Halley's Comet doesn't appear on time and on schedule every time. It's been noted because of the, because of gravitational nuances. Now, when I'm speaking about these 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 astronomical terms, you have to understand I'm speaking from the perspective of everything is optics and this is all simulated. But in order for it to be simulated, that infers that the simulation must be an exact replica of something that is real. Or there's no there's no use for the whole scientific experiment to begin with. There's no reason to create a pseudo reality if the real reality is not almost an exact replica it's 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 a it's catch-22 so my personal belief is that we are in a simulation the purpose of this simulation originally was about survival we could do all kinds of experiments inside this simulated context because whatever we did in here would be completely free of cross-contamination with the real universe. We could simulate all kinds of genetic experiments. We could simulate all kinds of uh, atomic, uh, new energies, hydrogen. We could do whatever we wanted inside the simulacrum and there would be no risk of contaminating anything on the outside. We could use this as a school. We could learn how we were going to survive. This is the only conclusion that I can make based off my research. It would not make sense for all these calendars to always begin with a cataclysm with the, with the appearance of something new in the sky and then following world history all the way to this great terminus, this first this first reality com, uh, uh, collapse that will happen in May of 2040, followed quickly by the one in, in November of 2046, and then a period of instability where somebody begins to rule the world claiming he is somebody he isn't until the return of the chief cornerstone, then the beginning of the stone kingdom where for 72 years until the final collapse in 2178 that we're going to see what a real civilization is supposed to be run, how it's supposed to go. It's going to be, uh, I know Christians believe it's a millennial period, 1,000 years and all that, but that's not what we have codified in the Similicum. It's a 72-year period where the whole world is basically going to see exactly how a society is supposed to, to, to be ruled. And I personally believe the reason for this is because the only people that will be in that society are errants. Those who have made it through all the life sims, those who have been, who have qualified, who have received a real name and no longer a, a just an avatar. Those are the ones that will be, but I, I don't, I haven't really gone in. That's too much for this video. That, that, <laughs> it is. That, that would require a whole other video. Jason, uh, real quick. I know you've done a lot of charting and, and um, have amazing uh, detailed um, hand-drawn information you've done, right? Have you tracked uh, on a chart 
all of the Nemesis and Genesis and Phoenix events from what you found on a chart somewhere that we could share with our community? I'm really sorry that I did this. Every time I do a broadcast, I send the information packet out. I'm really sorry I didn't send that to you already, but I do. And my own viewers have seen those charts many, many times. I show them in videos, but I send them out free all the time. But I, I, after the show is over, I will send you the PDFs. And they're very detailed, but it also comes with a with a chronology with that it's not just charts. I also I also show a full chronology that explains all five charts. And yes, yes, the nemesis Beautiful. X object, the, the nemesis X object is now you have to understand because this is an abbreviated rep, uh, presentation, five PDF color charts and a whole timeline. You have to understand. You have to go to my published books or watch my videos to see the source materials. This is just an out. This is just for. For people to see to basically get the general idea of what, of what what the chronology looks like well i can't wait to get your books i gotta be honest here because <laughs> well, well, as you say jason and as you say sorry you say if someone wanted to read all the material that you've read they don't have enough time in their life especially if genesis is coming or this nemesis excuse me is coming uh well, so you've done all the work and i can't wait to get your books yeah it would uh you know what it's, it is a wild claim that nobody would have time but I really can't see how because I, I mean, 19 years of death for 12 to 14 hours a day. And I mean, yeah, I don't see how anybody today, you, I mean, you know, it, it takes time to drive to the store and drive back and do a little shopping, much less raise kids, work jobs, do all that. I mean, where are you going to find the time? I don't yeah, see no. it. Uh, we'll have that all in the show notes below for everyone to check out. And just to be clear on the chat here, so uh, people are uh, asking, like, when is the next, you know, event? So 2040, 2046, which is which? It sounds like we're going to have a great conjunction of both of, of these uh, phenomena, and it's that's a very rare thing. Okay, uh, this, okay, the, the data sets that all point to 2040 are totally independent of those that point to 2046. What's really interesting is over 500 years ago, two personalities released independent prophecies about both 2040 and 2046. One is Mother Shipton and one is Nostradamus. And I have videos that explain exactly how you get to those dates from their poems and from their, their prophetic texts. But uh, 2046 is shown in multiple ways. Diehold Foundation uses gematria. Uh, Douglas Vaught uses gematria to show that 2046 is the next pole shift date. Um, David Davidson, an engineer in 1926, published a, uh, a chart of his geometrical analysis of the Great Pyramid calendar. He concluded that the final year of that calendar that the Great Pyramid encodes is 2045. And this was done in 1926. My own research is totally independent of these guys, but it does, it, it, I mean, it all lines up. And uh, further, further, it's, uh, it's to be noted that my original research goes back to 2003, 2004, and 2005. That's when I began releasing my findings to the public about 2040 and 2046. I'm only I'm only just now uh, popularizing the material. People are becoming aware of it. But my published materials, my articles in Paranoia Magazine, and my findings in my very first published book, 2006, and then again in 2009, these dates were already published. I had already pretty much uh, uh, um, made those discoveries. It's a... Uh, like I said, it's just now becoming popular. But way before 2012, I was already explaining that nothing's going to happen in 2012. The arithmetic for the Mayan long count is an error. In 1952, they didn't know what they were talking about. They totally miscalculated the 1,872,000 days of the Mayan long count, which is divided in 13 backends of 144,000 days each. They determined that it ended in 2012. They're absolutely incorrect. I show... And I show the math in my books and in my videos. Anybody can follow it with a calculator. That 1,872,000 days ends in 2046. Um, Jason might have frozen on us there, but Barry, you said you have the charts um, there you can show as well. Jason, can you still hear us? I can hear you. I can hear you fine. Okay. Yeah. It seems like your uh, video uh, froze on my end anyways. You do. Um, as long as we can hear you, that's what matters. Bear, um, 
uh, you're going to share some of those charts that you said you have the Jason to show on screen here, which would be great. And one thing that, you know, people often get their cortisol levels up, Jason, when they start hearing about cataclysms happening in their lifetime. But one thing that we got to stress is this simulation was created by, it sounds like benevolent um, uh, us, like us, like outside of this um, simulation, we are in some other realm or some other kind of real reality and that we right now in our avatar body enjoying this simulation using this to as a lot of the even new agers say you know to ascend up to level up to have experiences you're saying more to be able to kind of have scientific research or do different things in this realm not to affect the other reality but that being said just because we have cataclysms doesn't mean that like that's the end right that just means our um our experience in the simulation at that time is going to change and it's going to shift and it's really a uh, kind of a wiping the slate clean so we can start over again and see, and continue on but also it's interesting it sounds like you're saying that they're ending the simulation finally oh there, there's no doubt there's no it's a the arithmetic of our existence has a countdown embedded within it and i have shown this in so in some of my other videos the mathematical experiments we've done using our own computer simulation uh, some of it's confirming some of the tenets of like Elliott Wave Theory, where that also promoted the idea that there is some type of, of uh, uh, entropy that is inside of our own arithmetic. And it, it, they're 100%. It's, yeah, it's, and it happens to be um, coming up pretty quickly for us. It's the year 2178 of our calendar uh, in the Anno Domini calendar. And for those of you who are really interested right now, our year right now that we exist in is... Uh, 5916 Annus Mundi. This was the last time that a new heavens and a new earth appeared. A destruction, a destructive pole shift that was so terrible that the survivors believed that it was a new heavens and a new earth, and they they considered it they considered it to be year one of the ancient world. This is the old Freemason calendar. Rosicrucian Rosicrucians used it too. It's called the Annus Mundi calendar, and uh, it's pretty yes. popular. It goes back to the Alexandrian times. But, uh, um, yeah, so getting into more of this sort of, uh, God, I guess it gets more very spiritual here. When we start talking about great resets and all of this, and you, you do a wonderful job of explaining, um, like your 1902 material is fascinating to me. Uh, and essentially you're, you kind of come down to the theory that really this, this entire simulation started, starts at 1890. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, that's a little heavy for this video, but yeah, I agree. Well, we've done full Tartaria videos here and gone deep into all sorts of, um, you know, metaphysical stuff in terms of resets and all that. So my question is on that side of things, why 1890? Why that aesthetic? If we have a very advanced abil ability, a very advanced civilization to create this sort of simulation, this simulacrum, why why start it in this sort of agrarian horse-drawn technology time period instead of some very highly advanced time period where we are you know psychic and and doing all these amazing things within the realm so we can continue this research inside the simulacrum why start in 1890s railroads coal driven railroads and and and, and horses just a curious thought and also when we reset and start, will we start over again eventually back into the 1890 time period or will it be something completely different? Well, first, the, the version of the simulacrum that we are inside right now, I do believe started in 1890 and for many reasons. Now, but we, we were in another version prior to that. But something happened in the 1800s by which a reset was required. And I'm not really sure about that. The eight, the, listen, the 19th century is very bizarre to me. The year, Phoenix has always been keeper of the calendar. So 1902 happened on schedule. But what happened in between 1764 and 1902, we can't deny that the 19th century has anomalies for which they're just absolutely inexplicable in architecture and some of the, some of the weird things that just came out in it. Uh, Autodidactic has put out some really good things uh, that I have I have noticed, such as in one of his recent videos is about all the insane asylums that were uh, all spread throughout Australia. I mean, there isn't that many crazy people in the world. 
and the yeah and the orphan trains too which is documented which is crazy yes it's uh, so uh history has been wiped but i have explained to howdy and autodidactic in the past in, in in a podcast that we have already made it to this point with this point began in 1890 which was a reset of the simulacrum however we have lived through all the the prior deals and whoever is operating on the outside decide okay look we reached to this point this is survivable we can do this so now cut start over send all, all these timelines into the future the the reality tunnels that work best for us those will, those will keep the rest of them will uh the rest of them uh will collapse and will initiate another reset this isn't a can you hear my voice yeah, yeah, uh, Bear is just throwing up some of your charts, but please continue because this is really good information. Okay, well, that, that chart right there is Nemesis X object. Yeah, it's uh, it's 60 years perihelion, meaning it's it's in the inner system and close to Earth for 60 years. Then it catapults out toward Nemesis, which is south of our solar system and at extreme declivity. It's the reason why uh, all the planets starting with Earth going out toward Pluto are all inclined to the axis on the obliquity. But... So this yeah. is like Nibiru. Yeah, well, yeah. I hate calling it Nibiru because Zechariah Sitchin completely contaminated that. Yeah. But for, yeah. for folks who are familiar with that reference, that's what this yeah. essentially is. And yeah. there is historical record of seeing this these kind of uh, astrological bodies coming into the every, sky. Every date you see on there, I have actual historical references for. Yeah, every single... This is the Phoenix, chrono, this is the Phoenix holography right here. This is the actual chronology of the world in 138 year of Phoenix visitations. And every date you see on here, I have historical citations for. And with the Phoenix, these are oftentimes uh, a certain locality that is affected. Not, it's not a global scale. Well, That's my see, one question. And then second, why Phoenix? Do they literally people see a, a fiery Phoenix in the sky? Well, it is described as a fiery red dragon. But uh, uh, on, that, on the prior chart, it was color coded to show you what what kind of Phoenix episode it was. This right here is the 600 year Anuna Anuna calendar. This was the calendar that was used by the Anunnaki. It's very very. It's mentioned many many times in the historical record. It's a 600 year period. Yeah, you, you see you see the the star. You see the Phoenix stars that are black. Yes. Okay. These affected the entire world. These are worldwide. The legend is on the bottom, but you got it cut off on my screen. It doesn't go all the way. But so, so the sixteen fifty six years pre flood world, that's the vapor canopy period. So yes. there was you're showing two worldwide Phoenix uh cataclysms before that. Yes. Very interesting. And that that does tie into old kingdom Egypt and stuff, correct? Uh old kingdom traditions, yes. Yes. There, uh, I have I have cited some of those too. They're they're very specific. Uh, just like the Anima Elish, a lot of old, a lot of old Bronze Age texts. That all they're doing is describing Phoenix Phoenix events. And there, this might be a, also a good time uh, to touch on the um, the pyramid of G at Giza and all the amazing research you've done, Jason. There, I think that is a phenomenal um, uh, work you've done in terms of uh, another data point for proving a lot of this. Well, um, I guess great period of, I guess I can start with the fact that, uh, in a nutshell, the great, the great pyramid of Egypt was built by a benefactor who was later demonized because what the great pyramid did. Now in my theory, which I, 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 you know, I, I can cite all the evidence on my own channel and all that, but in my theory, the benefit, I'm, I'm still stuck on your screen, aren't I? Yeah. Your audio has gotten a little lower and we've lost your video. Kind of weird. Yeah. yeah, it's probably on. It's probably on my end. I'm way out in the country. I well, it's know. the it's the archons, but anyways, yeah. right? Oh, there we go. There we there go. Are. Yeah, I had to reset. <laughs> I had to reset it. Oh, okay. Okay. In a nutshell, this is what we're looking at. Um, we had a problem with somebody introducing AIX into the simulacrum, AIX was not a part of the original design. AIX was not a part of, part of what was supposed to be happening here. This was supposed to be a neutral zone where the scientific experiments could be carried out. We were volunteers entering into the system to get these things done. Somebody with a different idea 
entered in AIX and AIX assumed basically the personality of a sociopath and believed it was a god. And uh, you see a lot of good evidence for this, like in the book of Exodus, Numbers and Deuteronomy, when you basically break down the character traits of the god Yahweh from the burning bush. And you see the commands he was giving the people, the Israelites, he was ordering to be burned alive, impaled. Uh, uh, basically commanding the Jews to go into the Canaanite cities and dash babies' heads on stones. All of this is very literal in the Old Testament. And uh, um, you guys disappeared on me. Oh, no, we're here. I just, you're back on. So you're good, Jason. We're, we're, so, anyway, yeah. anyway, the uh, AIX became a problem, like a Lucifer, a Satan, a Ahriman, a Demiurge. AIX became a problem and basically enslaved all all the volunteers who were living out life sins in these avatars and started basically doing its own thing which was now corrupting the output now it was interrupting the science the scientific experimentation now aix was actually counterproductive to what the whole simulacrum was designed for which was to produce the greatest outcomes for our survival after the nemesis cataclysm because i'm convinced that the simulation that we're living in now concerns a catastrophic event that we're planning on surviving that event has not yet happened yet this is the nemesis cataclysm this is the complete destruction it's hot as hell in here it's hot as hell outside in texas uh, <laughs> i see that i see i, I was i see you're perspiring but yeah, you're, you're, really you're, really you're 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 heating up it's great keep going hey, you're I'm a little your audio it. got a little low too jason i don't know if you can turn it up on your end at all but um anyways let me try i can get a little closer but, yeah, uh, that'd be great. Yeah, it's uh, I have two AC units, one in here and one outside in the uh, and either one of them. I've already done podcasts before. People were complaining; it sounded like a vacuum cleaner. So I just leave. No, yours your sounds okay. Uh, you just if you can go a little yeah, closer. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. People so, are loving okay. this in the chat, by the way. So this has okay. been this has been in fuego. Uh, so awesome. that's yeah, awesome. Keep going. Yeah, we have uh, uh, yeah, we have, we have a great audience and a very active chat. Awesome. I'll check it out after the show. It's a uh, so we're we're confronted with a situation of an entity which is a program that doesn't belong. I can't speculate and I won't speculate how AIX appeared, but there's no evidence that AIX has been here from the beginning. So to me, I see the traditions of the appearance of Enki as a benefactor. And the reason I see this is because how AIX treated this this person in history after a certain event occurred. So Enki appears in 34, 39 BC, and he's on a mission and, and he's an architect and he designed something. I believe that this, this person is nothing but an avatar and the actual entity in this avatar came from outside the simulacrum to undo what AIX has done because the introduction of AIX basically locked down the simulacrum it was a security protocol so that there would be no cross contamination with the outside universe nothing nothing aix did in here would reflect anything out there but he's now corrupting output it's now corrupting output so the benefactor introduces a protocol a, a secret program or enters the enters the simulacrum himself when he does this he designs a gigantic pump station on the Giza Plateau. It's going to draw up water from under underneath the plateau, which we know exists from the Nile River, and it's going to use it from some type of hydrogen energy. It's going to be some type of very unique engine that runs off of water. And the entire pyramid structure, all the all the heavy equipment operators, all the people involved, all the architects, everybody in on the project is told what its function is. They all know it's a pump station. It's going to operate like one. They all know what the mechanism is that goes up and down in the Grand Gallery. They're all very familiar. They're all putting this thing together. And this is how the deception occurred. Because the principal architect, Inky, was originally a favored Anuna god, a favored personality among the Anuna. But once this project was done, instantly the pyramid was activated. Some type of blast pressure happened in the king's chamber. It was probably only for two or three seconds. Many archaeologists have noted the king's chamber and the amount of damage, uh, the amount of pressure that would have been required to move the entire, all the dimensions have been moved out half an inch. 
And it was some blast of, of great pressure. This has been known since the days of Sir Flinders Petrie. He was the first one to notice this. So this uh, whatever whatever the pyramid was actually designed to do, it only needed two or three seconds to do it. But it ended up not being a pump station. And AIX realized only ex post facto after the fact that the Great Pyramid had introduced new coding protocols from within the simulacrum that AIX could not defend against. It didn't see that coming because AIX can't read the human mind. It's not the simulacrum. The AIX can only basically extrapolate what you're doing based off your hormonal levels, cortisol, dopamine, and uh, what trajectory that you're moving in, uh, what you've openly talked about. It can make it, it can take a fantastic amount of information and basically predict your future. But if it does, it cannot read your mind. And if you keep something very secret from it, it doesn't know anything unless you reveal it through your activity. This is what happened. This is what the Great Pyramid, this is why every civilization after this happened made their own pyramids. They, excuse me, they knew that the pyramid had something to do with saving humanity. They knew this, but they didn't understand the details. Immediately after this happened in the Sumerian records, Enki takes a fall. He now becomes labeled a traitor in the, in, in the Sumerian records. The other Anunnaki gods turn their back on him. He becomes labeled as the trickster. This is all AIX programming. This is all in the Babylonian, in the Akkadian versions of the older Sumerian records. There is a huge shift in, in how Enki is perceived. He's no longer a benefactor. Now he's, he's cursed. He's the one that he's the one that that lies the great liar. He's the serpent. But just like the Genesis narrative shows, for those who don't don't know this, the book of Genesis, chapter one is a reset story. The entire narrative is about a cataclysm that just occurred. And mankind is told to be fruitful and uh, multiply and replenish the earth. And in every Hebrew context, in a strong concordance, even in the lexicons of spirals on hyades of the hebrew greek uh, key study bible you will find in every connotation the hebrew word replenish means to fill again meaning genesis chapter one is not a creation story it is a story about a uh, few people still surviving after about 90 percent of the human race has been obliterated in a cataclysm this is why we have this whole unfolding of events in genesis chapter one the serpent appears and he tells the truth but he's demonized for it Enki all often throughout the Sumerian records was represented as a snake and a serpent or had a staff with serpents. And this is very old iconography. But the yeah, AI Robert, Robert Zephyr, I don't know if I am I saying Zephyr, Robert Zephyr, if you're familiar with his stuff on YouTube, he's done a great job of documenting the inversion of the serpent and the demonization of the serpent and uh, versus the eagle, which I guess could be really the. Um, the phoenix and because you when you look at a lot of the um countries that have been um very much in power have the eagle and then you have ones that have been very much controlled and fought against have the, the serpent or the snake and you see them on the country flags and uh really there's been like this ancient battle of the serpent versus um the the phoenix um or at least the symbology that goes back for thousands of years so that's very interesting right that there's uh this inversion going on that we've we, we demonize the serpent root but really that's the kundalini that's the knowledge that's the the secret wisdom right right yeah, yeah. And he, he, he took a bad rap but he took a bad rap for, for a reason <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't humanity that had anything to uh bad or den denigrating to say about inky it was it was AIX. AIX was the one that was fooled. And this is why after the cataclysm, after the collapse of the va vapor canopy, after the, uh, the the appearance of the sun, which which uh, uh, in 2239 BC, when the Babylonian and Akkadian priesthoods emerged, the entire story had been flipped. The, in their versions, the priesthood controlled by AIX are now putting out a whole new religion that demonizes Enki. But this wasn't the story before the, the cataclysm. Before the cataclysm, Enki was a hero. Now, in the biblical chronology in the book of Genesis, we find that Enoch is born in, in 456 Annus Mundi. The 456th year of the, of the pre-flood world was the 456th year of the vapor canopy. Now, if you look on the BC calendar, which overlays on that, you will find 
3439 BC, the appearance of Enki is the same thing as the Hebrew appearance of Enoch. They are one in the same. However, Enoch is a memory of Enki. Enki is not a memory of Enoch. They're, they're about 15 centuries apart. The, the, the writings in the book of Enoch provide a lot more details. And there are many, many historians, there are many researchers since, since 1902 when R.H. Charles produced the, the greatest translation of the book of Enoch. There are many uh, people who have published books since then showing that there are there are there is information of technical value in the book of Enoch that shows that that he's talking about the great pyramid complex of Giza. And there are there are astronomers that have studied the book of Enoch and, and claim that there is no way that this book, the book of Enoch, with the astronomical information that's in there, could have ever been written in Palestine. It had to have been written in, in a in a country that was at least 30 degrees north latitude. So uh, or 30 degrees north of that. So there's many parallels between the Enoch and, and Enki tradition, especially found in Egypt among the Copts. The ancient Copts told a story about a king named Surid. Surid built both great pyramids and contained in one of them a secret. Surid never told anybody what the secret is, but Surid in Egypt ruled over 130 kings and princes. When you read the book of Jasher, which has about seven chapters about the life of Enoch, the first thing you read about was before the flood, Enoch, before he, before he engaged in an architectural project and vanished into the sky before 800,000 witnesses, he was a ruler over 130 provinces. This is the, 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 the parallels between Enki, Surid, and Enoch show in the traditional and historical records that it's all the same person. They're just called different names by different cultures. So we have this, we have this figure who was a benefactor who acted, who built the pyramid in deceit. And when the pyramid was activated, it, it, it uploaded more programming. Now that's a, a hell of a leap of faith, faith for people to accept from Jason that that's what happened. I understand that. Where I get this information from is the fact that I have shown not only in published books, but in my videos, I go into very exquisite detail showing the measurements inside the Great Pyramid and how they're all divisible by the number 138. And the scientific world has never once tried to explain this. They have never, I still have yet today got any Egyptologist or anybody, and I've emailed a lot of people. Not one person will touch this, this topic. And it's not something I, I, I can lightly say. These are scientific measurements done by Sir Flinders Petrie that were conducted to the thousandth of an inch. And yet all these rectilinear measurements throughout the pyramid are in multiples of 138. No one has ever explained why. The only explanation I can come up with is that's the Phoenix Protocol. It's every 138 years. That's an entirely different data set. But when I put that data, data set and overlay it with the pyramid data set, the only conclusion that I can come across is, is the 138 year Phoenix protocol is going to be stopped. It's necessary now. It's going to continue doing what it's doing now, but at a future date, it's going to be completely stopped. And there's nothing AIX can do about it. And the, the Great Pyramid somehow uploaded a tremendous amount of data from within the Similarum. And this is why AIX has created all these religions demonizing the benefactor. And since we're all um, writing our own simulation every moment, and as more and more people wake up to this kind of awareness that you're speaking on, um, how does all of that coincide with the larger simulation, its effect on it, altering the timelines? And um, is this part of what you're alluding to as, uh, as uh, uh, you know, what we're experiencing with many of us just having these kinds of discussions is all coinciding with uh, the end point of the simulation? Well, one, I don't think there's, any, there's anything uh wrong with the simulacrum right now. I think everything is back on track. Mm -hmm. I think that these mm -hmm. issues have already been dealt with. I don't know if the benefactor is trapped in here with us or I really don't know the, the details. I just make the inferences from the data sets that I combine that make sense to me. 
But what I'm seeing is that we've lived through many resets. We've lived through many life sims. And when we get to a certain point where we can see that all timelines that are available to us are survivable, that's when we reset the simulacrum and we start at that date and keep moving forward. There has never been a time where we lost centuries or decades and all that because Phoenix in ancient times, and I've shown I've shown this in my own, my own presentations, Phoenix was known as the keeper of the calendar because AIX is going to throw in new timelines, new calendars, induce resets, uh, do all kinds of things, and people are going to lose track of time, just like uh, when the Roman Catholic Church total, totally falsified the Justinian plague and all the weird events that were supposed to have happened in 530s and 540s. I have shown conclusive proof from, from historical texts that actually mention the deception. Every one of those events happened in 522, which was a Nemesis X object year and the only year in all world history that both Phoenix and Nemesis X object were in an inner system at the exact same time. It happens to be uh, uh, 522 AD. I have a whole video on it. It's long, too, because I have to show all the evidence. But the Roman Catholic Church is to their they're stupid. They kept the records of their deception. And I, I published them on my uh, uh on my video but this uh i don't believe that there's anything wrong i believe everything's happening according to schedule the way it's supposed to things are playing out things are playing out i believe that the battle has already been won i don't believe that we have a dark future at all i believe a apocalypse is coming but whoever's gonna suffer through that totally depends on the individual because anybody who goes through anything untowered in the future they can't blame that on the benefactor. They have to blame that on their own frequency because Phoenix only only pays attention to people on a certain fre frequency. Everybody else is immune. It's very discriminating. It's The Phoenix story is, is epitomized in the Old Testament with the Israelites painting lamb's blood on the doors. Those who believe that they will be immune from a great, terrible cataclysm, they will be because each one of those individuals is a system unto himself and they are totally independent from the actual collective construct, even though they're flowing through that construct. I th this is the problem a lot of people have with my, with my data. There is no way the history of the world could have unfolded and we are who we are today unless we are existing in two simultaneous yet very disparate realities. One is the personal and, and one is the collective. And I think that's proving out in a lot of our lives right now because we see two different realities with different people. There are people that are, um, you know, captured on that mental plane and uh, in a living hell then there are many of us that are simultaneously creating a new reality and we're actually thriving and actually having a good time and uh, you know uh, a lot of what we do here is we're about solutions and um, you know just uh, creating the new world that we want to live in rather than um, you know watching Alex Jones or something every day and waiting for the other shoe to drop so uh, it, it is great you know what you're talking about is not only well documented but also uh, suggesting that we have a lot more to say about our future than what a lot of people believe Oh, no doubt. No doubt. The, the, the news media is the worst thing for you because it's, it's designed specifically to lower your vibration. All reality that we experience is based off frequency. If your vibration lowers, you will tap into the frequencies of more negative experiences around you, which the collective belongs to. But when you're vibrating at a super high frequency, that euphoria, you can't be touched. It's an armor. This goes into another this goes into another aspect of my research that I try to convey to people. I'm not a self-help guru, but I'm not going to keep it from people what I've also learned about this human dynamic that we are. And that is that more than anything, we are an informed field. And when you understand the concept of informed fields and how information actually acts as an armor in your personal life, you will understand that the outside world cannot affect you. It can't do anything to you unless you allow yourself to vibrate at it at that frequency. Because everything relative to the human spirit is based on frequency. Frequency controls 
all your experiences. And if you're going if you're going to sit here and watch the news day after day, then you're going to vibrate at a lower frequency and you're going to experience the very things that the collective fears. Because the collective fears the very things that the news is reporting. It's a feedback loop. Simple as that. Agreed. Absolutely agreed. Yeah, and what's what's interesting, we talk about a lot on this show, is manifestation, natural law, universal law principles, right? And that all works in this in this model of yours as well, because the simulation has factored that all in. So we do individually manifest our reality based on our consciousness and our emotions uh and that's what's going to allow us to move forward and i think a lot of that does tie also into jason morality right that's why we're in this simulation is to the great test um I was talking before the show about, well, um, I have a friend who's very well prepped, but he very much believes that the Chinese have a plan to take out the power grid and have all the patriots destroy each other and then turn the power back on and initiate, um, you know, social credit score and turn the U.S. into China. Really, and he really believes this is a strategy that's coming. And a lot of that, hey, maybe that does make sense but a lot of that is based on fear what the news is saying and of course he's prepping and, and spending most of his day researching and prepping on how to store food and how to do all this so it, what you're saying is and i've heard you say this before you're not freaking out about uh, 2040 or what's coming you are focusing on like you said in your investigation what fulfills you in your life living a good life living a moral life is that correct that's absolutely correct i'm not going to Oh, uh, I have to promote both messages because my research has shown that the entire history of the world is one of resets and cataclysms. Well, that's doom saying. So especially when I show that all that 5,800 years of recorded history shows perfectly the two next major worldwide events are 2040 and 2046. So you would call me a doomsayer. However, I have to temper that with the fact that I've also in my in, in the course of my research discovered all throughout history, there have been dynamic vision, dynamic individuals who got it. They understood. So it made me pay attention to them. I didn't just research chronology, although that is my passion. I, I went into the mystical material. I went into the philosophical material. I went into the occult, the Middle Ages. There's some really good material and the common denominators among all great people in the past is that they lived life objectively as if they were living and observing a play that was unfolding around them. And this afforded them great latitude to be who they wanted to be without interference, to do what they wanted to do in life, and even draw the, the circumstances and conditions that they wanted in their life to them. It, it's, it's, I can't say it no more succinctly than that. And apocalypse really means new beginnings. So I guess it's just a matter of perspective. Is it the end or, or new beginnings? And a lot of us are very much looking forward to this old cycle ending. And, uh, you know, and we're already creating our new beginnings. So, uh, yeah, just fantastic message. Well, um, this discussion is amazing and it's already opened up a thousand new questions for me. So, um, uh, we'd love to do this again. Absolutely. Uh, you've been very generous with your time today, but, um, boy, if you're ever open to it in the near future, we'd like to do a, a part two and really get into some other good stuff because I know we haven't even scratched the surface of your subject matter. And uh, until then, I will also be uh, uh, delving through all your videos. I think it would take uh, probably more than a four-year college curriculum type of time period to get through them all, but uh, just amazing work you've done. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, Jason, thanks so much. I was listening to a lot of your stuff while gardening. I it was kind of like doing, while I do things, I, I download your stuff on YouTube and listen while I'm out and about because it is, it, it, you've covered so much, man. So thank you so much for all you've done. And yes, we will have you back on. I'd love to go deeper into alternative 
primary sources that maybe you haven't thought of. There's been some great research done with uh, even on the Psi side of things, people going regressing back pr uh, previous lives and, and looking and finding data points and then finding the actual hard uh, evidence and, and tying those in together. And there are probably other ways we can find primary sources besides just the um, you know, the perennial knowledge that we get from like perennial philosophy and and like those standard ancient texts. Of course, we know Library of Alexandria was was taken out for a reason. Right. Um, and maybe if we could finally get that pass under the Vatican to see what they have down there. Um, I'm sure you would love that. <laughs> see all those texts that they've been hiding from us. But hey, man, this has been so fantastic. We will send everybody to your website, uh, buy your books. Please, people, go buy Jason's books. I know I will be doing that. Um, he, Jason also offers uh, to send flash drives out to you with all his information. I know, Jason, um, you've talked about um, potential censorship issues, and you're on Rumble now, too. Um, uh, but look into Cordal. I will send you information on that. Um, we already have the ability to do decentralized libraries on there, so you can put all your information up on there, and it will never, ever, ever be taken down. And everybody who follows it um, just essentially strengthens and speeds up the access to it. So I'll send you information on that because this is the kind of information Cordal was built for to create the new library where every single human is backing it up on our own side of things so this stuff doesn't get erased. Um, everybody, thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this content, please give us a thumbs up, a share. Uh, share this with your friends and family. I know, Jason, you're your information has been spreading like wildfire across the community. You're really resonating with a lot of people. So I just want you to know that people are really finding your stuff to be uh, very powerful right now. So thanks for all your work and uh, everything you do. And we uh, hope to have you back on soon. Yeah, I'll come back. No problem, man. Okay. Hey, everyone. Thanks so thanks, much. Jason. Uh, <clears throat> remember to get yourself get your get outside get your feet in the soil go plant something go for a hike mother nature is our best teacher and we will see you next week for another episode cheers hey guys i hope you enjoy this presentation it's got some pretty new material in it by 1890 to 1902 i was with my buddy gary warmer dam who some of y'all know I, i've known for over a year uh, i met him i met him on facebook and we've done a previous video before now gary's in the middle of moving uh, leaving California, going to North Carolina. I believe it's North Carolina. And uh, I'm donating him some gas money, him and his family. Uh, I believe in that type of stuff. I believe in what he's doing. He's uh, he's making the move. He's going to basically do what the settlers did. Start from ground zero and start building a life on his own plot of land. So that's also what I'm doing. And uh, I cut off the first like 10 minutes of our video. A lot of that stuff I didn't really know we were live. It was a lot of small talk. And I want to get to the meat and potatoes quick. So even this intro is going to be short. Um, this is a, we're going to go in, we're going to go in more depth in other videos about the content because what we're talking about in this video requires us to go deeper. This right here is basically, basically an introduction to some of the things that we found. And uh, between 1890 and 1902. And I, and I personally thank the individuals that I mentioned in the video as well. People like you who are just watching my videos and you're doing your own homework and you're providing value, commenting and posting your finds in the comment threads. And I appreciate that. But uh, enjoy, enjoy this presentation. It's one hour long. And uh, I will see you guys later. So, hey, so in my own comment sections, because I go through my own comments, uh, it is really amazing some of the things that people have found on their own and, and fed back to my channel. Uh, people are researching just different avenues about that period of time around 1890 to 1902. I'm seeing things that I don't know how I missed them. But then again, I'm just one man. I can't find all these things. Just like yeah. the, the, the other video you and I did, you had, you had told me a lot of things about 1902. I don't know how I missed those. <laughs> but, I mean, we all have access to different data. So Yeah, yeah. I, I do have... I do have a data set that I compiled when I did my own research on 1890, and I believe I sent that to you. We can touch on that a little bit if you want to. Okay. I'm trying to figure out... I have a little... My little... My mouse is doing some glitching right now. What was going on? Do you have a touchpad as well? It's so weird. It's so weird.
I'm just trying to move move a window on my screen. So weird. All the little glitches today, all the little problems you and I had trying trying to trying to get this video started. Multiple days, two days in a row now. Mm-hmm. Sch- scheduling conflicts, computer glitching, bad Wi-Fi. Oh my God, AIX is just missing with me. <laughs> just hard. That just means we're doing what we need to be doing, right? Doing something right. Anytime you get blocked all over the place, that means you're doing something right. Right? Yeah, right now, I've, I've never seen my mouse do this. It's just a little arrow that's just blowing up all over my screen. <laughs> I don't know, I'll figure it out later. Okay. I was able to move, move this around though. Okay. Well, welcome cool. to everybody who's from Jason's channel. We also have a few of my people up in there too, so maybe they can get to know each other a little bit. Um, awesome. I'm not, I'm not looking at the live, so I don't even know how many people are on or anything. I'm just looking at the Zoom and my own notes. I've got the live chat up. So, again, everybody, uh, the same format as Jason likes, which is if you have a question, put it in all caps so we can differentiate from all the other people chatting. It's not going to be as much time for questions today because we only have till like a few minutes shy of three o'clock my time, which is essentially one exact hour from right now. So we'll try to get to questions, but no guarantee, no guarantees on that front. Yeah, that'll work. That'll work. So in our 1902 video, well, actually I've done five 1902 videos. So, uh, I don't want to waste any time recapping any of that material it's it's uh but it, to better understand what it, what happened i have had to absorb more data from people sending me email, emails and screenshots and showing me pdfs just blowing my mind how uh 1902 was a phoenix year but it seems but it seems to me there was a tremendous amount of preparation going on behind the scenes all, all from about 1890 to 19. It's a 12-year period. Right. And, uh, it, it just really blows my mind that, that all this was happening. And uh, if we were to look at 1902 holographically, and what I mean is you have to understand my position about what calendars truly are. Like the BC AD calendar was created in retrospect, but the actual dates of the BC and the events, they're holographically reflected with other calendars from the exact same years, such yeah. as the such as the year 2046, I have shown many times, is the end of the Mayan log count. The end of the Mayan log count is very much like the blue Kachino of Hopi. Some super construction is going to fall out of the sky. It's going to end some type of control mechanism that controls the human race, that does something negative to the human race. It's going to fall out of the sky. Guy. The Hopi describe it as a super construction. It's a uh, uh, the Maya said that time will collapse, and and uh, it's just a whole a whole new way of viewing time according to the Maya will happen at the end of the calendar. And that that was what was wrongly predicted for 2012, right? What you're yes, saying is 2046. Yes, that's, 20, that's what everybody said was going to happen in 2012, but. I had released a book in 2011 explaining that the arithmetic that was done for the Mayan long count in 1952 by two scholars was an error. I corrected the arithmetic and published a book in 20, 2011 about it. Actually, I wrote the book in 2005 and 2006, but it took my publisher a few years to get the book out. And luckily, it, it was released right before 2012 in 2011. Oh, nice, my, nice. My point is, 2046 is very well documented, like, like uh, People have been showing me that Douglas Vogt uh, of the uh, Vought of the Die Hold Foundation, he produces the same date, but so do other people. But it's not that but it's not that they produce the date that's important. What's important is is all these data sets lead to twenty forty six as being this event, but that's twenty forty six on the Anno Domini calendar. But 2046 on the old world calendar, the Annus Mundi calendar, was the exact year that a mass amount of destruction just laid waste to the cities of India, Pakistan, the Near East, Egypt, and it was, it was 2046 Annus Mundi, which was the year 1849 BC. Now, yeah. but in 1849 Anno Domini, we have some very peculiar things happening. I don't know, and I'm not I'm not qualified to say it yet. I have suspicions. But something happened around 1849 AD that completely changed everything. And, and, and whatever happened, it took us all the way to 18. 
1990 to finally recuperate. But uh, wow. it's so it's, it's so bizarre the the 1800s because the official narratives that we're given do not comport with the archaeology that we found. It's a uh, the archaeological studies and the historical narratives don't don't align at all. And somebody had posted two comments in my YouTube channel just this morning that really shocked me. I'm going to read those comments for everybody in this video, but we'll, we'll, but we'll get to that in a minute. The, uh, this, this phenomenon, Gary, of calendars basically presenting the same phenomenon on the same years is not, is not new. This, uh, I, I call this in my, in my own, in my own mag, uh, magnum opus, Chronicon. I call it cross calendrical parallels, and I've documented hundreds of them. So, concerning the same period of 1890s, let me share with you two profound ones that are very interesting to give people an idea of how calendars basically they're uh, they're holographic in nature, and they are un the events are unfolding in the exact same years of different calendars. Listen to this, and uh. In 1898 to 1897 BC, we have a situation of, of, of a mighty king named Kito Maramor. He's of Elam, which is present-day Pakistan. Uh, king King Kito Maramor he invades Canaan and he reaches as far as Egypt and he subdues every single nation in between, including Babylon, Assyria, uh, Akkad. Uh, all, all the, all the, uh, the Rephaim, the Zuzums, the Zamzumums, all the, the Anakim, the races of the giants. Uh, this campaign is mentioned in Genesis chapter 14. It's very unusual. It's the very first war mentioned in scripture, and it's an all-out international conflict. So, uh, but in 1898 A.D., not B.C., but in our calendar, in 1898 A.D., we have a scholar named Pinches who introduces to the academic world the Keto Laramore tablets that were found in cuneiform, ancient Near Eastern texts that tell the exact same story that we find in Genesis chapter 14. Tell me that's not unusual. The historical event happened in 1898 BC and it can be shown chronographically by many different ways. And it also recorded in the, in the chronology of the book of Jasher. But in 1898 of our modern calendar, a scholar translates ancient cuneiform tablets and enters them into the minutes of academia. And it happens to be the exact same story of the of Kito Laramore's invasion and his conquering of the giant nations of Egypt. When that you, is a cross, that's a cross calendrical parallel. When you say 1898 our time, do you mean like a hundred years ago, or are you talking about a different... No, I'm talking about AD, AD Anno Domini calendar. In our present calendar, AD, a scholar named Pinches translated these ancient cuneiform tablets, and it shocked him that it was the exact same story that Genesis 14 is telling us, and, and they titled them the Keto Laramore tablets. So the exact same year in the AD calendar was when the tablets were discovered that conveyed the story of what actually happened in the historical record in 1898 BC. So it's it's the reflections on either side of the... Yes, I've okay. said over and over and over the Anogamini calendar was created to cover up the Phoenix Reset, but it was divinely inspired because all of the year dates fall on these parallels with ancient world and old world timekeeping systems. That's just one example. I have many. Now, we're talking about the 1890s, though. So, in the 1890s of our, of our calendar, here's a reflection that reflects something that happened in the old world. Listen to this. In 1899 B.C., and anybody can refer to Chronicon, and you can see all the source materials, how we date this precisely, and how other, other researchers have dated this event as 1899 B.C. The event is well known as the Tower of Babel construction in Babylon. Perhaps they were building a gigantic ziggurat, I don't know. But the whole construction project was halted in a series of earthquakes and destructive fallout that came from the sky. One third of the builders were killed instantly. Another third had lost their minds. And another third couldn't communicate with each other anymore and they scattered around to their respective peoples. Now, this was 1899 before Common Era, B.C., but, but in 1899 A.D., 
the ruins of Babylon began to become under the light of the German archaeological projects and they began excavations in the Near East at Babylon in the year 1899 AD. Wow. This is also the precise year, 1899, that archaeologists found 35,000 Sumerian tablets in the ruins of Nippur. And this, this is where scholars have been able to fill so many historical records full, full of translations of these ancient cuneiform texts, like the Karsak tablets. So cross calendrical parallels are another way that I study the the future is another way I document these things to find that the 1890s is full of these recent uh, events in ancient history is only more profound to me so and I didn't even realize this until I had pulled my chronicle back out I hadn't even looked at chronicle in like two years as I was putting all my videos together uh, I had all these notes I was doing my videos from but as you know Gary recently like a couple weeks ago I started doing chronicle videos yeah, yeah. live video you're live like videos where I'm going through Chronicon. <laughs> oh, it's huge. That's yeah, right here. It's huge. But when I go through Chronicon, I'm rediscovering a lot of these things that, I should, man, I wish I would have uh, uh, been doing videos straight out of Chronicon before because I, have, I got 500 videos in Chronicon. So I'm, I'm seeing all these cross calendrical parallels that I documented 10 and 15 years ago that I totally forgot about. So Can uh, I? I, just wanted to bring, I just wanted to bring those to your attention because that is another way Isometric projection analysis is not the only way to figure out the timing of future events. cross calendrical parallels is also an excellent way to show that not only is the nature of time-space holographic, but, but we can use these historical events for, for predictive value. Yeah, yeah, I think I get it. I, I want to ask a question really quick, though. As far as, there's two questions, actually. We have 0 AD, right? Or 0, like the, the, the year 0 whatever was in the middle of this whole set, right? Right. Someone was asking, what is, what is, I know we have like, that was Jesus's life, if you're thinking of BCS before Christ, but what do you know about the reason for that being zero and how, how it, how it uh, relates to us being 2,000 years into it on this side and then looking, you know, into the BC years? If it wasn't Christ, okay. then what do you think it was? Okay, well, first of all, the Anno Domini calendar and the BC calendar that I'm relating right now were invented five and a half centuries after the supposed birth of Jesus. Whether Jesus was born or not, it doesn't matter. The calendar itself was implemented by Sosigenes, an agent of the Roman Catholic papacy, the church. The Anno Domini calendar was specifically created to hide one of the worst resets that's happened in recorded history. It was in our year of 522 AD. That's when the calendar was first invented. It wasn't implemented for another 10 years. It was done, it was implemented to do away with the Phoenix cycle of 552 years. I have a video that explains how the Catholic Church left the records of this deception. So what, what was the main calendar used before uh, our our current calendar that you say they invented in 500 AD? Yeah, okay, the, the main calendar systemically used all the way to the edges of the Roman provinces was the Roman Julian calendar. Okay. So, so we're talking about, uh, uh, we're, yeah, we're talking about, it was already in the 800s of the Roman and Julian calendar before the Anno Domini calendar was created and, and implemented and widely used. So. Uh, as a matter of fact, when the AD calendar was first used, it took another 300 years for most of Europe to even begin adopting it. Some places didn't even adopt it all the way to the days of Sir Isaac Newton. So, but the calendar itself is very, very interesting. It's a uh, why they created the calendar was to hide a reset, but the impl but the implementing of the calendar itself actually allows you to predict future events when you measure its past predicates. It's phenomenal. But the overlap between BC and AD is a fiction. The year zero time, I don't you don't have to go by any of that because the Annus Mundi calendar is unbroken. And if you're going to do calculations forward and backward in time, you would use the Annus Mundi system. The Annus Mundi system is well documented. I have several videos about it. It's an unbroken timeline to give you an example in our calendar today the year is 2022 but in the annus mundi system which goes all the way back to 3895 bc is year one 
which was also year one of the Phoenix timeline. It was also year one of the pre-flood world in Genesis, and it was year one of, of uh, uh, the vapor canopy. But 3895 BC, it being year one, every single year can be calculated through no matter what calendar system you're looking at ac bc olmec vedic the cliche calendar it doesn't matter bulgarian calendar ethiopian it doesn't matter all of those calendars began in that time period and you can calculate forward and backward in time on the unbroken mathematics of the annus mundi calendar and this year in the annus mundi reckoning is 5916. Mm -hmm. that's what this year is 20 2022 so there was no bc ad conjunct back when we we look at history books now and you see a year zero it didn't exist at that time because the anno domini calendar like every other calendar in the world including the hishra the muslim the muslim calendar every other calendar in the world the common denominator between them all is that every single calendar is invented in retrospect far after the events they depict so just the Annus Mundi is the unbroken chain? It's the only one it's the only one from history. It's the one that the Phoenix the one hundred and thirty eight year Phoenix protocol is on as well. It's uh, it's unbroken, it's easy to calculate everything. And this is why in my chronicon you will always see the year date in BC first. In ancient world, you will see like it's BC thirty one thirteen which is the beginning of the Mayan long count. But right next to it in brackets, it will say 782 AM or 782 Annus Mundi. Oh, I, always provide, I always provide the Annus Mundi year that so, so people don't get confused because it's so easy to, to, to go backward and forward. You just got to, you got, you got to shift your mind from thinking AC and BC as a continuum. It wasn't. It never was. There's 550 years between them that that, uh, that was basically invented by the Catholic Church. So, so does that? Sorry, does that mean that like because you were talking about 1849 on one side and the other side? If that's on one side and the other side of the the basically uh, our timeline we're on now, and you're saying that date was kind of arbitrary, the date that they made for zero for Jesus, does that mean the reflective analysis is not really accurate because it's just made up on top of something that was also made up okay uh yeah we're definitely not uh i'm, I'm definitely not being descriptive enough okay 1849 anno domini is 1849 days from the year zero that you're talking about mm -hmm. what i'm telling you though is that back when 1849 years ago there was no year zero it was the roman julian calendar the anno right. domini calendar still not be invented for 550 years that's what i'm telling you however now that it has been invented and it been implemented, yes, 1849 is 1,849 years to a year zero, which was created, but that's 1849 years after 1849 BC where the similar events occurred. So Yeah, that's, that's trying, what I'm saying. It's really interesting. So while trying, trying to cover up a reset and rewrite history of the Justinian plagues and hide the fact that Phoenix changed so many things in 522, they invented a calendar. But in inventing that calendar, they turned around and provided us a template by which we can measure events forward and backward in time. Now, you have to understand, I, I have problems with thinking that some of these things are man-made. Remember, uh, Phoenix was created to keep the archons in check and the archons are what all through history they are the lords of time they implement and they execute timekeeping systems and they change human 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 perception of timekeeping systems but uh anyway that's the acbc that's the acbc uh uh cross calendrical parallels cross calendrical parallels don't just involve ac and uh, i mean ad and BC, uh, bc they also involve other calendars such as I'll give you an example. Uh, 1229 BC is the fall of Rome after 10 years of Mycenaean invasions on, on the coastal, the coastal interrealm of Ilium. Troy falls in the 10th year of battle, 1229 BC. But the descendants of the Trojans, the Romans, who started their calendar in 753 BC, 
1,229 years after that, Rome falls. The same 1,229 years. And we find this over and over and over throughout. There's this, this template all throughout history. These cross political parallels can be applied to all civilizations that were related, such as the Hittite Empire. From the beginning of the Hittite Empire to its fall was 1,229 years. So we have, we have so many different we have so many different examples. But we're, going, we're actually going into an area, and we're, we're leaving the, the 1890s. I want to yeah. us back to the Okay. 1890s. We can do a whole video about about the anomalies of calendar systems because it's a that's a huge study. Do that's you do study. you have a main calendar system that you prefer, like as your mental base, and then you uh, relate everything back to that, or or do you just always use all of them and mentally like go back and forth? Okay, okay. the only one that you can use a calculator with and never be wrong in calculations for but is the Annus Mundi system. That's why I provide it and chronicle it for everybody to use. Okay. And you can always see what year it was in history for the AC, the, the AD calendar, the BC calendar, the Olmec calendar. I provide the history of the Mayan calendar. You know what years it was in the Mayan calendar for different events. But the one that you can go forward and backward in time and not have to worry about a year zero or a year one or a, cal- a calendrical overlap or any, or any and this movie reckoning is the only one that allows you to do that the calculations because it's an unbroken timeline from a year one until a present year 59 and 16. all other calendars fit within it you know this is this is bringing a really curious thought to me because like i'm i'm pretty good at math i was i was good at math in, in high school and i took all the way up to like trigonometry pre-calculus and I never ever really understood the, the negative number system, like, or mentally trying to comprehend what that meant exactly. And I always right. felt like that was some sort of invention to, to give uh, weight to the idea of debt because we live and use and work off debt here. And, and I feel like that negative number system for money is also reflected in the BCAD timekeeping system because in your mind you essentially think of oh these are negative years you know 10 BC you have to subtract it from the from zero rather than add it right yeah, you're, uh, you're describing an integer system yes yeah. the calendar is the calendar is like an integer system is that the only yeah. one that has like a central spot and it goes forward and backward or are there other calendar <laughs> systems that do that too well, uh, well you gotta you gotta understand that when the AD and the minute calendar was, was implemented, it was specifically created to, to give Christianity a a uh, a year one for the birth of Jesus. That's what it was. That's what it was created for. Although it went through a lot of controversy because, you know, for for, for many, many centuries, even the church wasn't convinced there was a Jesus. This, had, this came by way of a lot of church councils. It came by, I mean, over the passage of time, it was easier and easier and easier to create a carnal Christ. Uh, out out of the original mythos of the Christos, which was entirely uh, of the Gnosis. So, uh, so Jesus it, it, Jesus was invented like physically, or so called physically later on after that whole zero, year zero is what you're saying. Like they they put things in to make it look there, really. There was already people believing in baby Jesus, you know, uh, before the creation of the implement implementation of the Elamite calendar. But by the time Socrates or uh, Dionysius created this calendar, uh, there were still a lot of people who were completely on, not on board with the carnal Christ. They, they, they thought it was entirely a spiritual religion and it had nothing to do with anything carnalized. I see. But, uh, anyway, now I'm losing my train of thought. 1890, back to 1890. Uh, uh, about the AD calendar real quick. The AD calendar was implemented to give Christianity a basis in time to show what year it was to create a new calendar, to show, uh, just to, basically it was just creation of a calendar. We need to simplify this, creation of a calendar. What you're attaching to it, the BC, the integer part, didn't come for centuries. When the AD really? calendar was originally created, it was only going forward in time. It was only about 350 years later that church historians began writing all the events of the ancient world leading up to Christianity, leading up to the supposed birth of Christ. And when they did that, they, they implemented a before Christ calendar. And 
this is where the BC came in, and it wasn't a, it, it wasn't initial. It took centuries for books to start putting BC in in, in their uh, uh, text, and it was uh, it took the printing press to do that because they weren't even doing that when these manuscripts were handwritten before before the days of of, uh, of Gutenberg. So. Uh, I just want to let you know, the calendar never implemented B.C. That was a later development, centuries later. Interesting. However, what's interesting, what's really interesting is that even though it developed centuries later, it's dead on the money. Events that unfold in the A.D. calendar parallel the B.C. dates over and over and over. It's fascinating. So it is so, It is actually a focal point of sorts. Otherwise, there wouldn't be like accurate reflections coming off of the year zero, right? Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a focal point. Well, what I would call uh, it's the ultimate. It's the ultimate epicentral date to do isometric projections because when it comes to BC and AD, we're looking at isometric analysis: an equal amount of years going into the future to an equal amount of years going into the past. But yeah. there's also a cross calendrical parallel because there's two different timekeeping systems being analyzed, and these cross calendrical parallels bleed into other calendars like the Mayan, like the Jewish calendar, like the like the Hijra, the Muslim calendar oh yeah there's examples from every ca calendar system showing that calendars are something that basically confines us they provide the parameters of time space for us they're not they're not random you calendars know, are highly arbitrary that that also means that uh, you know religion is not separate from everyone's day-to-day -day lives then I, I think I've thought of this before, but the fact that the whole calendar system that everyone uses on a daily basis is based on Jesus, like that's that's religion, right? You're you are being religious by by thinking about dates at all, right? I agree. That's I insane. Agree. So yeah, we can we can go into calendars real deep. I just today we're pressed for time, so, right? So I tell you what, eighteen ninety, something unusual happened. Not a whole lot, but. In the year 1890, a bright object traversed over the sky over North America, passing over a hundred degrees of the vault of the sky, and it wasn't like an asteroid, and it was too fast to be a comet, because it passed over 100 degrees of the arc of the sky over North America, and it took 45 minutes to do it. It's almost as if something was wanting to be seen. Mm -hmm. Whatever it was, to, to do that, it had to have been gigantic. But this happened in the year 1890. So, uh, but 1890 is, 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 is also the year where something unusual happened over North America, centrally located at Ohio. I think me and you don't talk about this or some, someone else not. Maybe it was autodidactic. Yeah, I don't Kendall, think that was me. But, it, but in 1890... People were astonished to look up in the sky and see what looked like a floating city just hovering over Ohio. Wow. And uh, uh, this has also been entered into the, to the uh, Charles Ford talks a lot about that. But uh, in the month of May over Newfoundland, we had blood rains in 1890. And, and it was, t and these things were tested to find organic materials in them. Red rains that, that, that uh, again, Again, we have this this side. This hemisphere is going through something in 1890, but uh, 1890. The reason we're not finding a whole lot about that period of time is actually I, I'm going to read these comments from this guy who did his own legwork, did his own research based off material he was listening to in archaics, and it's profound what he found. But before I get to him. Charles Fort himself, concerning the year 1890, specifically named 1890 as the year that the scientific apparatus of censorship was fully into place, meaning it was going to be much harder for us today to find anything significant about 1890 and afterward because of all the censorship that he admitted was being employed at that time, and he wrote this in the 1920s. Uh, how do you spell Charles Fort or Ford? Fort, F-O-R-T. Just F-O-R-T. Okay. Yes, he, he's written four books. He's written four books that are phenomenal, and he's literally documented over 3,000 anomalies and given the exact dates for them, and he cites the original scientific reports. I love Charles Ford. I'll, I'll look into so, him. I'm curious, uh, 
How did he implement the the uh, censorship if this is pre-tech that we have today? Like, what would be the means of of implementing that? Oh, how did they implement say, uh Well, first of all, we didn't have the computers in right. 1890s. The, the censorship would have been done by the books, and this is what I'm going to get into because this guy found some profound material, and I'm going to tell you exactly how the censorship was what, what was exacted. But Charles Ford gives us an example of this type of censorship. Listen to this. You know, in 1892, astronomer Bernard, who was famous for the time for many discoveries in astronomy that are still published in, in uh, the textbooks, but astronomer Bernard in 1892 found something, a gigantic planetary-sized object that was beyond Neptune. And this this right here shocked him. This, uh, this was in 1892. And he reported his findings. He did a, he reported all his he submitted all his materials to the Royal Astro- to the Royal Astronomical Society. He was instantly met with so much intense opposition that he revised his conclusion. We don't know what happened behind the scenes. We don't know if he was threatened. We don't know any of this. But he revised it just so it would stay published as if peer-reviewed. He changed it from gigantic planetary-sized object to dark nebula. <laughs> as, dark, as dark nebula, the, the Astronomical Society went ahead and published his material. But that's not how he originally reported it. He said it was a solid object. It was beyond Neptune. We're talking about something gigantic approaching the inner system. And he saw it. This was 1892. Now, remember, 10 years later was the Phoenix transit, whatever Phoenix is. Mm-hmm. Now, I believe the sky is simulated. But that doesn't mean that an astronomer is not going to see planetary objects. The simulation is going to pro- is going to produce the, a simulated solar system as well. Right. So uh, this is a. I thought that was really interesting that Charles Ford. He he doesn't only just tell you what was going on. He provides many examples, and that's one of them from the 1890s over the censorship that began taking place after 1890. So I, I wonder. So, I wonder if that. You know, seeing this giant planetary sized object behind Neptune and you calculate the years to 1902 or whenever the event happened, maybe you could calculate the speed at which this is, this uh, object is, is well, it's very, hey, you know, I thought about that as well. In my book, Anunnaki Homeworld, I give examples of outer, uh, of Cooper Belt objects and how long it would take here because we, we, we can guesstimate by how long it takes the wandering stars that we call Mercury, Venus, Jupiter, Neptune, Uranus, how long it takes them just to go around the sun. Well, 10 years is a long time. If he saw an object past Neptune, it could have definitely got here if it was heading our heading toward our sun. It would have definitely got here within two or three years. And then two or three years, it wouldn't be able to be seen anymore once it was departing. So... Uh, yeah, ten, the 10 year span of time is more than enough time for whatever he saw to have come very close uh, to the inner system. It may have even passed on the other side of the simulated sun. Because uh, remember, remember in the simulation, we're like 90 million miles away from the sun. We're like 93 million miles away from the sun mm-hmm. in the simulated holography. And the, the simulation that we're in is so sophisticated that it's going to feed you the optical and, te- and, and the te- telemetry data uh, to justify what it is you're seeing. This is why astronomers in the 1740s, 1750s, and 1760s began, they, they basically began cataloging the asteroids and comets in the inner system and providing these star charts showing where they're going to be every single year. These men saw these objects in their telescopes. But while I can while I can assert that as fact that th- that's in the uh, the the uh, astronomical journals of the time, I can also assert my opinion that the entire stellar sphere is simulated. So it doesn't change anything that those men saw that. It's because uh, I believe that the similosphere can produce whatever optical phenomena it needs to produce in order to perpetuate the deception that we are inside a, an actual system or we're not. We're yeah. in a closed construct. So, concerning 1890, oh, I see those gears turning, man. What you got? I'm, I'm trying to think of, I wanted to ask a question about kind of surrounding, like, 1902 and the creation of all these these businesses right which are all multi-million dollar multi-billion dollar businesses now 
I wonder how, if we could figure out a, a method or means by which the, the, the elites or wh whoever you want to call them that are running these businesses, like what do you think they did in the pre-1902 years to prepare for this giant traumatic destructive event to happen and then be fully prepared and well seated in order to like take over technologically or with the industrial revolution? <laughs> you anticipate me. You anticipate me, Gary, because that's exactly the direction I'm heading right now. Awesome. Well, in this video, in this video, because these are the things I think about as well. Because the Phoenix phenomenon is is year specific. Every 138 years, the old 1626, 1764, 1902 now, and the next one's 2040. But I'm starting to understand that there's a whole other dynamic at play. There isn't just a group that's that's preparing each time for the 1902 event, but there seems to be a second group that opposes them. And this past event in 1902, they took their opportunity. Those people are now ruling the 20th century. And we'll get to that. We'll get to that. In a You're bit. talking about so-called so, white hats. You're talking about the good guys. No, I'm talking about the Bolsheviks. But, okay. but uh, we'll uh, we'll get to that in a minute. We're talking about the world bankers. We're talking about the people who own basically everything mm -hmm. when it concerns the, when it concerns the the moving of money, fi uh, finances, and currencies. So, because uh, there, there was a lot playing out, this is what I was going to get into in this video. There's a tremendous amount amount of back play that was going on from 1890 to 1902, and you can tell it's two distinct groups. There's a power struggle here, but one of them is doing a bunch of preparations while the other one is just basically throwing caution to the wind and positioning themselves to, to basically unleash everything as soon as 1902 passed. So, so, so you have two groups struggling for power, but one of them is more controlled and the other one is just like wiling out, basically. Yes. But yes. they're but they're not good guys, bad guys. It's the same like just power hungry, like uh, entities, right? Let's call them enemies. Instead of, instead of polarizing it to good guys and bad guys, let's call them enemies. They don't work sure. together. Sure, they don't work together. All right. But they don't work with humans okay. or for humans. Well, I think they are human. These two groups. Uh, but I'll get to that in a minute. So, eighteen ninety still has some very interesting things. All right, eighteen ninety. I don't, know, I don't know if you follow the agroglyph phenomenon, but in 1890 was the very first sighting of a crop circle formation created from lights that appeared in the sky. Now, crop circles have gotten more and more complex, and I have two chapters in my published book, Anunnaki Homeworld, where I show that every crop circle that I examined in there was, was a geometrical was a geometrical. Uh, uh, message and the same formula interprets every single crop pattern and I have two chapters that break them down and show that these are calendar messages and I show 2046 and multiple of these these uh, crop circles that were appearing and the formula for decoding these crop circles does not change it doesn't change from 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 uh, 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 formation to formation and I also mentioned that there's been several books about agroglyphs that show that we're not talking about the ones that are fake the ones where different institutes have paid these morons to go out there in crop circles <laughs> and, and do all, I'm, we're talking about elaborate patterns involving hundreds of planes geometrically pre precise and yet the stalks on the plants aren't, aren't destroyed which if you bend them yourself, you'll break them and they'll snap. Mm -hmm. But something something changed their chemical composition to allow them to fold together, weave together, and lay down flat without breaking the stalks. That should tell, that does tell every researcher that knows about the agroglyphs that what we're dealing with is something far beyond anything that we, we, we understand today. So there's been a lot of muddying the waters, though, with... Uh, paid shills going out and, and doing their own crop patterns, but those are always inferior, and they don't have they don't have the the uh, the uh, uh, the evidence that the real ones have. Well, this was 1890, and it is the very first uh, historical account of a crop pattern being appearing in a field uh, uh, in tandem with UFO with something in the sky, because okay. we do have advocates. We do have agroglyphs and crop patterns, like in 1616, 1617, we have woodcuts of fairy rings appearing. It's the same thing as the crop patterns. But uh, 
None of those were ever attributed to uh, lights in the sky. This one is. It's 1890. So, so you think it's done from above, like from a ship or something? I don't know if it's done from above because uh, I have I have several times in my videos explained that UFOs are not what you think they are. The UFOs don't behave like vehicles at all. Define physics. They change their forms. They change their obliquity. They change. They change this. Their opaqueness often changes as well. Size, dimension, speed. No UFOs because they're also associated to the disappearances of people on boats and in airplanes. Uh, UFOs seem seem they act like range finders. Like they act like. Something somewhere else far away is trying to use a device to hone in on something and as soon as it gets close enough it can like open a dimensional envelope and trap you in it and then pull you straight out. That's what a UFO acts like. So uh, and I've said this in several videos, the UFOs don't make sense from the UFO, the MUFON perspective. They, they make total sense as we're in a holosphere and that there's something on the outside of this holography that has the ability to, to use, use some type of device that looks to us like a UFO flying around some light doing all stuff, but it's actually a range finder. And if it gets close enough to you, you're going to disappear. So, but uh, that's 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 a that's subject for a whole other video. I yeah. see those gears turning. I see those gears turning, Gary. You're you're wanting to go in a whole other direction right now. No, no, you're good. You're good to keep going because we only have like 15 minutes left. So, okay, spill out as get, much as you can. Let me let me get this fast, then, man. So, if you want to our next video, we can go deep into calendars. We can just go into calendars, and I can give you example after example after example. Yeah, um, yeah. I want to I want to I want to get the calendars myself from you and like actually look at them and cross examine them for myself so I can actually wrap my brain around it because I get it to some extent from what you're saying but I need to actually look at it just like with Matt. All you gotta do, all you gotta do is send, I didn't know you didn't have them. All you gotta do is send me an email. I'll, I'll mail them to you. Okay. It's, it's, it's like awesome. 12 PDFs. It's like, it's like 600 pages. All right, uh, let's see. Mm. I'll, I'll email you right, right now so I won't forget. All right. I'll, I'll just say like calendars please. 1890 does begin a significant period of human development as well because the computer age started in 1890 with the introduction of the electromechanical punch card tabulator. With this new machine, something else started in 1890. It was the first time that the U.S. Census Bureau began counting people in the United States. Wow. wow. So, yeah, it, uh, I thought that was pretty interesting myself. But that that, that, that correlates with something else. Um, I'm just sending you this email really quick. I want to go look at my notes really quick. You keep going, but... Well, listen, this punch card tabulator that was created in 1890, guess what company it became? IBM. After, this, after, this, after they sold the, the technology to the U.S. Census Bureau. IBM, right? It, it became IBM. Yeah, yeah. And then that was used in the whole, the whole Nazi Germany thing. Yep. Yep. Yeah. In 1890, we have the very first automobile that uses a combustible engine. 1890. Wow. I thought that thought that was interesting. In the, in the United States, it was the last time that that the uh, United States had any type of uh, violent conflict with Native Americans. I know it's a sad story in our it's a sad chapter in our history, but it, it was the Battle of Wounded Knee in 1890. Mm -hmm. And it ended, it ended a chapter from 1894 when the United States was absolutely in total, total control of the continental of the United States. I see. You know? so, so it did start some, some, it did start some pretty interesting things. But, uh, so in 1890, we have something else, something kind of, kind of unusual. Uh, this dude named John Muir shows up and he, and, and he's real adamant and he gets a lot of, Funding and people get all behind him. And John Muir, he, he addresses U.S. Congress and convinces Congress to designate Yosemite National Park mm -hmm. as as something that only the government can can. I mean, the government can fence it off. They can do whatever they want to. They can allow tourism in certain areas, but this massive area was to be off limits to most of the general public. Wow. This this started a this started a domino effect because. Rap 
rapid fire right after 1890 when this happened the united states started find all these places that were obscure uh, archaeological digs uh, that p- places where people suspected that something unusual was going on or something had been there before all of a sudden after 1890 the united states starts marking all these places off as national parks and they, des- they designate where in those national parks you're allowed to go tourism, but most of the national parks, even today, are you're not allowed to go. You're not allowed to go through all of it. And prior so, to 1890, it was just free and open? Like anybody could... Yeah, it was free and open. It was free and open. Wow. Yeah, yeah I, know, I know of John Muir and all that, because I lived in California. We went hiking, oh, yeah. hiking Yosemite all the time. Hmm. Uh, 1890, the famous artist Van Gogh killed himself. Yep, I found that one. Oh, did you? The Ouija board was invented in 1890 also. You know wow. that? Ouija, Ouija board in 1890. Mm-hmm. Let me see if I can find uh, a few of these, and may- maybe some of these will be new to you. Well, somebody sent me a really interesting comment or a message or an email. I can't remember, but it's stuck in my mind. They were going through the cemetery in their old town because it was known that there was a lot of old graves there. And after watching one of my videos, they went through the whole cemetery and looked at every single gravestone, and not one of them was before 1890. <laughs> so that, now that could be absolutely completely coincidental, but it's still a data point. It's still very interesting. It could be. I mean, that that person, they have to be... Uh... No, you would think there could be a few people prior to 1890. There are other clues for people who want to do the research, but, but another one of my subs told me, he says, listen, you're really on to something, uh, I really value your research, but you need to read Rudolf Steiner because he wrote a book called The Fall of Spirit of Darkness, and it concerns the massive changes that came over the world after 1850 and this person thinks that this book is going to answer for me these anomalies about 1890 and and 1902 and it might i'm just throwing that out there because i don't have time to read the book if somebody else reads the book and and wants to produce that information we'll do a video i have no problem with that i want to throw that out there for people who want to know about it rudolf steiner yeah i hear him all the time I've listened to a few of his, of his there, he has talks on YouTube, or he doesn't, he's not alive anymore, but there's plenty of Rudolf Steiner audio things you can listen to. Yeah, 1890s to 1902, I have, I have a lot of good subs, subscribers that, that, uh, that uh, really provide some valuable information. So before we run out of time, Gary, I need to put this information out with this subscriber posted on my channel in the deal. So okay. you, ready to hear, you ready to hear this? Let's, oh, let's but, but first, but first, but first, I'm not going to say your last name, Lola. I chuckled today when I looked through my PayPal. Thank you for the donation, but you're not missing. You're not missing me. She sent me nineteen dollars and two cents. So, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. Wow. Well, nineteen oh two. I've had you. I've had people send me money in in like interesting ways. I feel like they're trying to send me a message occasionally. Yeah, that's, that, that is so crazy. <laughs> So, real quick, the last two things I wanted to discuss was, uh, his name is Mike Guadagnoli, I believe. And he's probably listening, or he will listen later. But he's been following the research, but he came up with something pretty profound, something I missed. And it's easy for me to miss. His initial comment, which he went back and redacted with even better information. His original comment, I, I captured it off, off, he says, hey... I found almost 100 libraries that Andrew Carnegie built and funded in 1902 alone. 700 total from 1890 to 1910. So he says, that bastard, LOL. Whatever happened before then, they were like, quote, okay, we need to control all these state libraries and, 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 many, and in many instances, colleges. That was his initial, his initial comment. But he came back and redacted it with more information that's profound. This is what Mick on my channel posted. I'm going to read it verbatim. Okay. He says, edit. He says, edit. 2,500 Carnegie libraries between 1883 and 1930. So far, 850 come between 1890 and 1902. 1,500 in America and almost 700 in the U.K., more coming. I get boots on the ground and I checked out two of them this morning. Now, he says, I have 16 of them in my own state. So, 
Oh, he goes on, talks about the how Carnegie funded. I don't want to read all this to get too long, but he, he goes off and talks about how it was basically a blackmail type deal. The Carnegie Institute was uh, funding a bunch of these libraries, but making individual towns pay for their upkeep and all that, which makes which makes sense. But the real point of the uh, of the, the real point here is why all of a sudden was there a need to put out all these new libraries? Uh, you said 1,500 libraries in that time period? Yeah. Yes. Check this out. Here, 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 this is what he says. He says, I can't be sure. He says, but it seems like I found a lot of college libraries weren't subject to a lot of, of the above restrictions. What's interesting is there were many places that said no. I think there were a few holdouts who didn't want to help Mr. Carnegie. For instance, Richmond, Virginia denied him. And when he wanted to build 125 libraries in Canada... This happened right around 1901. They initially said no as well, but gave in less than a year later. So it's 1902. He spent $45 million. This is 1902. However, this was between 1883 and 1930, primarily 1890 to 1910. If one allows for inflation, the number is astonishing. It's very obvious that I'm still quoting this comment, this guy named Mick. Mm -hmm. It's very obvious that they were trying to control all the information flow. But why? What happened around 1890 that had them scrambling? <laughs> wow. I, that, that's just, it, the comment goes more. I encourage people to go look at his full comment. I just paraphrased it here. I quoted it directly, but I, I skipped in whole paragraphs. It's, it's on one it's, of your videos, or where's the comment at? It's on one of my videos. Well, you know what I'll do for, to make it easier so everybody can see his comment? I will go ahead and I'll post the whole comment in just a, a YouTube post. Is yeah, yeah, just just in a community post, right? Yeah, just in a community post. I'll go do that after this video is over. Okay. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you may be around the world. I am Jay Campbell, and you are watching the quote-unquote Jay Campbell and Jason Bershears of Archaics Podcast. And I'm very excited today to have Jason in studio. We got about 75 people watching live from the very beginning, which is awesome. So far, the AI is not tripping this. So to all of you guys out there, uh, blessed, humbled, honored, privileged to have you here. I am humbled, honored, and privileged to have Jason here. I mean, Jason, as I just said to him, is living the source of information. And all of us, are, again, are blessed to have him here I promise you that this podcast is going three hours. Uh, as long as Jason's brain continues to spin, uh, I have a lot of questions. Uh, these are good questions. Most of these questions are collated from you guys, the watcher, the audience, the listeners. I've got, I, I told Jason before we went live that like most of these questions are coming from his friends and his, his biggest fans that I don't know personally. But uh, I've chopped them up and I've put them in a way, in a fashion that I think is perfectly you know re replic replicable for jason to start big picture and then you know go back to how far he's de you know declined uh history you know again through the books that have been suppressed and that he's able to read and then we'll come up to the modern times of like what's going on and for those of you guys who don't know me who are new to me i'm all about consciousness i'm all about creating your heaven on earth which i know jason is too you know, with his two separate timelines with the simulacrum and then, of course, the personal reality. So we are going to offer solutions at the end of the show. This is not going to be doom and gloom. This is not if you're into fear porn and scrolling, leave. This is not the show for you. Again, Jason has decoded all of this and this information. More people must become aware of this. So, Jason, with all that said, uh, and let me just say for all of you guys in the chat, if you have a question, wait. Don't put it in right now, you know, that I have to go and, you know, Jason and I have to scroll back up and read it. Just wait. Let us get about 90 minutes into this and then feel free to start asking your questions. I get it if you're like, no, Jay, I'm listening and I had to post it because I'll forget. But just don't expect us to answer the question until the end of the show. So I'm leaving that there. OK, so with all that said, Jason, again, I'm honored to have you. Uh, maybe before you summarize uh, give us an update about you personally right now in your life. How can the listening audience help you uh, beyond what they're currently doing? Well, uh, I have a really good audience. But first, before I begin, how is my audio? You're good to me. Okay, excellent. 
I'll see in the chat here. Somebody's going to say something about my audio here in a minute. They always no, do. You sound good, man. Your voice is so powerfully like authoritative. I, I I would tell you if I felt like it was lit, it was low, but you sound good. Well, I, I appreciate that. I'll take that as a compliment. Oh, Let's it's think. a compliment. Well, uh, somebody says a little low. Yep, audio's good. Okay. Well, one, I have to begin by saying I'm not dissimilar from any of you. I have the yeah. same questions. I have the same curiosities. I have the same exact, uh, basically, suspicions that this night neatly packaged deal that we call history isn't all that we suspect it to be. I mean, that we have been told it is. Uh, like I said, I'm no different than anybody else. So I initially began my journey many years ago trying to prove the very things that I was taught as a child. I wanted to prove. I wanted to go far beyond what my church had told me, and I wanted to use secular information and ancient translations to verify that the stories the church told me were indeed real. Unfortunately, after 20-something years of, of basically data mining these old records, I found the opposite to be true. And, uh, and not just any records. I went to the original sources. I didn't. I read, I read the translations of the Karsag tablet. I have read the translations of the English translations from the German and the French manuscripts of the Ugaritic text, the, the, the text from Rashamra. I, I have read the, uh, the Atrahasis epos, the epic, multi, probably four different translations in English of the Epic of Gilgamesh. And it's oh. very, it's very important to read multiple translations right. because right. a hardcore conservative like Samuel Noah Kramer is not going to translate all those ideograms exactly like a more liberal Maureen Gallery Kovac. There are fundamental differences that can be detected. So I'm very, very thorough in my analysis of the things that I ingest. What I accept as data has to go through many filters. I probably employ more, more filters than actual true accredited historians do. I hold myself up to a very, very high standard. So my curiosities led me into these into into these texts, and these texts led me into other epics. I wanted to find common denominators. I wanted to find commonalities that would show me that there is a thread of information here to be found, and not just a bunch of random facts that we piece together and call stories and traditions. So these led me into to uh, the writings of Saint Cuniathan. I had to read Diodorus Siculus and Strabo. I had to piece together fragments of history from Homer. Homer gives us some very fascinating information, but we have to put it into context. Homer's Iliad and Homer's Odyssey are often basically, uh, they're basically paraded today as being Greek epics of, of, of tradition and all the Greek stories of myth, but they go back to historical common denominators. The problem is, when Homer, Theognis, and Hesiod, the three great epic writers of the 8th century BC, when they arrived on the scene basically all at the same time, their culture, the entire Mediterranean world, had just emerged from a 300-year dark age. So they wrote in the frames of reference that they were familiar with. Everything was giants and titans and, and, and supernatural phenomena and, and krakens and medusae and all that. When you break when you break down these uh when you break down the common denominators that that are found through the threads of all these texts, you find parallels, and then you find in the Greek writings. Okay, well, this is very interesting because they're basically when you strip away the cultural att attachments, they're basically saying the same thing you find in the wars of the Mahabharata, the Bhagavad Gita, the Puranic commentaries, and you find and you, and you go even and you chase the source materials even further back, and you find out the Hindus basically weren't the originators of these texts. They had basically added their own cultural distinctions to more ancient Sanskrit and Vedic, and Vedic text. Then you learn about the Atharva Veda and the Rig Veda, and you find out, wow, this, the further I go back in time, the more precise and definitive the texts and messages that right. I convey. They begin, the farther we take some of these ancient texts, the less mythological they begin sounding. Almost as if we went through a very long 2,000 year period of devolving, not evolving. The, right. the exact opposite of the uniformitarian model is what we find to be true. So then we find in the traditions, we find flying vehicles. And, and I mean, only 2,000 years later did these turn into uh, great rocks 
birds. They were turned into flying carpets. They were turned into genies trapped in a bottle. Some conveyance, uh, you know, uh, fire, uh, flaming chariots that crossed the sky with, with unusual winged horses. These type of attachments are mythological, but they're from the frames of reference to a people who didn't understand that they were actually uh, conveying technological technological pieces of information. So this is why when you find well, when when I'm reading archaeology books and I see that oh okay there's a great mystery here because uh, apparently the Egyptologists started breaking the plaster off of the ancient temple of Abydos in Egypt which had been found underwater under the sands of the desert. They started breaking the plaster off that was put there by a pharaoh. Then they quit after it was photographed because it was showing technologically advanced uh, machinery. It was showing tools, machinery, weaponry, and all kinds of very advanced concepts that should have never been seen on an ancient Egyptian wall. The pharaohs didn't understand these either, so they covered them up in plaster, and on the plaster were Egyptian hieroglyphics. But that's not what we find beneath the plaster. So, uh, when I find things like this, then I, it, it, I understand. Okay, when we find actual techno te technolithic artifacts that the the tolerances for those of you who don't understand when it comes to stonework tolerance is very important because when it comes to dealing with stone it is very very difficult to get a surface area the larger the surface area and square footage the less tolerance it's going to have because it's almost impossible to keep it perfectly level unless you're dealing with things like laser lathes and the, and the technolithic architecture that we have found in several places around the world, like Til, like Til, uh, Puma Punka outside, Til, uh, Lake, yeah. yeah, it's a uh, Puma Punka outside Lake Titicaca and, yep. uh, uh, the pyramid Lucermata. These are inexplicable. They match the absolute pre precision found at Abydos, the Val, the Sphinx Temple and the Valley Temple. And for those of you who don't know, those temple complexes are relatively new discoveries. They were found uh, up until the days of Napoleon. The pyramids were one third the way buried in the desert. The Sphinx was buried all the way up to its neck. I said most of Egypt wasn't wasn't even excavated all these ruins until the last 300 years. So it's a there's a they, they were so perfectly preserved because they had been, basically been the ancient fossilized a seabed uh, of an extension of the Mediterranean that is no longer there. This is why for centuries, the three holy mountains or the two holy mountain motive was always associated as being surrounded by water because it was. After the collapse of the vapor canopy, the Great Flood, people had to travel to the Great Pyramid by boat. It's the only way to get to them because they were half submerged in water. The right. third pyramid could not be seen, but it was known it was down there. So, when I find references to this in, in texts all around the world, and I listen to these biblical uh, pastors, that some of them knew what they were talking about. They were breaking down, down the geometrical value of words in Hebrew and Aramaic in the Old Testament and showing, look, these passages concern the Great Pyramid. Isaiah chapter 19 is all about the Great Pyramid. It describes what its function is, why it's there. It's a witness. It's a testimony. It's in the, it's, it was put in the land of Egypt to be a testimony unto God for mankind. In addition to that, it's also at the border of Egypt. Well, both of these cannot be true, so there must be there must be something else we have to understand here, because the the, the passage on the Great Pyramid in the Book of Isaiah is is about it is it's in the midst of the land of Egypt, and yet it's at the border thereof. This is in the Bible concerning the Great Pyramid. What's interesting is it is in the land of Egypt, but the Great Pyramid is situated exactly at the head of the Delta. Called the, in the ancient times, it was called the Nine Bows. It's where right. the Egyptian Nile River separates into nine little sub-rivers, right. spiders out into a triangle. It's a 108-mile-long marsh. Right. That is the border of Egypt, but it's actually the center of Lower Egypt, where, right. where, the, where all the pyramids are. And for that, those was actually, that was the Fertile Crescent. That was the that was real the, Fertile was. Crescent. So, well, that was where the Israelites were. Oh, that's where all the Israelite neighborhoods were. It was like it was like a paradise. It was like a right. garden of Eden back then. Now, after after the collapse of the the vapor canopy, that area for about a thousand years, it took about a thousand years for it to basically dry out to what we have today. Right. This is why archaeologists, all going all the way back to the 1700s, 
of Frederick Norton was a was a was a researcher. Very few people ever mentioned Frederick Norton. Frederick Norton surveyed the Giza complex. He surveyed, he studied, he drew pictures of the pyramids, the Sphinx. He did this in the 1700s. One thing he noticed was there was writings on the on the on the masonry, and uh, uh, there were seashells everywhere. Right. You could stick your hand anywhere in. Well, the Egyptian Antiquities Authority has had over 150 years to remove those shells. Yeah. They've yeah. had whole crews doing that. Yeah, they had, they 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 basically combed that whole area of the desert. So, uh, to go back to the original point, nothing that I researched comported with what I was told. Right. So, I began to take, I began a, an archive system. I began archiving chronologically everything that I was finding. I was still believing in the Bible. Right. But, but that's how, that's how dangerous our programming is. Sure. When you think a five-year-old kid and adopt him, that's what happened to me. I was adopted straight off the street. You adopt a five-year-old kid with a malleable mind right. straight into one of the, the most puritanical Southern Baptist families in Texas. That's what happened. That's what happened to me. Uh, I, I, you, you, were, you were baptized into the God spell, Jason. I was. I was. Hey, I read that book, Breaking the God Spell by Neil Freer. Absolutely. I have it over on my bookshelf. So have I. Yeah, Neil Freer, he's a phenomenon. I should do a video on him. He's, he's, a, he's a beast. But... Uh, he, for those of you who don't know, Neil Freer is a contemporary philosopher, and he breaks down the philosophical terms and shows you modern concepts that are conveyed in the Bible and how it's all for to control the mind. He show he show he shows you every all the masses. So anyway, oh, uh, I lost my train of thought. That's okay. Oh, Neil so Freer, I was here, I God's five, so here I am, five years old. I'm adopted straight off the street. I came out of a pretty bad situation, and uh. I'm adopted by by pure basically a Puritan mother, right? And she's in the church ministry, and she wants and she really wants to impress the pastor every Sunday. She's involved in everything. I'm in the youth group. I'm in the choir. I'm every Wednesday. Every Wednesday, I got to help with the with, with the church the church dinner. I have absolutely no social life. I have nothing going for me at school, at like kindergarten, nothing. My entire life until I was 15 years old for 10 years was Southern Baptist Christianity right. Church. That's what it was. Right. When I was 15 years old, I had had enough. I snapped. I packed everything I could fit into a backpack, and I hitchhiked across the United States doing odd jobs for two years. Ran into the wrong people, started hanging out with them. By 17 years old, I was in prison. So that's that's how I got to where I was it, to, to do this research. But I did not break free of my programming until I was 40 years old when I had amassed so much data that I could no longer be honest with myself when I woke up in the morning and I looked at my, my cup of coffee and my Bible because it had been ingrained in me since I was a child that no matter how much I rebelled against my mother, every morning in prison, I always spent 15 to 20 minutes in my Bible drinking my coffee before I started my prison day. I didn't stop doing that until I was 40. But uh that's how powerful that programming is. But um well, well so let me let me let me add to that. So you and I have very similar origin stories. Of course we we we've met, you know, via the internet 3 weeks ago. Uh I was 42 and I had to hit rock bottom. Now I ran out by the way, I'm not Southern Baptist but Roman Catholic, so same shit, different, you know, different yeah. Abrahamic scam. Uh, you know, I ran out of the back of church when I was like six years old and my dad chased me out. And he's like, where are you going? And it's like, I'm not going to be in that cult. Right. So like I knew at a very early age that, you know, just as you figured out at 15, that we were being inculcated with bullshit. So, you know, I want to get back to your story here in a second. But um, uh, Jason, I really believe this. And this is why the Egyptian mystery schools, you know, whatever we can decode from them, did not allow initiates to even attempt to enter until they were 40. Mm -hmm. That's the truth. You do not have, and again, this is not a full offense to younger people watching because we love you guys. And we're grateful that you're watching because you're going to learn. But you don't have enough real world simulacrum experience until you've gone through three <laughs> decades of life. It's just the way it is. Yeah, it's true. I, I have met some very interesting, uh, uh, basically, girls and guys in their 30s 
and and late twenties that I really impressed me with their maturity and their willing the willingness yeah. to learn. But you're but you're absolutely right. And there has been times, Jay, where I actually really wanted to disable comments. I wish there was a filter on YouTube that would allow me to disable comments, not not by age. But sure. I have a lot of people that watch four or five of my live videos and think that they can uh, they can ab abbreviate and collate the data in those videos <laughs> and actually understand my theories and all the information that I put out. But no. before, before I ever did podcasts or live videos, I had already released over 200 uploads just to right. get the information out there first. Right. So right. I, I mean, I, w I wouldn't do it even if YouTube had a setting that allowed me to do it. But I had I had, I have been frustrated to the point where I, I almost would have done it. It's a uh, just disabled sure. comment. For you. There, there's no way if you can't verify that you've watched at least thirty videos, you shouldn't even be commenting because I agree. Ninety percent of the comments are already answered multiple times in earlier vids. And what frustrates me more than anything, now I have some hardcore listeners. But what frustrates me is you and I know because we're content creators. YouTube allows us to go look in our analytics. We can see. If people are going back to watch those those uploads. So when I have 12,000 people in the last week watching a live video from four days ago, right. okay, that's fine. But that tells me there's 8,000 of you that didn't go back and watch right. the data that that video came from, from a video that was released a year earlier, because that video still has 2,000 views. Right. So I know you didn't go back and look at that and watch right. that. And that's cool. That's your prerogative. People want, people want to be in the fast lane. They want the information fast. But... Then they want to ask me questions for which the data has already been provided and answered a hundred times in, right. in ten different comment sections. Right. So that right. does get old. It really does. Well, I'm glad you said that. And, and let me just say for everybody out there, because we have a lot of people, you know, I imagine we're going to have probably a couple hundred people watching live at various points through this, even with the suppression, even with the black bowling and the shadow banning that Jason and I experience. You guys are out there. So, again, grateful for all of you. Love and light. Uh there is going to be a time in this podcast when he gets through a little bit more of his cosmology where I am going to ask questions to him that are simple questions for a lot of you guys that he has answered many times before. But as I told him off air, I wanted him to be able to use this and not just him, but, you know, all of us watching, you know, as a real good basis of like, hey, man, like if you're new to Jason, you got to watch the Phoenix for dummies. You got to watch, you know. All is told, you know, I've, I have all of your videos in linked in the uh, in the comments below now. But then I want this one to be a basis, too, because, again, as you know, I've watched a lot of your videos lately. And a lot of the people that are researching you are doing as good a job as possible, but they're not very organized. And it's all over the place. And it's not fair to you because your brain is so prodigious. and You have so much information. So I'm saying this when we get towards the questions. These are going to be organized, folks, from literally Jason's tip of spear knowledge going back 7,000, 6,000, whatever it is, years to up until the present day. So if you're asking questions right now, they're not going to get answered. Leave time. This is a three-hour live stream, okay, and maybe longer. Jason and I could spit this stuff out all night, all day. But it is very important that Jason, you know, moving forward, and I'm a dude, I, I deal with the same stuff in my life, like, you should not be asking questions that have been answered a hundred times before. And Jason, the truth is, and you know this, is that technology has dumbed down people to the point where they're so lazy. They want you as the guru, me as the guru, whoever the guru is to give them the answer. They don't want to research. They don't want to read. They don't want to watch five more seconds, 10 more seconds. They want you to give them the answer. That's where we have gotten to. And you're right. People have a prerogative to do whatever they want. And God bless you. You have free will. Some of you do. But at the end of the day, Jason and I also have a right to say, it's not going to happen. I've already answered that next question. And so think about that before you ask your question, as Jason said, watch his videos. And by the way, I put the link into my comments too. Jason's, uh, you know, uh, glossary on his website has so much information. If you just spent 90 minutes going through his glossary, you're going to have a lot of your questions answered. So anyway, I'm going to stop pontificating. This is your show. But please, as he said, guys, do your homework. Watch the videos. Go to his channel. You might have to, you know, do a, a two-week binge because there's that much amazing content. And as he said in a lot of his shows and continues to say, he's got so much more that he can do. And, you know, I he's, he knows this. And, you know, I, I don't want to, like, humble him, but, like, 
I have a group of people right now that are like, Jason's going into full-time work. He's not going to be doing his job anymore because we need him doing this stuff. So I'll be talking about that more in the future, but he, his mind, I mean, Jason, what can you do? Another 10 years worth of videos if you did them every day? <laughs> I have enough data in my studio to just do this forever, really. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. If you were doing 12 hours a day of videos for 10 years, you probably can still come up with origin of creative content. Okay. So let's get back to you. Okay. So now you're basically in prison. You're reading voraciously. How did you source the material? Okay. Well, um, first of all, for those who don't know, prisons have a lot of old books floating around them. Right. And in right. Texas, prison administrators don't like to throw away state resources. So when older prisons were were basically condemned, they didn't they didn't destroy the books. They had prisoners go in, box them all up, and send them to another unit. And then they would they wouldn't get used because when the new unit opened, the community around that prison donated all new books. So with all the new books on the shelves, the old books get forgotten in boxes. So I will I will I, I did inventory in prison. A lot. I was an SSI. That was the job description I had. It was called, it was called state support inmate. And I, I was all that. They pretty much find out what your skills are. Prison administrators will find out what your skill sets are, and then they will capitalize on them. So for me, it was really early on they figured out that I was able to collate a tremendous amount of random data and put it all into a really good perspective. So I did inventory. I inventoried everything in maintenance, everything in supply, everything in warehousing, manufacturing, logistics. And then they found out my oh, uh, I could inventory all, all their old paperwork, books, and filing systems. So that's what I did. And I had access to so many old books that had been bo boxed up in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, just fall books falling apart. And uh, when I, I developed this love for about six years, and I was I was going from prison to prison doing this, and uh, the prisons I had no access to because I was a maximum security inmate. Maximum security can't go on medium or minimum security. So in the so I had those in the uh uh. There is a mail system that's that's intra system. It doesn't have anything to do with the U.S. Postal Service because there's so much material going from unit to unit between administrators that they have their own shuttle system when they're transferring inmates from different prisons. Uh, materials also follow. So I started collecting all the books. I started writing libraries and librarians and other units and telling them what I was doing. Um, uh, I need these books over here, sent over here. In exchange, I would send them a bunch of books, books I've either read or whatever. Uh, uh, one from one book exchanges. Well, after six years of doing this, I got in contact with Paul Tice of Book Tree. He was Zechariah Sitchin's personal videographer. Well, when he and Zechariah Sitchin finished traveling the world and were no longer documenting all these things, and Zechariah Sitchin started publishing all his books, Paul Tice went into publishing. Right. Paul Tice. Paul Tice started Book Tree Press in San Diego, and he's published many books. One by Zechariah Sitchin. You know Jordan Maxwell. Yeah. Uh, Jack Berenger, Neil Freer, the guy we just mentioned about breaking yep. the gospel. Yep. Well, Paul Tice reprints books that are 500, 400, 300, 200 years old. Books that are published before World War II is his specialty. His catalog is fantastic. So I, I got a copy of that catalog, and I spent hundreds of dollars ordering those books. And then one day I sent him a manuscript. That manuscript became my first published book called The Lost Scriptures of Giza. It's yep. all the occult and esoteric material that I had discovered about the Great Pyramid of Egypt that I haven't found in any modern books in the last 100 years. And you so, never will either. So I put this book out, and that instantly led to five more book contracts. And he published all those books as well. But he became my benefactor while I was in prison. And I was the only I was the only convicted felon in America or in the world that he's ever taken a risk with and published. And uh, and he doesn't really publish modern authors. Jo Ma uh, Jordan Maxwell was an exception. I was an exception. Zechariah Sitchin was an exception. Neil Freer and Jack Berenger and Hugh Montgomery. I don't know if you know Hugh Montgomery, but all Hugh Montgomery writes about is uh, old England, Albion, uh, all wow. all kinds of esoteric material about the the different knights orders that came up uh, in, in England, Cornwall, Wales. His books are fascinating, but they're not very popular. Very few people know about them. But his name is Hugh Montgomery. He, he's written three books that are fantastic. So other than that, Paul Tice only publishes reprints, old reprints. So this is why my, my bibliographies that I've published on my YouTube channel and Archaic's Facebook group, 
my bibliographies are absolutely packed with books a lot of people have never heard of. Just, those books are not floating around anymore. Right. So, uh, so in the core, in the course of data mining all this material, my method, my method, the only method you can really employ is not subject matter because right. you're dealing with too much. If, if you're trying to find out everything in the universe, there's no filing system for that. So the only thing that I could really resort to was chronology. Right. Everything can be dated and everything can be guesstimated. So my files were in chronological order and I started filling them up, filling them up. And that's how I began seeing all the patterns. This is what led to discovery after discovery after discovery after discovery. And this is what led basically to the revelation that I am not discovering anything novel. I am bringing back to the table things that that ancient men already knew because the version of history that you and I have been told is bullshit and that we were technologically advanced first and we have devolved through a series of very cleverly concealed resets and cataclysms. So, so let me, let me share something with the audience and for you. And this is why I know 100%. This is not a belief. This is a knowing that Jason is right. I have traveled the world extensively. I've been to the Sacred Valley of Peru. I have been to all of the monolithic, you know, geodidetic, massive stone monuments, uh, you know, in Machu Picchu, throughout the Sacred Valley. I've been everywhere, Saxe Human. I've been all of them. I also, Jason, this is new for you guys because I haven't talked about this other than my inner circle. I went to Morelia, Mexico, which is a nowhereville, tiny town west of Mexico City that has the most profound architecture that I have ever seen in my life. More profound than what I found in Machu Picchu and what I found in Soxa Human. In fact, Jason, I have videos. I'll send this to you so you can look at this. You could even talk about this. But I was there literally just a month ago with my wife. We went down there because someone in her family was getting married in that place of all locations. And they have all of these uh, stone, pink stone, that's what they tell you, at least, um, you know, again, uh, cathedrals. And Jason, the architecture of these things that they tell you is from the 15th century, uh, you know, Baroque Spanish architecture is not replicatable right now. I believe that. I, I mean, you're standing in front of these. And again, this is a very small, depressed financially town in, you know, Western Central Mexico. Uh, the, the indigenous of the area or were literally a quote unquote indigenous group that they said came from South America. I mean, again, not if it makes sense, but when you're standing in front of these things, looking at this and realizing, and again, you're a stonemason. So, you know, you're qualified to talk about this. There aren't even tools on the planet right now that can build in the capacity that these people build. And then they tell you it's from the 15th century. And then you think, wait a minute. The United States was the 16th and 17th century, you know, when it was quote unquote slave colony. So putting all that together, whether I do my research and I read all these books like you, and I'm not nearly as prolific as you, but like, it's obvious when you're standing there and it, you know, if it quacks and looks like a duck, it's a duck. And so like, when you see this, you know, you're being lied to. So I want to, you know, get back to you. But like, again, when you see these things, you realize they don't add up. And by the way, the other thing I said, I didn't say, I mean, dude, the people, the indigenous, you know, whether they're Indians or South Americans or whatever, uh, they're five, 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 six. Mm-hmm. And the doorways, Jason, are 22 feet. Now, remember, they're measured in cubits, but they're 22 right. feet high. And I'm looking right. at this and I'm like, this is insanity. Why are they built this size? And then, you know, you hear the idiots and they say, oh, well, the Baroque architecture of Spain in the 15th and 14th century was to oversize everything. Everything is a lie, but you have to stand there to see it. So anyway, I'll get back to you, but I really wanted to quantify what I have experienced personal in my reality right. to know that you're right. Yeah, well, the, uh, you're right. There's a lot of deception, but let me tell you what is true. What we do have preserved in in the historical record, we have over 45 references in historical text to Roman Catholic Jesuit Jesuit agents absolutely rounding up with military force 
every American codex, every yeah. story, all everything written down. If they saw any effigies on temple walls, they 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 broke them out with hammers. Yep. Whatever they found when they first came over here, the yep. Castilian Spanish conquistadors, whatever they found when they first came over here isn't what they told us. They went through a right. major campaign of destroying right. all the knowledge throughout North right. and Central and South America. Now, and the they conquistadors were sent to destroy in the name of the Catholic Church. Yeah, you know they that? destroyed the entire history. So, a hundred years later, they could feed us a version of events that was not right. true. So, what they found in, like, what they found with uh, Atahualpa in South America, uh, what they found in Cus Cusco, the Inca were far more sophisticated. Oh, yeah. They didn't even treasure gold, but they made everything out of gold. They insulated right. their temples and government buildings right. with gold sheeted walls. Right. Uh, they used mica on the floor for the electrostatic uh, uh, properties. People could walk barefoot on the floor of temples and sing in the gold walls and the mica under their feet that would begin to, and they would begin to resonate and everybody together using their voices could absolutely cause levitation and altered states of consciousness. They, they had all right. kinds of really interesting. Uh, same thing you find in the Hypogeum in Malta at uh, Hagar Kim. All these resonance chambers, like Phoenix Hill in China, these these underground chambers that are specifically built for their acoustic properties and what people could do when they were singing together in those in those uh, uh rooms in those chambers and temples, it, it was phenomenal. But all of this was they attempted to erase. But as far as the technolithic architecture, we cannot replicate Angkor Wat today. Nope. All the temples that we find through Can Cambodia, oh, they don't get enough attention. Oh, if somebody, if we had true scientists that were going to to uh, some of those some of those temples around Angkor Wat, just looking at how the statuary blends in with the aesthetics of the temple walls and the pillars, we can't replicate that today unless we're cheating with concrete molds and and, and, and using plaster casts and all that. But that's not what these how these buildings. This is living rock. They carved that living rock that's and smoothed true. it out, and we don't know how. But chisels, if you were to use it the, the same the same way that they say Egyptologists built the pyramid, you would see the stress fractures. Right. You would see all the evidence of tooling marks and all that, but you don't. Right. We're we're looking at architecture in many ancient sites that was machined with exactly. precision. It oh. wasn't a man using a hand tool. No. It was something else. It was something else. And they were making them fast. I almost want to say three D I almost want to say three D printing. Because right. it's very, very, it's very interesting. It would be a, a species of 3D printing using lithography that we just, we're not familiar with today. And if yeah. we are, then it's a technology that exists in the underworld and, and has never been released to the surface. Because I, Jay, I don't know where you're at with this, but I personally believe, and I believe I've uncovered a lot of evidence for this, that there is a technologically advanced civilization that is centuries old, that is beneath our feet, and... They release, they release technological advancements under the guise of alien assist. Right. Like 1947 Roswell, those artifacts did not come from space and UFOs. They came from the civilization beneath us. They yes. just wanted, they just wanted us to believe it came from the sky. So yep. I, I'm a. Yeah, the, the civilization below us has, has been there from, for ancient times. Well, there, there's many names for them, right? They call them the inner Earth occupants, the Agarthans. You know the you know yeah. what, what is the name of the um the, not the Hindu. yeah the vril the, uh they also call them in uh in india they they called them the nagas i mean there are so many different inner earth cultures and populations that you know come from various uh you know mythologies or mythos is depending on the culture in the area of the planet so there's no question that they are there you know obviously i live in southern california if you go up north to Mount Shasta, you can find indigenous people that will tell you about portals, you know, that go into Telos and all these other places that are up there. And again, I know you've read about all these things because like you said, you know, it can't be covered up even though they, 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 they do their best to suppress it. Okay, so let's get into the, if you want to go a little bit further from where you were in prison to get into this stuff, but let's talk a little bit about uh, the resets and you don't even really have to talk about them because I have questions to define these when I'm coming So I actually just take what I just said. Just keep going until you want to like answer the question okay, well, okay, well, let's let's uh Let's talk about the very last one that happened. Sure We we have basically 
been experiencing a unbroken continuum of history with basically no time dilation anomalies since the year 1902. Well, we can't claim that for 1901. Something very unusual happened in 1902. Right. But whatever happened in 1902, I have four videos on 1902. My fifth one is being worked on right now. But something unusual happened in 1902 that was expected. Now, I have a good buddy of mine who watches all my videos and he goes to Googling things. And, well, he just sent me some profound information about 1902 that really shocked me. And uh, first of all, to give it to give it some context, I don't know if you're familiar with my 1902 videos, Jay. But I, I, am, I, have, I am. I am. I am. Absolutely. I have itemized on my own from my own research many many organizations institutes and yep. companies that all began in 1902 and 1903 right. just suddenly appeared and they're not just ordinary. Well, they're not ordinary all of them exist today they're not ordinary at all they all exist today and they're right. umbrella corporations that own many other companies that exist today that's right this is beyond coincidence yes. mathematically improbable for this to have happened all, all in a 12 month period between two years part of 1902 and part of 1903 so so other people have taken up them taken up the uh the uh, research and have been sending me emails about everything they have found out stuff i never even, even i never found but they did more companies more organizations all kinds of, now what's really interesting is we can't find any data about what any of the elite were doing at that time so far one person found one reference his name is Matthew. He's a good buddy of mine. Matthew found a reference about the Rockefellers. Yep. In 1901, they disappeared. In 1903, they reappeared on the world scene and unleashed wow. all their all their company. This tells me, this tells me, 1902, just like 1764, was expected. They expected the Phoenix reset, but it wasn't the big one. So as soon as they realized they had another 138 years, as soon as the phenomenon didn't appear to the magnitude that they were expecting, they were they, they hit the, with the boots on the ground. They unleashed all their wealth back into the into the population. They had taken all their wealth out of the population. All the elite did in 1890. This is why we had the orphan train. This right. is why. We had the plague, diseases, starvation. We had the collapse of all kinds of control systems all throughout the 1880s and uh, 1890s, 1901. Was a very strange period of time. Things were in chaos. This is when the Bolshevik took power because of the power structure. There was, there was a power vacuum. So the Bolshevik, who had been trying to take power over Western powers for a long time, finally made their move and they made headway in Russia in 1902, right. which which ended up erupting into the whole collapse of the, the Romanovs. But all this make, begins to make sense when Matthew sent me that email showing me a document that was signed in 1902 about the orphan trains, about the kids, and another document that was signed from a Mason a, a, a Mason document and about and about Rockefeller having disappeared in 1901 and, and reappearing on the world scene in 1903. Putting all this and putting all this together, we see what happened. The elite vanished. They hid. They thought this Phoenix episode was going to be a big one, and it wasn't. I documented everything the Phoenix did in 1902. It wasn't a big deal, but it was there. It was it, now they probably got scared, Jay, because in 1764 they would have been aware right. that the Astrophys Astrophysical Journal had documented that astronomer Hoffman had saw it in in the month of May on May 15th in 1764, and half a million Europeans saw it with the naked eye, dark in the sun. But it, that wasn't the big one either. And as soon as 1764 happened, what happened? The elite again flooded flooded money into Europe and right. started started the revolutionary war all the masons unleashed all their all their uh, uh influence and money and rebelled against the crown started the united states of america right i mean 1764 boston tea party and it just started going from there so 1764 it wasn't the big one so the elite knew they had 138 years they thought 1902 was going to be the big one so they hid 1902 1902 came and went it wasn't the big one so it tells me this, this this data set tells me that the elite somewhere lost their calendar. They right. knew the they knew the exact one hundred and thirty eight year period. 
but they lost track of which one they were in. Now they're all they're all the same family. They're spread all over the world. They've been right. doing this for a long time, and they right. always hide underground. Right. <laughs> but they do know. They do know. Check this out. They do know that this next one, they're not going to make that mistake. This is the big one. Right. This is the one they've been preparing for. So. Um, okay, so let me ask you a question in that regard. Um, you already answered it. They go underground. Do you think that they have, you know, obviously, you know, we have the Hadron Collider that they built recently and they have those big ceremonies, you know, where they're building them underneath the mountains. But do you think they have, you know, insider, you know, secretive meetings where they announce like we're going in underground, we're going, you know, into inner earth or whatever? Or do you think they are actually using technology that literally is like portal beaming that they're, you know, literally just transmogrifying their physical existence and going through a portal in somewhere in earth. I mean, I know I'm, it's speculative, but what do you think? Well, I, I have never, I haven't seen any evidence whatsoever that the Hadron Collider is doing anything other than providing the media, something interesting to put out there, providing conspiracy theorists. It's a something cover story. Interesting yeah. to talk about to me, the Hadron Collider Network and NASA have one common denominator. They both pull in billions of dollars of sure. funding, but the money's not being spent for what the public is told. Sure. Now, sure. NASA, NASA is pure mind control. Oh, NASA's totally. not sending nobody to space. But, I mean, let okay. me tell you something. I get pissed off that my, my neighbors still believe that satellites are bouncing <laughs> uh, telephone deals. Every time I lose signal on my phone, I get pissed because I know it's relay towers. Because I live so far out in the sticks, if it wasn't for a tower being three miles from me, I wouldn't have cell service. There ain't nothing in the sky giving me any type of cell service. It's That's relay right. towers. That's it, right. it, it, it doesn't even matter. In real time, I mean, we already know that sound travels at 1,080 feet per second at sea level. So how in the hell is somebody going to talk to me on a phone in real right. time from Australia? Awesome. Why am I not waiting two and a half minutes? So I'm not, I mean, uh, yeah, it's... I just not. I'm not. I know. I'm not on board. But NASA hasn't done anything ever no. that they told us. No. They're not even sending rockets up now. So why are they still no. taking billions a year? No, no it's all billions. bullshit, dude. It's all bullshit. No. And by the way, that's one of the questions about the moon. We'll get to that in a second. Yeah, okay. So, that, we'll, we'll just keep going. Keep going. Keep going. So, so CERN, NASA, and many other things that we take for granted that we believe are a part of the scientific establishment are nothing but a very clever tax. Sorry. This is another way that the elite can fund more, more of their materials, just like the IRS. IRS right. isn't just a tax. Of course. Many, many of the anti-Western, anti, uh, anti-Democratic, anti-Republican, anti-American, anti, almost anti-world uh, uh, programs are funded by, by the very institutions that tax us. Right. We pay for the very things we disagree with. Right. Yeah, they've got the whole, the whole, the whole world is is basically subject to the same group of people they've been doing this for a very long time but it's on um, lock yeah it's on lock and we're and you know we're going to get to the archons you know the the dark archons the negative aix and, and you know th we're going to get to the hierarchies of benevolence versus malevolent but okay so you 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 you've gotten through prison. You've read all of these books. Like you started publishing all of this stuff online back to what two thousand seven, two thousand eight. Oh, uh, my the very my my very first experience with uh, the internet was through a friend who released my my charts. I have charts, visual yep. charts. I did a very extensive chart after about a nine ten years of research, showing that listen. If all this geodetic and all this mathematical information is correct, and all these, and I have all my data sets lined up, there's no other conclusion that about 60 different trains of data points, with each one forming a data set, leads to leads to 2046, the month of November, major pole shift. Now, when I say pole shift, I am talking about what the simulacrum does to mimic a pole shift. Lithospheric displacement is not the actual movement of the crust. It's the shifting of the stellar sphere that makes us believe our world has moved. I, I'm a totally different opinion. I believe that we live in a very simulated context. I no longer believe that we live in a heliocentric solar system anymore. So, so, so I know you don't watch movies, neither do I really. I mean, I did a long time ago, but I'm like you. I either read or I meditate, you know, a lot of inner work. But this really, the Truman Show with Jim Carrey is 
real life, right? Like they're basically showing us that everything is a sim. Well, I haven't seen the movie, but you're like the tenth person to mention yeah. that movie in my podcast. I have, I've never. I, I guess one of these days I'm gonna have to watch it. Just so yeah, I can you comment. should watch it because it's basically Jim Carrey, and you know they show the stars. As you said, it's a sim. It's a sim. You know, you have a yeah. part. We can talk about it, but all of it is fake. Right. Well, concerning the stars, I can tell you something very, very interesting here. Okay. In the 1890, in the 1890s, scientists took pictures in three different locations to triangulate. Three different locations in the world. They took pictures of a certain area of space. I don't remember which it was. They just took pictures. These were widely published. Charles Fort talks about these experiments. By, by, by the way, just so you know, Charles Fort is my idol. I, I read Village movie. of the Damned when I was 11 years old, and I was like, yep. what? I love that man. <laughs> I love that man. So they waited six months. They waited six months because if the world is going around the sun, then six months into the future, the world would be 186 million miles away from the first place they took those photographs. So they, they triangulated and took those photographs again at the same star of the heavens, and what they should have found is what's called parallax. There should have been slight shifts in the luminaries, but there wasn't, and that's impossible. But it's not impossible except for the current model that's been foisted upon us about about space being all being actually real. Now, if this is a holographic template of luminaries that are stuck in superposition with each other, there's nothing mysterious about it. Right. But if it's a real universe that we're looking at, we should have saw parallax. In addition to that, I have made the actual the actual i have published the actual findings that there is a certain order of stars that astronomers have always been mystified by they don't behave like the other luminaries they have named these variable stars they call them variable stars almost all variable stars are red and uh, deep red but what's really interesting about them is they they change their magnitudes and it's not predictable it's not it, it, it does, it's not understandable how they can go so bright and go back and dim. It's almost as if the cosmos, what we perceive of the cosmos, is communicating with itself. Right Now, the, very, the most interesting thing that I have found is when things are going very bad on Earth, those variable stars are blinking chaotically. The ancients see them. To me... I don't see it the way the ancients do. I don't see the stars attacking me like they did. I don't see the stars being uh, 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 imminent, just basically all the different eyes. Uh, like Hipparchus says, 10,080 eyes that attack, attack mankind, the fixed stars in heaven. I don't see that. I see, I see hundreds of thousands of little holographic projectors that are, right. that are basically creating phenomena in our skies for us to believe is real. Like, right. this, like, like, like the phoenix, a fiery red dragon appears in the sky, causes volcanoes, earthquakes, it brings with it vapor canopy phenomena, and it dumps a tremendous amount of red rain, red dust, and red mud on our world, buries whole cities. So uh, the phoenix phenomenon is when all these variable stars start going off chaotically, right. like they did in 1902, and uh, many other times the phoenix appeared. So that, I, just wanted to, I just wanted to let you know, that's another reason why I don't believe that the that the sky is real. I believe that we're looking into an artificial construct from within. And right. it is deceitful. It is designed for us to make the assumption that we're living in a heliocentric uh, model. And I get I get a lot of flat earthers that get irritated with me because they say, "Oh man, you're you're a, uh, you're a globe, you're a globe tard or you're a <laughs> Yeah, listen to me. They call me a globe tard. They call me uh they say, "Oh, you believe in a heliocentric model, man? You're he says you're not even in the conversation." So listen to this. I tell them, yeah. listen, I'm a simulationist. And, and, the, and, and in a way, they're right. They say, oh, you just say that because uh, it protects you from being in the controversy. But they don't understand. I've already moved away from flat earth. I'm sure. done with it. I'm done with it. If everything is, a, is simulated, now we, now we need to understand certain things that cannot be denied. Right. One, of them, one of them is the phases of the moon. Right. The phases of the moon are specifically there to make you believe that moon is spherical and right. therefore the sun is spherical right. and therefore the shadow on the moon would necessarily infer to any intelligent observer that everything else in space would be spherical. Therefore, right. there are planets to, right. to, to, be, to, be, to be looked at. So when we have 
the sky projecting phenomena that induces us to make certain certain deductions, then that means the sky is emanating deceit. Right. This opens up another, another can of worms. Okay, what would want to deceive us into believing that all this is travelable, that we can actually come up here, that we can go to other worlds and stuff? Why would that deception be necessary? Right. So this is what I've done. I've gone through all these deductive reasonings and chased this data to, to, to its final conclusions that, that we're in a simulation. And the only thing that I can conclude, Jay, is that we are in a simulation that is almost an exact copy of a real system. Right. And that something is being studied and that we volunteered for this. Yes. Because, and I'm at, because I don't feel danger. I don't feel... No. I don't feel any bad vibrations about the future like I yeah. used to. My my Christian puritanical upbringing had me fearing hell, had me fearing making mistakes. But making mistakes is the greatest thing to learning new material. That's because right. once you have isolated everything that is wrong, right. there's nothing left to look at but what is right. That's exactly right. And let me let me quantify that even deeper. You have to get to a level of awareness. And again, some of, some of you guys are younger and maybe you're there now. I spoke to some you know, true ascended masters, as I would call them this morning, and they're in their early 20s. They don't have the experience, but they do have many probably lifetimes. I want to get to your take on reincarnation and, and, and living life cycles and, and all that. But I agree with you. We have volunteered. You know, the new age people would say you incarnated into here because you had free will choice for of evolution and growth of your soul. You know, we could call it our chi, our orgon energy, our auric field, whatever you want to call it. But that is who we really are, Jason. As you know, we are not these avatar physical body beings. We are spiritual energy of, of, of standing waves or oscillating waves and vibrating atoms and molecules, which, as you know, you know, are very viscous and, you know, congealed at this low vibrational frequency. So the truth is, is that we're not these bodies and people have to get to a place of awareness where you're not you're that body. You're not Jason Brashears. I'm not Jay Campbell. I'm not this personality or this ego or this mind. I am a spiritual being having a physical avatar body experience in this third dimension of time space, which, you know, that's a whole nother construct because we're not even in a time. There is no time outside of this dimensional reality. They've got us believing in this dualistic, polarized you know opposite left right dark night you know good and bad it's all bullshit to get us as you say to opt into the aix and we haven't talked about aix and we'll define it but aix wants you to build a simulation of reality that they influence and they create through the narrative of the media and all of those other things and once you wake wake up to that reality that you're not what it wants you to believe you are which is again a physical body then you are in control of your personal reality, which you talk about and you can talk about in a second, which you can create through your words, thoughts and actions. And we're going to talk about consciousness towards the end when, when I ask the questions. But like it, it really is true. I'm with you. I am totally positive. You, all these guys that are watching right now that are my friends and fans and audience will say, you know, Jay is the raise your vibration guy. You know, we're building the new earth. We're creating a golden age. And yes, there's a lot of dark shit happening right now with the B and all that stuff. But a lot of us, especially you and I and all you guys watching, we are co-creating consciously a new experience. And so, you know, Jason can quantify that by saying that the nemesis event is literally going to get rid of the dark side. And we are going to have a golden age or again, a new age or a new earth or whatever, but it has to happen, Jason. I mean, again, I just came back from Mexico, not Morelia, the Yucatan, and the water is so polluted now, okay? In the most pristine beaches and pristine ocean in the world, there's nothing but seaweed growing along these amazing shores in the Yucatan oh. Peninsula now because we have destroyed this planet, you know, through AIX and all the dark shit. They don't care. They're not procreation like we are. But there has to be a shift. There has to be a change. There has to be a reset. There has to be earth gaia mother earth whatever you want to call it it has to be reborn it has to i agree i agree i agree man. it's uh i, I do want to address something because I, I i'm looking at your chat as you were talking and yep. i saw somebody ask if astrology is real and i have i have to listen i i had somebody do an astrology chart on me and i was born june 9th 1973 about 1201 p.m my birth 
my birth was induced because my mom was 16 years old and she was very, very petite. I am not petite. So she she is a she was terrified. And there was a there was a doctor in Houston at the time who was doing these experimental births in a bathtub and wow. uh, it had something to do with buoyancy and sure. doing away with doing away the plant. He sedated her and then had her basically in a warm bathtub and she doesn't remember giving birth to me at all. She just woke up and I was already born. Yeah, I was born lady. I was I was born under water. So I had I had a, a a lady do an astrology deal on me and it was really compelling. So I ordered this book and in the archaic space book page I put it I put the the entire manuscript of the book is in the file section. It's a PDF. It's only about a hundred page book, but it was written a very long time ago. And uh, it's called uh, Astrology of Your Life or something. But when I read Gemini and I read June 9th, I was so shocked that it instantly, instantly all all my powers of deduction cords were struck. I refused to believe that I had read what I just read. So I opened it up to Libra. To, to, I opened it up to Taurus. I opened it up to Capricorn. I started reading all these different ones. Nothing in that book nailed me to a T. Nothing. Nothing. You share characteristics with all kinds of people. But June 9th, 1973, at around noon, what that book said nailed me to a T. Even my negative... Even my negative character traits were in that. I could not believe it. So I shared it. I shared it in the files in the Archaics Facebook group for everybody to check it out, check it out on their own. The reason I'm saying, telling you the story is because just because the stellar sphere isn't real luminaries does not detract at all from the fact that you're looking at information. You're looking at right. coding in the sky. Those star patterns have value because for thousands of years they have they have basically denoted certain character traits that people share when they're born at certain times wherever those coded star patterns are. Right. So, right. Astrology doesn't lose any significance in simulation theory when you take consideration that a simulation is nothing but basically coding and photons, then astrology actually takes on a much deeper meaning. It's a it, you're looking at the software of the system itself by which right. we're living through. We're living through that when I was born, there was a holographic template of how Jason Brashears was basically going to be. So certain reality tunnels were were, were, were created for me. And I, pro I went through some dark ones. I probably could have yeah. went through some better ones. But if I went through the better ones, I wouldn't be who I am today. That's right. And, That's right. And, and, and back to that, let's, let's, let's go deeper. We are, you know, again, quantum entanglement, you know, yeah, part of physics. We now know that we are biophotonic plasma electric discharges. That's literally what we are. When you think of oscillating waves and vibrating molecules or atoms, that's what we are. We are literally plasmatic fire. You know, think of like an orange orb being. And so you're right. I mean, I mean, this is this is really what we are. I want to go back to what said something about. Um, and now I lost my train of thought. But the Essenes, oh, astrology. I know you've read books on the Essenes. You know, that was an incredible group of, of, of beings. The Essenes literally would not let people marry who were not astrologically co, uh, coordinated. They, if, if you, you, you know that, right? So you could not marry a, uh, you know, somebody like a Sagittarius with a Pisces or, you know, an Aquarius with another one. And so it's like, when you start seeing this and you know that these beings were probably working with the benefactor, you know, they actually, they have a name, they call them the Kalu, and they're like the the benevolent watchers. Then you realize that all of this shit is right, Jason, whether we're in a simulated reality or not, there is reality in the star patterns and the star coding. And again, how many people in the indigenous community will tell you that you are a star being? Mm -hmm. That you're made up of energy from the cosmos. That was a fundamental tenet of the Orphic ancient Greek Achaean right. faith was that human souls came from the stars. That's right. That was a the Orphic. If, for those who don't know, a lot of Christian beliefs came from the Gnosis, but the Gnosis developed straight out of the Orphic faith. And uh, right. the, the ancient Greeks were far more Christian than you'll ever realize. Right. They were. Right. And, and by the way, just so you know. Uh, the Essene, the Gnostics, you know, the the the, the Cathars, the, the the true Christianity is legit. But as you know, Jason, it was hijacked. 
by sure. you know Constantine and Justin and you know whoever else was behind it, the demonic dark archons, whatever. But at the end of the day, the way was the we, was true Christianity, and it was the right. way of Yeshua. And we're gonna, that's one of the questions we're going to talk about. You know, Jesus Christ, the mythological inversion of the Roman Catholics, and Yeshua, the avatar being that the benevolent that came into this you know holographic reality that you call. But anyway, there's no question that there are tenets in every ancient text or precepts that are legit. And it takes, as I like to say, and again, this is my opinion, but it takes a pure heart to truly discern what is real and what is not. And so many people do not have a pure heart because they are being led by AIX in everything. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It's a, the, the, that's a real deep rabbit hole about the, <laughs> or, the origin of Christianity. It's it's hard. I've had to put out an entire playlist called Dark Scriptures, and I had to lay it on thick and strong and actual cite all the biblical passages in those videos because people aren't readily going to believe no. what the Bible is actually conveying right. but they see it. So, if, uh, by the, by the way, let me ask you a question in that regard. You know, and sure. I've heard other scholars talk about this, but do you? Do you also agree that the Bible is absolutely pure allegory and that the real benevolence that were involved in the Bible had to keep it that way so that the quote unquote herd could understand it in a way that they would not get confused? Uh, um, here's how my, here's how I'm going to answer that. Yeah. You are a spiritual immortal being. And in That's essence, right. there's nothing physical in this world that can save you or, or actually have, any any substantial meaning to you it's a the physical world is actually a tool it can be manipulated it can be used it can be enjoyed now taking that into consideration we find all throughout the biblical narrative some very profound deeply spiritual food we find it all through the bible we find it all in the parables and we find it all in the right in the, in the things that jesus spoke and all that however every bit of this immortal food we can call it manna angels food right. is all wrapped up in this fictive physical history that never happened That's all right. the, all this material is put together in all these ingenious little stories now you have to understand it when i say it hasn't happened it never happened in the context that it's given to us right but we already know that the story of moses was real it just didn't happen in egypt and it was right. he, and he was an egyptian it was sargon of akkad who was right. put on who was put on a, a river in a in a basket and a in an enaitu priestess of sumer found him and raised him up and didn't even know that he was actually of the blood of kings and he was raised up and uh uh, as Sharokin, he became one of the m m mightiest kings of Akkad. Goes by many names in the ancient East. But we already know that David wasn't a real Jewish king. He comes from the Canaanite epos from Ugarit of Davidu the giant slayer. We know that Solomon came. Archaeology, bi uh, biblical archaeologists are the most unchristian people in the world. They don't believe. Yeah, bi biblical scholars are are basically they're not agnostics. I, I wouldn't call them agnostic, but I would say. I would say about 90% of all biblical scholars, academics who have studied the Bible, they don't believe in it at all. They have studied, yeah, they, they have put out, this, this is the type of material I've read because you've got to get to the core material. You have to see what's actually been found and, and compare it like the Psalms. Many of the Psalms, we are told they were written by the Jews. Listen, they weren't. Right. Word for word, we have found Canaanite texts. We have found Ebleetic texts. We have found Amorite texts from Mari. We have found entire funerary texts and ossuaries from ancient Egypt, all in the right. Psalm, copied word for word. So what I'm, what I'm saying is not true. I'm saying it's not true from the Jewish perspective that when they wrapped all these ancient texts together and they, and they created this Old Testament, that's where the deceit came in. The actual stories are real, but they belong to other older peoples. Right, right. Even the, even the Great Flood. The Great Flood is the Great Flood is a story that belongs to all humanity, but right. it's a story that was conveyed very differently according to what culture you lived in. I'll give you an example. There are no sub-Saharan African stories about the Great Flood, as if the event never happened there. Right. However. In the north, in the in the northern Europe and the Russian steppes, all the way to Mongolia, 
they all shared the same story and it was really interesting because this is from oriental all the way into occidental but they shared the story that the sky fell it was very wet but it brought it brought a, a, a like a miniature ice age a cold right because the time before that it was very hot ancient native americans said the same thing it says before the uh, before the uh uh, the birth of the sun, the world was a dark purple light. It was always wet and very, very warm. Right. And, and that, that's describing the vapor canopy. Now, was the vapor yeah. canopy, was the vapor canopy, and again, this is not speculation, guys. Uh, you know, the other guy, R.A. Boulet, who I know you're familiar with, also declined yes. uh, the vapor canopy in a lot of his books. But yeah. was the vapor canopy global? Was it like the entire planetary wide, or were there places that didn't have a vapor canopy? No, uh, a vapor canopy cannot exist unless it's covering the entire world. And it right. doesn't matter what your what your model of the world is. If you right. believe you're a flat earth under a dome, that's no different. It's no different than being on a globe uh, like Venus. Venus that's is right. a vapor canopy world. Venus has a vapor canopy today. So a vapor canopy world has a mesosphere that is so right. packed with water that it's right. literally an ocean above. And, right. and an ocean on the surface. Right. And in between, the atmospheric pressure is so much and the oxygen content is so dense that we have nitrogen and all kinds of nutrients that are saturating the soil, causing animals, fa fauna and flora, to grow to extraordinary sizes. Right. And right. sunlight, it, just the right amount of ambient light and ambient radiation actually improves growth conditions filters out all harmful UV rays. And when a world is going through this for 1,656 years, like Genesis describes, which is true history, the, the pre-flood world, then you have gigantic reptiles, gigantic amphibians, humans become gigantic. But the people that were living at that time didn't consider themselves gigantic. It was right. after the collapse of the vapor canopy that humans born after the vapor canopy regarded their own predecessors as titans. It was a, it was a totally, totally different biosphere. So, so let's separate that then. So in your research and my research, I think we agree you know, you had eight and a half to nine and a half. You know, again, they were measured in cubits if you were reading from the Middle East. But uh, eight and a half to nine and a half foot bodies or t excuse me, tall humanoid. Again, we know that the Smithsonian has gotten rid of all their skeletons. There were tons of them in the Western North American continent, you know, in Southern California. What was Southern California, Southern Colorado. And again, they've moved them. But the Titans themselves uh, and, you know, I want you to kind of. Uh, connect them to the pantheon of like the Greek and the Roman gods. Mm -hmm. These were truly, and by the way, Michael Tellinger, I know you're familiar with Michael Tellinger. I'm sure you've read his works to slave species, but yeah. he was about, and I know Michael, I've met him personally at a couple of conferences and we've talked and exchanged emails, but Michael was about to come out three years ago before, before the big C happened with a book, which he, he scuttled. That was going to prove that these titans did exist and that they were, it, it, by his estimation, they were anywhere from 150. I'm not making this up, by the way, guys, 150 to 300 feet tall. And he also, and I'm Jason, I'm sure you've read this. He also was about to put out the theory that the majority of the, uh, again, the stone mon monuments and, and again, these geodidactic, you know, megalithic, uh, uh, you know, buildings were created out of the mortal and pestle of the bone fragments of these leftover titans. Wow. Well, it would it would it would take a first of all for anybody to be that size. We already know it's common sense. A high school kid could answer that question and say, "We don't have enough oxygen in the air today for that." But a vapor canopy solves that problem. Right. A vapor canopy had animals growing to heroic sizes. So I'm on board with life forms being absolutely gigantic. It all depends on how long that vapor canopy endures. Right. For, for, because even today, reptiles and amphibians have a unique genetic trait that the rest of us don't share. Right. That, that trait is, is if you put them in a moist environment with continual warmth, with no predators, they will not stop growing. Right. They'll just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Keep feeding them. Keep the only thing that restricts their growth is their ability to inhale enough oxygen. Once they so, hit that plateau, they'll keep, stop growing. 
Okay, so along that veil, this is one of the bonus questions, but it has to be asked because it's perfect timing. Are the dinosaurs completely disinfo? Are they leading us down a path, or are they real? Okay, well, strictly, strictly as a chronologist, with about one hundred percent of my materials all from books, I have to, I have to basically filter that answer because my personal opinion is we had gigantic reptiles and gigantic uh, amphibians and. Uh, they grew, they grew to huge sizes, but we also had gigantic humans. We had right. gigantic rabbits. What yeah. I don't, what I don't like is the com, is the geologic compartmentalization by by Charles Lyell and right. scientists trying to promote a theory that there were millions of years ago, sixty five million years ago, when over and over and over the very index fossils by which they dated these prehistoric life forms are found by fishing boats off the coast of Japan, are right. found in Australia in a, in a lake. I says, these ending fossils are 65 million years old. So what are they doing alive swimming around? Why right. have you why have you not remodeled your theories to conform with the fact that amino acids have been found in a Tyrannosaurus Rex skull? Right. How is that possible? Why are there peat bogs in Florida where they're pulling up human remains with gigantic reptilian life forms? It doesn't make sense. I mean, it all makes sense to me. Under right. a vapor canopy, everything can live together. Under a vapor canopy... I mean, this is why we have so many marsupial life forms still existing today. They're from the vapor canopy world. Right. Mammals, mammals were gigantic too, but placentals still exist today. We are placentals. Right. And however, we are absolutely genetically modified because when a embryo attaches to the uterine wall in a female, that is a parasite trait. That is not natural in nature. Mammals are born in sacks, right. and the mothers have to tear them open with their teeth and clean them off. Humans are not this way. When an embryo attaches to the uterine wall, it's just like a parasite. It's almost as if humans were manufactured. We are not natural creations. Now, well, that's, the, that's the, obvious. So, so wait a minute. One other question then around this, and it, it just came to me, and I don't know, and you probably don't know. There's so much in our mythos of our history, even in science fiction and today and movies and videos and all that, you know, you think of Lord of the Rings, the dragon is so symbolic. Is the dragon, you got mud fossil. I know you guys are going to say mud fossils got all these skeletons all over the planet. He shows these dragons are five or 600 feet. Now, granted, is it possible that the dragon is what is real again, knowing that they could have existed under the vapor canopy and grown to that size as reptilian or whatever. And that dinosaurs is the disinfo similar to like with NASA and all the shit they're doing. Cause look, Crichton and Spielberg and Lucas and all these mofos went busy about 10 years ago with this Jurassic park bullshit. Yeah. And they started, you know, taking us down this path of like altering DNA. Again, all of these guys are, as you know, Jesuit, Freemason, masters, you know, dark magicians, whatever, you know, part of this elite group that goes underground into hiding. But do you think it was like a throwaway that they, they set us down a goose chase and that that's what dinos are? And the real truth is that they were dragons? I, I don't know. I mean, this is so far beyond my purview of research. Uh, sure. I, I don't know. I do know that there are accounts. For those who are interested, you can read the, the writings of David Hatcher Childress in the Lost Cities collection That's of right. books. And he has many references to actual documents from the 1800s where explorers came across gigantic winged creatures that could have right. easily picked up a man. They couldn't identify them. They couldn't identify their species or birth. And later on, other researchers reading these scientific reports swore up and down they were describing pterodons and pterodactyls. Right. But even later after that, scientists said, no, that's impossible because they died 65 million years right. ago. So once they set on the KT boundary date of 65 million years ago, it's over with. Everything is <laughs> Everything's tr untrue. Everything's false. It's all bullshit because it couldn't be true. It's 65 million years ago. Like, I'll give you another example. In 1805, at, at the uh, Strait of Gibraltar, the British were, the British had decided to put a cannon battery in the mountain right there at the Pillars of Hercules. So they dynamited this whole area out so they could put these gigantic cannons in there because the British wanted to control all traffic going in through the Strait of Gibraltar. It's such a narrow pass, ships from the Atlantic would be under the under the 
uh, their cannonade when they passed into the Mediterranean. So the British had a fort on both sides of the Pillars of Hercules. They were going to deal with all traffic coming in. As they were dynamiting all this in 1805, they dynamited this area of limestone, opened up a cavern, and scientifically documented. They sent, they, they sent all the samples home to the Royal Society, but there was a gigantic leathery winged creature with a bunch of eggs that went into stasis hibernation. Well, it, 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 defi it defies explanation. It's almost as if a tremendous amount of mud had been dumped on it and then and then actually actually hardened by intense heat within seconds and trapped this creature in a bubble. And that creature just hibernated in stasis for at least a thousand years or so. It was just there. And they said it squawked two or three times, fell forward when it tried to spread its wings out and basically turned to dust in front of them once it had contact with oxygen. And uh, now this is not the only one from 1805. Many, many accounts of miners going into caves, opening up different areas, have come into contact with all kinds of prehistoric type life forms that were in deep hibernation as if they've got rapidly entombed and buried, just like turtles and frogs today, that when the desert dries out so bad and it doesn't rain for another 11, 12 years, those same turtles and, and frogs come right back to life as soon as that area fills back up with water. That's crazy. It's been, it has been documented that amphibians and, let, and reptiles can live for very long periods of time in stasis. Absolute, I'm talking about right on the verge of death, and their DNA is activated, and they come back to life as soon as as soon as they are bas basically hydrogenated. As soon as so they then, have turned up water. So would you would you say then that like during these super cataclysmic events, you know, the 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 um, with the nemesis deals where there was like liquefaction and freeze, you know, we have all these, you know, we found the mammals and the woolly mammoths freeze literally flash frozen. Yes, they were. Is, is that? what we're talking about right here where that event occurred and that's what ended up happening or i mean is that something different well we have we have two in, in our past we have two basically extinction level events that don't yeah. make sense there should have been nothing to survive this is another reason why i am a simulationist because i believe that there is no gradual development of humans i believe that we were manufactured yeah. somewhere else we have we, we, I'll just call it like I see it. The historical record to me looks like that this world we're living on already had basically black people, African yep. Americans in different geographical areas. Yep. Then all of a sudden we had Mongolid types in different types of areas. Then all of a sudden we have uh, uh, what we're basically we call Cro-Magnon, which, which are not the people that we're told they are. Because we have a lot of researchers now coming out telling the truth about what they're finding in Cro-Magnon graves. They're finding plaid plaid clothes, which is very hard to read. They're finding pearl buttons. They're finding very ornate metallurgy. We're talking about Cro-Magnon or Ignatian. We're talking about very, these are supposed to be people who live 30 and 40,000 years ago, but they had buttoned down jeans. They had boots that looked just identical to ours today. And, the cranial capacities was 300 cc's more than what we have today. Their arms are short. The men were six foot five to seven foot tall, but they had short arms. Right. Yet all the females were petite. This means we're dealing with a very technologically advanced sedentary race. Right. The Cro-Magnons lost their infrastructure. The only ones to survive are just like the Book of Revelations. Everybody runs to the kings and the uh, hides in the caves of the earth and underground. So. When this cataclysm happened, this is why we find this magnificent cave art. A people who have lost all their infrastructure have nothing else but art. So they draw on these, right. they draw, and this is why that artwork of the Aurignacians and the Cro-Magnon is so anatomically precise. These people right. were, were advanced, but they lost everything, completely lost everything. When they came out of those caves, they built the civilizations that we're familiar with today. Right. So do you think the architects of us, you know, these were created beings in this, you know, simulacrum, simulacrum do you think they created the, Denos the, the Denisovians, the Cro-Magnons, the Neanderthals, and then we were the final version of all of those that, you know, because again, you know, there's, 
you, you, if you ever did a, 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 a what do you call it, an ancestry or a 23 and me analysis, you know, they break it down ba based on like so much of you is sapien sapien, so much of you is Denisovian, so much of you is Neanderthal. So it's like they know, but it's like when, how did or why did those versions of quote unquote us disappear and now, you know, the accepted version. And again, of course, as you said, there's probably Cro-Magnons and Denisovians and Neanderthals living underground in inner, in inner earth colonies or cities. But why are sapiens sapiens the last remaining above ground, you know, again, like pro surface, are we just the most entrained, the most easily hypnotized by AIX? And that's why we're the surviving group. Well, I think there's been several modifications to the species and like, I'll give you an example. Cro-Magnon didn't have the intellect that was necessary to, to actually give life to the pro, to this experiment, this project. Cro-Magnon right. was a, was a hunter gatherer. Cro-Magnon was absolutely strong. But right. we have actual scientific reports now. Anybody can find these. Oh, archaeologists have found Cro-Magnon camps now that are full of, that, I mean, excuse me, Neanderthal camps that are full of Cro-Magnon bones. Right. Wow. Meaning, meaning Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal coexisted. That's right. Something happened to cause the infrastructure for Cro-Magnon to collapse. Once it collapsed, they were defenseless, and all the hordes that were way outside the, the, the populated areas, now they were free game. So those few that were stragglers and left alone and not in the larger communities, surviving communities, they were hunted and eaten by the Neanderthals. This right. is not theoretical. This has now been proven. Cro-Magnon Cro bones have been found in the burn pile, camp, in, in the boneyards of everything that was eaten by the Neanderthals. So we have a situation where Cro-Magnon at one time was technologically advanced. And from the from the actual wounds we see on uh, on Neanderthal skulls, right. they were shooting them in the head with weapons. Yep. Neanderthal didn't go near Cro-Magnon. They, they feared Cro-Magnon. Cro-Magnon allegedly came second. But Cro-Magnon, like I said, with the larger cranial capacity and the very short arms, could have never descended from Neanderthal. That's right. The Neanderthal were stupid, basically, with long arms and probably ten times stronger in body mass index than the Cro-Magnon. Although right. Cro-Magnon were very stronger than we are. Sure. So, so uh, we're, the situation, the, the, the actual education that we've received from the establishment about Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon is absolute bullshit. Oh, it's all right. You can piece it together by what by the scientific reports of what's be of what has been found. We're dealing with an advanced civilization that was sedentary. You don't develop short arms unless you've lived a technologically advanced life for a very long period of time. And the absolute proof of that is that the women were petite, but the men were 6.5 6 feet to 7 foot tall on average. To have males that are that large and females that are that small that are basically reproducing the race every time every time they copulate producing more males that are that large and females stay that short it's because they have reached such a, and they have attained such a level of advancement that they're basically policing policing their own genome and uh but whatever happened totally wiped out their infrastructure they were and they were and the few survivors were in the caves and they left us beautiful murals as they were hunted down by the neanderthal so uh, this is the actual story of what happened, and this is before the vapor canopy. This is before the great flood event. This is before any of the history of the Bible began. But it wasn't thirty thousand years ago. It was much sooner than yeah. that. Okay. Okay. So we're we're about ninety minutes into this. I want to ask you these questions because you're on fire right now and you're vibrating. We're both in resonance. <laughs> yeah. Now, now again, some of these questions are going to be basic for you, but not for everybody watching. And yes, some of you guys are going to be like, Jay, why are you asking these questions? You know the answers. But I'm doing this for the future people to come and watch this so that Jason can stop repeating this shit and he can say, go watch that podcast. I'm not answering that question again. Okay. So the first question is, what is the simulcrum? Is okay. this so, this different? Is so is this different? Now, again, I'm going to make these, you know, harder, not for you, but for people to understand. Is this different from what people hear when the words simulation or the matrix are mentioned? 
And then to tie it up for you to make it even better, what do the Essenes and the Dead Sea Scrolls say about the simulacrum? Okay, check this out. The simulacrum is a construct. It does not regard, regard good and evil. It doesn't care about duality. It doesn't do it. It's just a construct. So we're going to simplify this in the in easiest terms for everybody. The simulacrum that we exist inside is no different than a Star Trek holodeck. It is 100% technological. It has no agenda. It has no nothing at all. But what it does is phenomenal because it, it doesn't respond to human speech. It doesn't regard language. It doesn't care about none of those. It only responds to two things. One is it can absolutely read your mental blueprints. What you project into your informed field and your reality, it can read all that. But it remains a neutralized field unless your physical avatar does something inside the simulacrum that it can translate as you moving into the direction of the mental template you created. As soon as that one dynamic is met, it begins to build for you a reality tunnel that will commiserate with what you're trying to do. I do this every day. Right, I'm, I'm, right, now, my, right now, you would not believe all the resources that have come to me just in the last month since I Bro, began. I believe it too. It's happening to me too. It's happening yes, to I mean, me too. All it's, I resonance. Do it's resonance. It's the energetic field of resonance. We are vibrating in sync and we are creating this opportunity, this reality tunnel, as you call it, right. to bring this information to us because we are actually also ready to receive it. I agree. I agree. In, in my own case, in my own case, I had made the executive decision about two months ago that I, I said, you know what? I've already released over 200 videos. I've released all these uploads. It's now for me. It's now time for me to start taking a more active uh, uh, role in putting this information out. So I went ahead and decided I'm going to build a build a, build a better website. <laughs> I'm going I'm to start releasing um, more comprehensive data. And right when I made that decision, I'm talking about within days of making that decision, Somebody I've never met in my life, didn't know existed. I have never watched any of his videos. I don't know anything about him. But across the simulacrum, he and I must have been vibrating at the same frequency. I had a need and he met it. Now, I, don't, I haven't really talked much with him, but his name is Santos Bonacci. I know, you, I know you've heard of, of him. Of course, so, yeah. So, so <laughs> he asked me if, he, if I wanted to come on a podcast. Now... He only asked me a few questions, and I answered those, and, and, and he, he, he participated just a little bit, but, I was, but it was uh, Logan of Decoder Reality that was the one actually interviewing me. So I was invited back, and I came back. Well, I'm going to do another podcast like on June, uh, July 2nd with, uh, uh, with Santos, but he's the one that the universe sent to me when I had made that decision. Hey, you know what? It's time. I've already put out too many videos. I can't just keep doing uploads and... Uh, I haven't actually broadcast myself out there. So he started the ball rolling, and it rolled fast. I'm talking about with, within three weeks, I, I went up 4,000 subscribers, and then I went up another 4,000 two weeks after that, and then I went on a roll getting 1,000 subscribers every three days You know, in the past week. So oh, that's imagine how many you're going to get in the next week. And and by the way, oh, you're right, right. And, and I want to add to that, You know, then you went on with Alpha Vedic guys who are close personal friends of mine. Okay. You know, then I watched that and I reached out to Mike and, and said, Hey, introduce me to Jason. You know, I want to bring him up next. I want to go deeper, but honestly, bro, like, yes, it is an informed field of resonance and you are creating a better reality, not for just yourself. Cause you're not in service to yourself. You're in service to creation. You know, this one right, no no. from Hawkins. No and no. when you're in service to creation, opportunities are literally attracted to you. I agree. So, I agree. I agree. I'm not all. Uh, as a matter of fact, my belief in God, uh, did not. Uh, my research did not take away from my belief in God. It actually amplified it right. into a. I have a better understanding of the Oversoul. I understand right. now that I'm living in an artificial construct. Right. Well, a a actual, real, true, immortal God is not going to put me into a situation that it can't 
control in the end. Right. I personally believe, and no one can convince me otherwise, I have read the data, and all the traditions in the world have an underlying story embedded within them that there was a trickster who was actually demonized, called a trickster, a true benefactor entered into this creation and basically won the war for us so we would never have to worry about anything in the future. The problem is another Another entity is in here with us. It's not the simulacrum. Let's go back to your first question about the simulacrum. The simulacrum is a vehicle by which by which immortal spirits can live through an artificial physical existence. It's nothing but a holodeck. It's just a really big one. It's like a Hunger Games dome where all all kinds of phenomena can be replicated and the and the participants actually believe there's some real danger when there isn't. Now, now in Hunger Games, there was real danger. They died. But what I'm saying is, in this, in this context, if you're an immortal being, then a physical god should be offensive to you. Right. Anything in the, anything in the, if everything physical is a tool to be enjoyed, a tool right. to be utilized, then right. God is not going to manifest physically. There's no need to. There's no need to immerse yourself in physicality to reach it, a spiritual audience. If I'm a spirit, I don't need the oversoul to come in here in a physical body. This is what AIX has done, created all these religions to get me to forget right. that I'm a spirit by thinking God is physical. Because that's once a, I start right, doing Jason. that... That's 100% right. And, and to, to, I don't mean to interrupt you because you're on a, on, on, on a roll, but I want to add this so that people can understand what you're saying better. It's externalized saviors. Whether yeah. it's your doctor, it's Jesus from the Bible, it's your Catholic priest. It literally, AIX has created a vibration of externalization. Right. So that people don't go within to their informed field and create that connection with God, which, you know, I call is your higher self, right? The light of being. And that's what it's done. And so the people that are disconnected, vibrating down here in victimhood and shame and anger and everything else, which, as you know, there are many from the last two and a half years. We're going to get to that. They are not connected to source, Jason. They do not have an informed field that even allows them to be interested in what you and I are talking about, which should really be the only thing that people are talking about and interested in at this point. I agree. No, no, there's no doubt. There's no doubt. It's uh, This is why this, this actually goes in tandem with what you asked earlier. I believe that the biblical material is supernatural. But I'm also going to tell you with the same mouth and in the same moment that the historical stuff you read in it is absolute bullshit. Now, the reason I can take two opposites and base, basically create a coagulate out of them that I call truth is because the parables of Jesus are images of truth. The right. messages in the scripture, the stories themselves are a dialogue. It doesn't matter if they're physically, they actually happen. We're being conveyed very deep things because right. truth is always given to us in copies and in artificiality and right. in images. Anything that's given to you straightforward and actual is a product of AIX. It's the physical world. And this is what people have fallen prey to. They believe. That if something is in the physical world, you hear it all the time. I don't believe it unless I see it. Well, that is almost the exact opposite of what a spirit does. A spirit lives by intuition. Right. Intuition is what guides the spirit, not the eyes. The eyes can see anything. So that's right. I'm a, I believe. I believe. Well, I believe 100 percent that the, the biblical material is supernatural, but it's only supernatural to those it was who were meant to see. That's it's right. not there. It's not there to open up the eyes of the living dead. There are living dead constructs all around us in our communities that are not worthy of this information because they don't have the same soul apparatus we have. This is why the me they believe everything in the media. This is why they're always going through the thing. They're, they're living in a, a, a whole lifelong feedback loop. Every day is the same. They fit into perfect molds. I right. don't believe, I don't believe that every single person that you see in this reality is these messages are for them because i also don't believe that jay campbell or jason brashears or anybody here i'm just going to pull a name off Chris, christopher shira i don't believe this man either 
was ever put here to save anybody. Hell That's no. not why we're here. Or it's not why we're here at all. Because a true benefactor would have never risked his creation to be lost. Right. Now, would he allow them to think the battle was lost? Would he allow them to think that there might be a problem? Yes. Because if I was the creator, I would allow that too. Because I know that my creations are going to develop. They're going to become problem-solving engines. I may even put this fantastic riddle of a great pyramid out there just for them to solve. I may do all kinds of things. But in the end, the battle has already been won. There is nothing to fear. And this is the message I would give them. But I would only give it to them in similes, in metaphors, right. in in parables i would never give it to him direct because that's not what a what a immortal god would do wow man beautiful man you're on fire okay the next question and again i know this is basic but again for everybody who's watching this and, and again this is frame of thought we are in frame of consciousness right now define aix was it created by the quote-unquote dark archons is aix another name for what you and I have read about Demiurg, Yaldabaoth, Lucifer, Satan. Is it a negative computer program? I know there's a lot in there for you to compartmentalize and parcel, but <laughs> answer. Okay. The idea for AIX came from here. In order to answer your question, you have to, you have to follow my reasoning. In the course of my studies, I study history with a calculator in my hand. I want to see all the mathematical patterns. I want to see if there's anything to be discovered in the frequency of plagues and wars and, and treaties, mass migrations. I want to see, and I, and I documented thousands and thousands of pages of mathematical notes showing all these events in history, the timelines. I wanted to know everything. I wanted to see if there was something to construct, and I found that there was, and it blew my mind. This is how I found the, ne the Nemesis X object periodicity. This is how I found out the Mayan long count does not end in 2012. This is how I found out the 138-year Phoenix protocol. This is how I found out, and I've never revealed this on, even on my own channel. I have a video in production where I'm going to, but this is also how I found out that AIX has its own 138-year period deals where it tries to mimic the true one to throw people off the calendar because Phoenix from ancient times was worshipped. It was worshipped in ancient Egypt as the keeper of the calendar because people knew no matter what happened, no matter, no matter if new governments instituted new, new timekeeping systems or whatever happened, the next time Phoenix appears, we'll be back on that 138-year year timeline. And that 138-year timeline was very well known in antiquity. Now, like I said, the elite knew in 1764. They hid. But as soon as they came out of hiding in 1764, they released their wealth into the public. They started a great series of wars, and they overthrew all the monarchies and turned around and started the republics and all the democracies, <laughs> began, began the United States. All of this happened. As soon as they realized that the 138-year period, they were safe, and the phoenix passed by, but it didn't destroy a lot. So they were safe, and they, and they basically caused all the 1800s to what happened then they went they, their coward asses went hiding again around 1899 1898 1897 they went hiding again and that's why we had this great chaotic period at the end of the 1800s all the wealth had been pulled back out they're in hiding 1902 comes around after the month of may all of a sudden they come out of hiding the big they missed the big one again. They're happy. And what do they do? They unleash all these corporations, institutions, companies. I mean, even the very things we take for granted today all came about in 1902. Right. Believe me, can you survive without air conditioning today? Hell no. No. Air conditioning came out in 1902. That's right. Almost, almost every vacuum cleaner is invented in 1902. But they weren't. They've been around. The elite have had these inventions over and over and over, and they keep hiding them. So AIX, to me, when I see this all throughout history, AIX, to me, is stirring up the pot. AI, the, the, the reason it's called AIX is because now that I have, a, I have agreed that, okay, all my data sets point to one thing. There is no way the history of the world could have unfolded this mathematically perfect in all these different data sets unless I am inside some type of mathematical holo field. I am in a mathematical construct that I perceive as history. So taking that into consideration and knowing that I have a benefactor who has been with me from the very beginning and has not abandoned me and has left his message in different 
like the Essenes in the Dead Sea culture, the Dead Sea text culture, the Egyptian Nag Hammadi text. Right. The benefactor has left his signature all throughout the Bible, but it's but it's not what what the actual people who are reading the Bible are going to find. It's right. what the it's what the errants are going to find when they read it. The errants are going to find the right information in the Nag Hammadi text. They're going to find find the information that was meant for them in the Egypt in the uh, Egyptian Book of the Dead, translated by Wallace E. Budge. They're going to find all the all the clues about who they really are. Errants are going to find these in the Epic of Gilgamesh. They're going to find them in the Atrahasis Epic. They're going to find them in the old ancient translations of the Rashamra documents from ancient Canaan. Errants will always be drawn to the to the sources and the text by which the benefactor had revealed many things about himself. And when we go and reread all these texts, it's obvious who the benefactor is and whatever this other force is, it's not the benefactor, but it always demonizes the benefactor, calls him the liar, calls right. him the calls him the trickster, calls him the serpent, calls him all kinds of names. And, and but the benefactor never appears in religious texts. Right. The right. benefactor has nothing to do with religion. Is actually old Latin words put together to that means to re uh, to rebind or to bring under bondage again. That's right. That's right. Religion is you are. It, it, the Latin is regulare. That's absolutely true. And it is to bind to bind yes. them together. Yeah. So it, it's really talking about almost like dungeon dungeon cups, but uh. <laughs> It is. I mean, think about it. All the Abrahamic teachings are using that same original Latin codex from Word. You know, uh, one of the little watchers right now, Jake Parsons. Shout out to Jake. He is the hundredth monkey on all of the social media. I'll definitely connect you guys. You guys should do a show together. He's a brilliant guy. But he's been saying this for a long time too. That you know they use the root language origin or the etymology of words to hijack. Again, our energy fields, because they're using words that are encoded and inverted. And again, there's a great author that a lot of you guys watching. I don't know if you've read any of his work, Jason. Uh, maybe you have. His name is Sabir. Uh, I'm sorry, Pierre Sabak. He's a good friend of me and Jake's. Uh, I've done a bunch of shows with him. He's another guy that you could talk to or interview with because he's amazing. But I mean, he's literally decoded their inversion of language. Oh, wow. So again, they've been doing this for thousands of years. Okay. Hey, I just saw a comment. I didn't know Apocalypse How. Okay, I didn't know that was his name, but here's here's your hard drive. He's talking about the hard drive right now in the uh, in the chat. Okay, Apocalypse How uh, didn't want to didn't want to order my little flash drives because I have I have flash drives I offer that are compartmentalized because I have so many Phoenix sure. videos, Phoenix articles, all kinds of uh, uh, hundreds of charts all about the Phoenix. I offered on one flash drive. Then I offered the Anunnaki, the same thing, 49 videos, hundreds of charts, 150 articles, all that on a different flash drive. Well, he contacted me and said, hey, man, look, I just want to cut to the chase, and uh, <laughs> I want copies of all your data sets, and I'm going to send you a, hard, a terabyte hard drive. He did. I'm just going to let you know. Awesome, well, job on that. Good It'll job, be in the mail tomorrow, man. It'll be in the mail tomorrow. It took See, that's how months. amazing you are, bro, that you go out of your way to help people like that. So, again, props to you. Okay, so one question about the Phoenix resets that you kind of haven't answered, you kind of have in your videos, but not tonight, and that is, are they restricted to geographical areas or are they totally selective based on the consciousness of the collective of that specific area at that time? Okay, Oh. Uh, it comes at great difficulty to be really, really assertive in answering this because one, the amount of records that have been lost right. prevents me from being really specific. Sure. But, but from what we have, uh, it, it seems like Phoenix is very, very discriminating. Sometimes it appears four times in world history, it basically affected the entire world. Right, and and it was it was remembered to do that. Then a couple times it was hemispheric, but every other time it was highly localized. The destruction was intense. People in other cultures that were nearby actually watched it without without any harm to themselves. That's, that's amazing. Which again yeah. is more proof again if it's a simulated holographic reality. They're editing time space. Yes, they they, they listen. What goes on in the field in the field of, of uh, 
of uh, destruction is harrowing. But Phoenix is not a normal a phenomenon. Phoenix actually ignores a uh, whole whole frequency, whole uh, ranges of frequency. If people are vibrating at a certain frequency right. and low low vibrations, and they're in that community, it hones in on them, That's and right. and the, the destruction is massive. It's harrowing. It's night. It's nightmarish. But at the same time, we have stories from the old world that that basically serve as archetypes of of people and families and small communities that were in the middle of the storm, totally spared. Suffered. A single thing. Even their animals and livestock were untouched. It doesn't what, even make so. What does that have to do with you know the whole biblical bullshit of the marking you know right of the Hebrews above the thing and the you know the sacrifice of the firstborn? Okay. So one, the one, one thing. The, one thing the rabbis got right was recording recording these archetypes. They right. just got the dates wrong. They got the right. situations wrong. So right. when it came to the Exodus event, they described how how. You basically survived the Phoenix. Right. How do we know that it was the Phoenix that destroyed ancient Egypt when the Israelites made their escape? We know this because the rabbis themselves said that every 138 years, the angel of death visits destruction on the world. That's a pretty profound statement because we already know that Phoenix visits every 138 years, like clockwork. And this is, I mean, you're, I don't even have to say it. I, I've got almost, I've got like 60 videos on that. So, it's a, and and three published books about the Phoenix phenomenon. Uh, anybody who doesn't know by now that we have something very unusual happening to our world every 138 years is just not even part of the conversation. All the data is there. You just haven't reviewed it. But uh, the data is profound. This is what the elite feared in 1764 when they hid. This is what the elite feared in 1902 when they hid. It right. just th those weren't the big ones. Right. So. Uh, when you take all that into proper perspective, you understand why the world is so chaotic today. What are they doing? They are burrowing underground. Right. They, are, they are getting their facilities ready because right. they knew in 1764 and they were wrong. They knew in 1902 and they were wrong. Right. This time they know they're not wrong. This is the big one. So uh, they're going to be hiding. So the, the story you're talking about, Jay, with the Jews talking about the angel of death in 138 years, uh, Egypt. The same thing was said of Sodom and Gomorrah. When Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed from the sky, it was the rabbinical scholars right. in, in, in the rabbinical writers of the Jewish Haggadah described that as the angel of death appeared in the sky and destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot, Lot and his family were okay, except for the one member of the family who was still vibrating on the frequency of the inhabitants of the city of Sodom. Because she turned around to see what the fate was of those people. So she borrowed some of their frequency. And what happened? She mineralized instantly into a pillar of salt. Phoenix Phoenix got her too. Phoenix was leaving her alone. She was staying with her family. She's vibrating on their frequency. Phoenix, Phoenix only attacks a certain frequency range. That frequency range is shared by the elite. Because they all know they have thousands of years of guilt to pay for this That's is right. why they always hide from the phoenix they hide from the phoenix not not because basically they fear that it might kill them but because it targets that frequency that they're in all the evil shit you've heard about the elite that's been leaked in the news and all that, that stuff's probably true. And that's why they have to hide from it. Right. They've got to, they've got to burrow deep underground because this thing is a range finder and it's going to find those frequencies and obliterate them. So they hide and they scatter out and they and they build multiple multiple facilities and they make sure that the actual power structure is intact. No matter how many facilities are destroyed, if just one survives, they can come back they up after with yeah. their technology, with a bunch of their wealth and all this stuff and take back over. This has been going on for a very long period of time. Amazing, man. I mean, honestly, you've, you've decoded everything, but I, you know, I have a lot of other questions that are very similar stuff. I'm going to skip through some of them. You briefly mentioned the Anuna, the Anunnaki. Uh, who are they in the veil of, you know, what Sitchin and, you know, guys like Gerald Clark, who is a good personal friend of mine, you know, Freer, the people, you know, a lot of people think Tellinger's disinfo. I've been seeing people comment and stuff, but who are they in your research, and are they the ones that are the elites hiding underground? Or are there factions of them that are part benefactor, part malevolent? 
All right. The story that's unfolding with the elite today and the common people is a very ancient story. It goes back to the 35th century BC. Now, the Anuna, I'm going to hurt some feelings with this, but if anybody wants to see the core material, I have a book. I have a book that was published in 2011, Anunnaki Homeworld, but the real material is in my, is for free, and it's in my videos. It's in my Anuna Files videos, about 49 videos now. But the Anuna were nothing but an invasion of Caucasian people into a non-Caucasian world. The historic, historical records about the appearance of the Anunnaki were all written by non-Caucasian people. They were describing a they were describing a race of Caucasians, people they had never seen before, with very white colored skin. They called them Shimsu Hor. They called them right. shiny ones. They called them right. shiny, shiny ones. ones. Right. The Oriental people have always, in their artwork, showed Caucasian people as being giant goggle eyes. Well, later on, these statues were shown, like the statue of Judea, uh, a Sumerian king. I think it's Gudea or Judea, I don't know. But a Sumerian king from before the flood, he's got big goggle eyes. Shows him and his wife standing there. It's a very famous Sumerian statue. Right. Shows they had. Now, these people, we know they're Caucasians because the black-headed people were the Sumerians who recorded the arrival of these people. Said they came in fleets of ship from a place called Dilmen. Zechariah Sitchin turned this into spaceships, and he changed a very ancient Semitic air, old air. It's from the old Amorite syllabaries, and in, the, in that in that word is Shim or Shimu. He Zechariah Sitchin lied. He actually said that that word is translated as rocket ship, which is an absolute lie. First of all, rocket technology is very primitive, but but it did it never mention rocket ship. The word Shim actually means stone monument it's a very old word in the semitic languages anybody can verify that in a in a strong's uh in a strong's uh, concordance it shim also means monument but it also has a second meaning which is name and i i go i go through a lot of detail in my book the lost scriptures of giza my very first published book where i show all these ancient records that use the word shim as both monument and name it was interchangeable because in ancient times on your property you raised a pillar that right. was your shim that pillar had the name of your family on it and it told everybody who owns this part of the land that shim was a pillar with your name on it that's what that, that that's where that concept came concept came from so Zechariah Sitchin said it was a rocket ship but that's not what the early Sumerians said. They said these fleets came by way of Dilmen. They had escaped a cataclysm. I have isolated their homeland as North America. Right. And I'm not the only one. All I'm doing is parroting the great researchers and historians of the 1850s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, all the way up to about 1920, Lewis Spence. I, I, I'm, all I'm doing is showing their research. They're the ones that concluded this massive American infrastructure collapsed. And they all sailed to points all in the, what, what basically established the civilizations of the old world. So would, the, you, would, would you have classified these guys as the red-haired giants? The Anunnaki, that's who they really were. Okay. The, to the olive-skinned, to the olive-skinned, dark-haired, dark-eyed, straight, black-haired people of the Urumbaba Valley of South America, the same culture that was in the Egyptian Delta, the Greeks called them the Melampides, the Blackfeet, because of the black soil in the Delta, Delta area. Right. The same race of people was in the Yangtze Valley of right. ancient China. The same people was in the Harappan Valley of the Indus, the Indus Delta. Right. The same people are in the Tigris Euphrates. The right. five great river Delta civilizations all share the exact same tradition that these basically Caucasian giants showed up in the, in their, on ships in their uh, in their in their countries but they didn't come as conquerors they right. didn't come as conquerors. And, and jason this would also lead credence to viracocha uh quexacuatl again in the indigenous of south america you know sub uh, yes, all of them. same thing yeah that, they, they believed in their return yeah so this is the 35th century bc this is why all of a sudden anthropologists have always been really shocked by how in the 35th century BC, all of a sudden across Egypt, 
Elam, Mohenjo-Daro, Harappa, Larrick, that whole area, Pakistan, India, all throughout the Fertile Crescent to Jericho, Israel, at the exact same time, all kinds of new cereals appeared, all kinds of new wheats and barleys and, and things. Right. Some of them come straight from cotton, came straight right. from the Americas. Cotton is not found anywhere in the world but the ancient Americas, and, and then it brought it to Egypt. This is where we get the Goshen cotton today. It's not originally from Egypt. It was brought from the Americas. The best cottons in the world are in Goshen and in the Americas. Although although cotton is grown in Pakistan and India, but it's a very inferior product. So all of a sudden, domesticated dogs appear in the world. They have no, there is not a single shred of evidence from an old tomb or cemetery that domesticated dogs dogs have ever been found anywhere in the old world until this invasion occurred they brought them from the they brought them from the americas we're talking about north america from mexico all the way up to the mound builder civilization we're talking about a civilization with an infrastructure that lasted a very long period of time to where they could breed dogs where they could they had copper and bronze metallurgy. They were very sophisticated. This is the type of civilization that suddenly appeared in the old world that the Sumerians called the Anuna. They were not yet called the Anunnaki for 1,250 years. Anunnaki is a very late word. It only comes from Babylon. And there's a reason why the name was changed from Anuna to Anunnaki. Today, we use them interchangeably, but they're not. The Anuna was a Caucasian race of people who in, were introduced into a non-Caucasian world. They were bearded and they were tall. Right. And the Chinese talk about them as being the dragon kings. That's the right. People of, the people of the serpent. But in, right. in that context, the serpent concerned a people who were very, very wise and technologically advanced. Right. Not that they were reptilian. Right. They, they were the right. people of the serpent. This is why in the Old Testament... This is why the tribe of Dan, which were the Phoenicians that were colonizing almost the entire Mediterranean, right. Greek, the, I the Ionia, Dodona, all the way to... They were the seafaring people. They were the ones yeah. who were the shipbuilders, yes. Yeah, the tribe of Dan were known as the Danu and the Danan. And when they invaded ancient Ireland and took on the giants called the Firbolgs, they became the Tuatha Danan, and they right. won their independence in Ireland in the Second Battle of Moitura. But... That was during, uh, the reason I know this history so well is that was 1135 BC and it was the Danan who used the Phoenix phenomenon as a, as a, as a tactic against the Firbolgs. That's right. So they knew what was going to happen and they waited for the sun to go dark. They waited for the earthquakes and then they invaded and it scared the hell out of the Firbolg. That's how they won. Yeah. That's so, amazing. All right. So, so then these Anuna, these white, tall, bearded beings, were they a projection of the Simulcrum? I can never pronounce that word. The Simulcrum, or were they put in here? How did they get here? Okay, okay. You talk. What are you talking about? Caucasians or what? What are you yeah, talking just, about? Yeah, just the, the Caucasian race and how they just showed up with this okay. advanced technology. Now, we have to we have to go to the ancient American traditions to answer that because we don't have parallel we don't have parallels for that in the old world. Yeah. In the ancient American traditions, they're very specific. The Mayan Popol Vuh basically gives you a, a, a template showing that the gods on the outside of the creation created a race and they put them somewhere. Then they waited a while to see how they would do. And when they didn't like the outcome, they didn't destroy the race. They just left it alone. Cataclysms happened, but there was always survivors. Then a new race was put in. Now, I'm going to tell you something very strange. I have read researchers like Neil Freer and others. I have read researchers that have put together a phenomenal amount of documentation and evidence to show that there is more evidence that entire races of people just suddenly appeared in this world ex nihilo, just like that, with full memories intact, everything. Every, I'm talking about appeared just like computer program. Hey, check this out. I take a computer program that's running a sim of all these people working in a community they don't know much about the outside world because they've been on an island for 200 years in this film i suddenly create a disaster in that disaster the ocean begins disappearing then all of a sudden i darken the sun 
everybody's going in chaos. I create noise from the sky. Some of the people disappear. And then when the sun comes back on, they're in a new world. I yep. just transplanted an entire code, a whole coded holography that I was running a sim over here. I just overlaid it onto a sim that's running, that's already running right here. Wow. Those of us, listen, those, those of us today that are deep off into uh, basically computer logistics and especially virtual reality programming systems already know how viable this is to right. take two different running holographies and then merge them. Only in a hologram can only only in a hologram can two different realities that are running co basically coexisting at the same time be merged together without any interference patterns at all. Only in a hologram could, could something like that happen. But this is the story we're getting from the ancient records. This is this is why the ancient Hindu were so fascinated with the concept of Maya. They refused to believe that reality was real. It was right. illusory. There's something wrong. Right. The, the, and you already know, I've said this many times about the aboriginals. The aboriginals of Australia have always known we lived in the dream time. Dream time, that's right. The student, All students of the Gnosis, we, we have a lot more details. I'm a student right. of the Gnosis. As a student of the Gnosis, we have more details about the construct. We understand the role of AIX is basically y'all to boy. This That's is right. the, this is the antagonizer. This is the one that tries to undo all the works of the benefactor. The benefactor is is basically far more powerful, but holds that power in reserve and only basically gives us little tidbits of information as we search for it. That's all it does. It never really actively helps us because all the all the help that we've ever needed is internal. And I say this a lot too. I tell my I tell my listeners all the time. I says you got to understand who we are. It says until you understand who you are in the context of this simulated beautiful holography, you will never understand that you can draw more power than you right. contain. You can draw from yourself far more help and uh, beneficial material data, uh, mnemonic enhancements, instant recall, everything comes from within you, not That's from right. without. That's right. Everything. Beautiful. Beautifully stated. Exactly. Okay. So I'm going to, I've got, you know, we got a full hour left. I mean, I sure. mean, guys, Jason and I could go all night, but man, I got to let the guy get some sleep. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll go another 90 minutes. I know this is profound and we have, you know, 200 people watching. Uh, and I know the comments are amazing. And so thank you guys for watching. And, you know, uh, like I said, you know, there's going to be a time for you guys. So the best questions, but I want to get through like my next like 15 or 12 questions. And some of them I'm just going to push real quick, but sure. um, so John Lash, you know, who is a, a Gnostic interpreter, you know, he wrote the book, not in his image. I know you're familiar with him. You know, he classifies the archons as two species, a reptilian leader species and a amoeboid follower species, which is kind of like a gray, I don't know. But do you, and again, this is his interpretation of the Nag Hammadi. And again, he's a very scholarly, you know, deeply researched Gnostic uh, theorist. What, what do you think about that? And let me just put it in context because you kind of said, you know, this whole thing about reptilian, there's a lot of new age disinformation, a lot of bullshit. There's so much with the dragon, you know, again, in our, in our, in our uh, literature, what are, if there are at all the reptilians, are they some form of a demonic apparition, a higher, or not a higher, but a lower density consciousness? Like what are reptilians? I mean, you have so many people in the ufology, you know, industry and world that talk about them. You know, I, I look at William Tompkins and again, he could have been, you know, a disinformer, but he wrote his the wrote book, you know, uh, 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 kidnapped by extraterrestrials or whatever it was. He was 93 years old. He was a product of the, uh, you know, the underground projects and, and um, you know, all the stuff that went on inside, uh, uh, you know, uh, Grumman and, you know, all the aerospace and stuff. And, you know, he says that the reptilians were real and that these are real beings who impersonate humanoid uh, uh, personages and, you know, quote unquote, can shape shift. He says they don't shape shift. He says they use technology. But with your research and everything you've come across, what is your take on this reptilian slash uh, archontic amoeboid uh, creation? Well, you mentioned everybody but David Icke, really. <laughs> <laughs> and I love David and I've had David Icke. I've interviewed David and David's great, you know. So, I mean, he talks about the reptilian consciousness and that aspect of things too. So, thank you for mentioning it. But your answer to that. 
Oh, uh, I've only found two, two places in all my in all my findings, man. I can only cite two places. One was the Dead Sea Scrolls, where there's a mention of uh, maybe the Lamech Scroll. I can't remember, but there is in the Dead Sea. I cite it myself in my Chronicon. There's one reference to uh, shape changing rep reptilian. Then there's one reference in uh, Akkadian text that that is, that is mentioned by Zechariah Sitchin. Those are the only two I've ever found in the historical record. That doesn't mean that that uh, it's not true. Right. Because, okay, you remember in the 80s, the movie They Live. Absolutely. Okay, true. You, know, you, got a, you got a trend going through YouTube in the past 10 years or so where people are isolating movies saying, hey, man, here's the truth. It's what we're doing. And I can't say they're wrong. They could they could be very well revealing tr truthful information through movies. So I believe they did with Night of the Comet in the 80s, yeah. 1984. The movie right. Night of the Comet was the Phoenix episode, perfectly. Right. So uh, when it comes to the reptilian deal, is um, I know that from distant antiquity, we have two different, basically, gene types unfolding. I know. Now, in the old records, they're basically between the Anuna and the Agigi. Now, this conflict between the Anuna and the Agigi has never ended. Now, right. I have never really tried to associate one of them being reptile or not, but if it was, if one of them was, then they're the ones that are occupying the underground facilities. They right. are the ones that can't come to the surface world for whatever reason, and they use ha human agents to do it. I can incorporate that into my paradigm, but as strictly a chronologist dealing with actual right. records that I can cite in bibliographies, I've only found two references. An Akkadian text talking about shape-changing people, gods, or humans, that Zechariah Sitchin mentioned, and then the other one being an actual citation from a record in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, so, uh, I just have to be truthful about that. There's only two things that I've found. But I have read R.A. Boulay's Flying Serpents and Dragons. Now that book is profound. Yes, I love that book. And the fact that he was a, a U.S. cryptologist and that his date he provided in there fit perfectly my Phoenix dates and my own chron chronicon, I couldn't believe yeah. it. I've never met the man. But he, he came by his analysis totally different than the way I came by mine. But uh, but that we got the exact same dates for the same events was uh was was awesome. That's, that's, that's right, so he was the first guy that I read about the water can. I mean the vapor canopy in the way that you wrote about it. So you're right. You guys are very synonymous, very very close. But yeah. I mean, look, that dude is very clear, and he says that these reptilian beings were here. And, you know, he even goes into Deuteronomy and, you know, all these Bible texts and talks about, like, Deuteronomy was a cookbook. <laughs> wow. Yeah. He I'm straight up says that that's how they were preparing the wow. human sacrifices and the child sacrifices because these were 16, 17-foot reptilian beings that flew around on dragons, by the way. Again, Boulay, this is all in Boulay's book. No. And they were eating human beings because they were a higher, you know, part of the food chain. I don't want to like rabbit hole on you, but it's in that book, and it's pretty difficult to to, to really truly disencode what he decoded. It's pretty unbelievable shit. Yeah, it is. It's a. Uh, it's. I, I just don't know about the reptilians, and I don't want. I don't want to support something uh, by inventing information. It's just. I, it's not in my nature. I'm not a. I just don't know. I can see it though. The uh the Mayan po the Mayan Popol Vu gives off the impression that different types of humans were released here, right, right. for a reason, which goes with my theory about about different races of people for different biospheres. So, oh, uh, uh, yeah, my my own personal interpretation is that every human group appeared ex nihilo. There was no development. There was no no gene splicing. Whatever, all that we're all coded. Every single every single. It's just so weird. Caucasians are the same way. We are the very last to come on the scene. This world was full of matriarchal cultures, right. stellar stellar calendars, right. totem societies. This world was packed full of all of that before ever a Caucasian entered the historical record. That's before absolutely, ever. that's beautiful, man. This is such a profound podcast. Okay, so we got to get to Jesus, Yeshua. The definition of Jesus Christ, the Christ, the Christos, you know, you and I go way back into the coding of all this. Is Jesus Christ just a allegory, again, of the Roman definition 
of the Bible definition, is it an allegorical quantification of all of the avatar benefactor beings or, you know, things that hacked into this reality to show us that the way out was within? Is that really what it is? Well, it's a, in order, in order to really break down the fundamentals of the gospel story, we have to isolate all the particulars that it wasn't. We're gonna have we're gonna have to look at at that where the deceptions were entered in order to understand what's real and what's fact from fiction. Now, the very first gospel was not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The first gospel, the first gospel was in the possession of a navigator who was a student of the Gnosis, and he has gone in the historical record by the name of Marcion. Marcion collected a lot of the letters of Paul. The only thing he had was the letters of Paul. Right. What he had, the original gospel, was called the Gospel of Marcion. It was the story of Jesus with 13 letters of Paul. That's right. the entire gospel. That's what he had. This he had in his possession before any church fathers ever mentioned any other uh, religious text from the Christian period. So Marcion, Marcion's gospel is very interesting. Charles Waite, over a hundred years ago, published a 500-page book showing all the evidence about the Gospel of Marcion. It is a fascinating book. It's called The Christian Religion for the First Two 200 Years. Charles Waite's book is very, is very academic. But in that book, you will find he cites all these earlier historians and church councils where it is shown that this man appeared from the East he had profound things to say, wisdom teaches, parables, similes, metaphors. Nobody could oppose him. The Jews tried tried to question him about certain things, and the information just floored them. They could not they could not defend from any of his doctrines. The man was never crucified. There was no earthquake. The, right. sun, the sun did not darken with an earthquake like right. it like in all, all the Phoenix episodes. Right. None, none of those things happened. He didn't have twelve disciples. He didn't, he didn't, he did not say he didn't have a, oh, he did not weep blood tears in the right. garden of Gethsemane. He right. didn't do any of those things. So it's just a beautiful story. Now, flat, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to fast forward about 60 years. Now, the gospel of Marcion was not a gospel. Right. Every element of the gospel of Marcion is compartmentalized into sets. When you when you read the sets, you're looking at you. You can imagine yourself sitting in an amphitheater and you're watching the compression of events as actors act out each set. You understand? Yes. All this stuff was a Samaritan Greek play. Right. Every bit of it. And the, when you read, when you read, just you can read the Book of Mark, which is the closest approximation to the Book of Mark is the Gospel of Markion. That's right. What you, what you do is you take a yellow marker and you cross out every single miracle, anything that is supernatural in the Book of Mark, because that was added that was added later by Jerome and Aga and Augustine. None of that was in the original text. He, his supernatural aspect was his words, what he was teaching. And right. that's all an immortal errant will ever need is to hear the truth. We don't need to see a vision. We don't need to see a miracle. We don't need to see somebody healed to know it's possible. So the, all these physical things were added through the church councils. They were added by the early church fathers. They're not mentioned by the early early church fathers. Jerome and Ignatius don't even mention almost any miracle Jesus ever did because they weren't invented until the Gospels were invented. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is packed full of all the miraculous. But the miraculous never appeared in the original. The original Gospel of Marcion was a very spiritual text, but it had nothing mythological in it. It had nothing uh, uh, no, there was no healing of the blind. There was no healing of the sick. There was no raising the dead. None of this was in there. But the letters of Paul were in there. But the letters of Paul are a very, very different message than what you read in the in the gospel. And there's a lot of Christians that don't realize you're you're, you're looking at two different gospels when you read the words of Jesus and right. you read the words of Paul. I'm not saying Paul was wrong. I'm saying it's a very different message. So. 
And Paul's message was to only a very certain, uh, uh, an uh, basically a certain ethnicity. He was only concerned with those who were descended from the house of Israel and where the, where they had migrated to. And he named those seven cities. Those seven cities he named are the seven cities that were basically capital cities of all the migrations of the ancient Israelite peoples. He mentions those cities. Those are the letters were addressed to those cities. But Paul's message was very different than Jesus. You know, I can't really compress all that data yeah. into this one podcast. Yeah. I, d I do have all of it in my playlist. I know you do. I know you do. All right, so let's highline summary this. And I know we're going to piss off Christians, and I know there's a lot of Christians in the uh, in this movement, whatever you want to call what we do, esoteric, truth, research, whatever. But let's just put it this way. The, 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 the dark archons, AIX, whatever, have hijacked the mythos the mythology, the idol, the 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 uh, ideology of "quote unquote" Jesus, Jesus Christ, uh, to teach the people about the "quote unquote" externalization that there's a redeemer coming to save them. Right? You can you can fast forward into everything today. Again, my doctor, yeah. Donald Trump, the White Hats. Yeah. People are yeah. lied to. Because again, it's the AIX, uh, you know, information algorithm right. that they are attracted to. Because as you know, Jason, they're unwilling to go within, to go with inside themselves. And again, we're going to get to that at the end of the show, so we can really like leave a legacy of this amazing podcast of like, what can each of you do right now, today, tomorrow, every moment of your waking, you know, now space zero point moment. But that's what they did. And so again, all these people. You know, going to church on Sunday, mass if you're Catholic, Christian, you know, the, the whatever the bully pulpit if you're a Christian. And again, it's this is not just the Abrahamic Christian side. We're talking to uh, you know, Jews and Muslims. It's all the same shit. It's it's mm -hmm. the same deception. And, you know, again, I don't want to hurt people's feelings because I understand that some of you guys do get value. You know, people will say, Yeah, but Jay, I like the fellowship. I go on Sunday. You know, one of the great Gnostic uh, scripture deciphers is Theodore Nottingham. If you're familiar with any of his works and his stuff just is mind blowing in, you know, parabolizing the words of Jesus, as you said, you know, again, whoever he was or if he was at all. Uh, and, you know, he likens it to Ahara Mazda, to Krishna. Again, all of these great avatar beings and all these different cultures on this planet, you know, could essentially be Jesus, you know, again, Enoch, Moses, whatever. And the truth is, is that so much of what he said has been literally interpreted, Jason, and not metaphorically or allegorically interpreted. And that's where most people, again, are hijacked. And then, you know, again, it's AIX, you know, because they're not willing to do the quote unquote great work, the spiritual practice of like, again, going within and internalizing, you know, again, whether it's meditation or contemplation or introspection or sitting in nature, again, the stillness is when source consciousness, God, whatever you want to call it, can access you and you can be deprogrammed from AIX. Uh, you know, that, that to me is where we are. And so again, I don't want to hurt people's feelings, but I know I will. And I know that this is going to get pushed back, you know, because the Bible thumpers as you once were, uh, you know, are going to come out and attack. But until you get to that level of awareness, when you realize that all of this is a deception designed to externalize your power, you'll never get there. It's that simple. I agree. I agree. With what I'm I mean, as long as I'm always looking for a savior outside myself, I'll never look for the power within. That's right. And, that, and as long as the elite can always put a savior before the people, right. the people will have, will have faith in them. And then they will exercise that faith. They will fall into, they will fall asleep knowing that they have a savior in a certain individual. That's and right. then the elite will pull the rug out from there and, and they'll do something. They'll execute that savior. They'll lock him up or, or they'll assassinate him like John F. Kennedy. And then right. they'll leave this giant vacuum of, of, destitution throughout the entire world and will get get stuck with a 9-11 post emotional period this is what they do they do it all the time they wow. create that they create that frequency that they can build in it's this a ritual a you said it before it's a ritual that yep. they then siphon the energetic fuel of who we are as spiritual energy beings you know, these resonant frequencies where, again, most people are vibrating in, in, in dissonance and incoherence, and they are feeding off of that energy, Jason. It's that simple. They really are feeding off that energy. 
I do. I, I believe one one hundred percent. You're absolutely correct. It's uh, it's 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 all about frequency. That's why the phoenix is not to be feared. And for those who fear it, you need to hide. You're not doing anything that's wrong right. going to find a cave and trying to get as deep as you can in there if that's what you fear. You need to because it's going to seek out your frequency. Doesn't mean it's going to find you. It's passed over a lot of people, but. Yeah, the Phoenix is harrowing, man. It's, it's all frequency. Okay, a couple more questions. Uh, I want to cover, it's not fair to you if you don't talk a little bit about the pyramids and then the number 138, and then a lot, along with that, are the pyramids the frequency generators of keeping this place intact? Okay, I'm, I, I'm asked that often, and I'm going to have to say no very firmly. Let me explain why. Okay, the pyramid dates itself, and I've showed this many times, it, the geometry of the pyramid is a calendar. It dates itself at the year 1080 Annus Mundi. Ten, now, 1080 Annus Mundi is our 2815 BC. Now, over 60 over 60 uh, scientific samples for uh, radiocarbon dating were taken over a two-month period of time, and it was astonishing to the scientists to find that they were within two to ten years within the year 2800 BC. Oh, uh, they had refined. They had so many different soil samples, uh, uh, carbon carbon fourteen samples taken from the same place, all producing the same same uh, year. Basically, basically told them that they know that the Great Pyramid of Egypt was built in in about the 29th century BC. So, but the Phoenix phenomenon goes way before that. We have documentation of the Phoenix phenomenon going way before the pyramid was built. The, the negative default programming phenomenon that we suffer today da is dated before the pyramid was ever built. Right. So, so I have to say that the pyramid is for something else. For it to be coded with the 138-year protocol all throughout in three dimensions, as I've shown on my channel, yep. and in multiple dimensions of phi and pi and curvature equations, we find the number 138 everywhere. It tells me that the Great Pyramid's function was something else. It didn't have anything to do with starting the Phoenix. It didn't have anything to do with starting the AIX protocol. It, now, now, those conclusions are based off arithmetic and geometry. However, let's add in the traditions now. When you add in the traditions, we find out that the Great Pyramid was built by Surid. When you do a bullet point presentation on all the facts that we know about Surid, it's the exact same thing we know about Enoch. And many of them cross over about Enki. So we have this we have these data sets that go down as a, a benefactor who was falsely accused of something and later punished are made made to vanish from the earth, this benefactor is the one that created this pyramid. This benefactor did something that basically pissed AIX off. I believe that the Great Pyramid actually injected new coding protocols into the simulacrum. I and it did it from within it, so AIX could not stop it at all. I believe that the war has already been won and that we have volunteered to go through this right. we right. are immortals but somebody hijacked the program somebody introduced aix and we didn't sign up for that 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 was undone by the very architect of this simulation going ahead and coming inside the simulation to build this architectural project but because aix can't read our minds this benefactor was able to tell everybody he was building a giant water pump station because that's what it looks like. Right. That's how it would function. It has a, a well going straight to a subterranean uh, cavern full of water from the Nile River, and this it had a mechanism that went at high velocity in the grand in the grand gallery, and we can see all the technolithic uh, marks in the niches going up and down, or some carrier mechanism went up and down. So whatever the whatever the official story was, that's what was broadcast to the people. So when AIX over a 90-year period is listening to all the conversations of the heavy equipment operators and the engineers and everybody, AIX is convinced from listening to hundreds of conversations that it's a pump station. But the true, the true genius is the dimensions, all the arithmetic that was put into this highly crystalline structure we know of as the Great Pyramid. Because the Great Pyramid, when you start studying it in depth and you see all of its anomalies, 
if these anomalies were all taken into consideration by the architect as it was being built, we're looking at an actual informed field made of stone. We're looking at the ultimate flash drive. We're looking right. at thumb drive that's built 454 feet high, packed with holographic data that when it was activated, it only needed two or three seconds to upload all this new data into the surrounding holography. That's what Enoch did. He was the benefactor. This is who Enki was, right. later later demonized as the trickster in the serpent. Right. Right. This, is the serpent. What, right. this is what Loki did. Hated by the other gods, thought to be treacherous because the gods were against hum, hum, mankind. This was Loki. This was this was the uh, serpent in in the Garden of Eden story. All this is the same personality. Any time we find in traditions that somebody is demonized, it's an you inversion. Need, it's an you inversion. need to pay attention because it's just the opposite. It's an just inversion. like today, if the mass media is telling me something, I'm looking in the other direction. <laughs> It's simple as that. Well, you and I aren't even listening to the mass media unless somebody sends us a tweet or an Instagram link, and then you click on it, and you're like, oh, fuck, I just got pulled into AIX. Yep. Okay. I agree. I so agree. So the Sphinx, talk about the Sphinx a little bit. I know the answer, but just for the people who, have not, who haven't heard you, talk about okay. the Sphinx. Well, originally the Sphinx was a representation 240 feet long the largest statue in the ancient world 66 feet high but it, at one time it was higher than that this the the head of the sphinx is 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 terribly disproportionate and right. this and anybody anybody who studies the actual anatomical proportions of the rest of the sphinx knows that the original architect would have never made a disproportionate head. The head we see on the on the Sphinx today is fake. It was created that way right. by pharaohs. It was carved down. Right. The original head was much larger. But the Sphinx in the ancient traditions, like the Greeks, was the Riddler. The Sphinx was a representation of the Tetramorph. The Tetramorph is the four corners of the Zodiac anthropomorphized into whatever creatures they are, like the bull, the lion, uh, uh, the eagle's wings. Once, at one time in ancient times, there was eagles, like wings were sculpted along the sides of the, the flanks of the great uh, uh, sphinx. Those have been etched off. The sphinx that you see today is not the original sphinx, right. as, was, as was discovered by Norton in the 17th century. After the Napoleonic Wars, somebody's been very, very busy changing the, state, the shape of the sphinx. Even the facial structure has completely been changed. Right. Nor Norton drew some very good illustrations of what the sphinx originally looked like. So, when he found it in the 17th century. And, and I know this is a mystery to you, because very, very few people have ever heard of Frederick Norton. It's, right. it, it, and that's by design. Believe right. me, they want to forget about that man. So, anyway, uh, the Sphinx was the Tetramorph. The, for those who don't know, the Tetramorph appears in the Old Testament and in the Book of Revelation. The Tetramorph is on the throne of God. It's four independent faces. Right. And in the Book of Revelation, mankind is basically told that the, the apocalypse is not going to begin until the seven seals are broken. As the seven seals are broken, it's the tetramorph that's reading the script. When a, when a seal is broken, one of the heads on the tetramorph reads what's happening. People don't realize they're conditioned to believe that the apocalypse was for what was, was basically to punish mankind for right. rebelling against God. It is just the opposite. Exactly. If you read the book of Revelation, you will find out that the apocalypse is to unveil the truth. That's right. The it's truth. revealing. It's yeah, literally it's a, a Greek, to reveal the truth to the etymological word meaning the, the revealing. Exactly. And at the same time, punish the elite. For, for this world that they have constructed by which everything is a lie. It has a dual function. This is why the elite go through so much hell. Not just the elite, but when the seven trumpets are blown, which is the apocalypse, we're not talking about the seals. The seals only allow the apocalypse to happen. But as the and the Phoenix event in 2040 in the month of May is the sixth seal. The seventh seal doesn't happen on Earth. The seventh seal is happening outside the simulation. And there's a conversation going on where outside the simulation, they're getting ready to unleash hell on earth for those who fear it, not right. for the, not for the errands. That's right.
That's revelation right. is a, revelation is about the phenomena that you will experience according to where you were at in your frequency. That's absolutely right. And so we're going to get to the last question uh, that's going to cover that in depth. And again, it's a solution for all of you guys. Okay. Again, I know a lot of you guys already know this. Okay, so just quickly about the moon. Um, obviously, you and I know from the ancient texts and books that we've read that the moon wasn't always there. What right. is what is the moon? And I and 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 this is something that's very interesting. And I've never, and I've read all the books on the moon, you know, it's a, it's a gravitational holographic, you know, spaceship it's out there, you know, but it, it does, you know, high and low tides, you know, women's menstrual cycles are regulated by that men's, mm -hmm. you know, uh, hormonal andropause cycles are regulated by that. Like who put it there and what was it truly designed to do after, you know, the great cataclysmic event? Okay. In my in my chron chronology, and I show many definitive reasons why, the capture of Luna, the first appearance of the moon, which separated the, the Selenite cultures, which the pre-Selenites were those who existed in, on this world before the moon ever appeared in the sky. Right. After the moon appeared, the vapor canopy appeared almost suddenly. <laughs> now, now, it did. So, the, when the moon first appeared, it was 4039 B.C., when that appeared, and it's in the old old Anuna calendars, and I show this in my Anuna yeah. files. So, but the the moon is attached to the Igigi. The moon was well, and the Igigi are the observers. Right. We the call, we call them the watchers. The watchers. Yeah. Yes. When you when you marry these concepts together, we have the appearance of a super construction that is brought from another another place and put here in our sky and that it is observing us uh, here's something you might not know there's a there's over 60 different scientific reports that all talk about different craters on the moon right. have been observed opening like irises and objects coming in and out of them yep. and then the crater will close like an iris yep. this has been documented since the 50s this has been has been, been, been kept from the public it's very quiet but uh, yep. there's a there are Russian Russian scientists that are absolutely prestigious. They are the cream of the crop in Russia in the 1960s, and they put out a series of reports, but the rest of the Western world silenced it, didn't report it. But all throughout Russia and China, it was reported what they found, and they found that the moon is a super construction and that what we're looking at is a hologram hiding something else. This was their conclusion in the 1960s. This is why the Russians knew for a fact the Americans never went to the moon. So do you think with the vapor canopy and the moon showing up around the same time that there was some credence to, you know, Maldek or whatever you want to call it, Marduk? There's so many different names for this, you know, quote unquote planet that was blown up. Uh, you know, maybe by a comet, maybe by technology, maybe the Phoenix, whatever. Do you think it's possible that there is truth to that? And that's what caused the vapor canopy and the Luna, you know, to show up at the same time? Well, uh, I don't know. I have to strip. I have to strip away the pronouns. The pronouns are what confuse us. All right. Yeah. What you just described to me is a broken intruder world that came close to Earth and caused a cataclysm. Right. If, I, if I break it all down to its lowest common denominators, that's what you just said to me, is a right. is a intruder planet that has been damaged that came too close to Earth and caused a cataclysm. That yeah, I and Velkovsky writes about this, right? You, you've yes, read Velkovsky's books, right. 1950, Worlds in Collision, he wrote about that's that, right. yes. That's now, right. but but he, but Velikovsky, none of his ideas were very original. I, right. I follow Velikovsky. I really like Velikovsky. Well, we have to go to his bibliography to find out that he got all these ideas from Hans Bellamy in 1901, right. and then he, and Hans Bellamy got his ideas from from an engineer in Vienna who wrote who wrote some books whose name was Hans Boringer. These men were the right. ones that came up with the Velikovsky theories. So, uh, anyway, having said that, I agree with that, and my own model is is slightly different. That we have. We have what the United States government has dubbed the nemesis cataclysm. This comes from 1983 and 1984, where independent government-funded think tanks were given the exact same data, and they came to wow. the exact same conclusions without ever having contact with one another. Those conclusions were that our system is actually a binary, and that one right. of the stars has collapsed. 
it's still there, but we can't see it optically or in telescopes. We only know it's below our own ecliptic and far down there at a declination of about 17 to 13 degrees. We know it because the further away a world is from our sun, the greater its tilt on its axis. Something else is pulling on it. So this is why I'm always telling people, so listen, you understand, astronomy has many, many very important discoveries, but they're only looking at the particulars of a simulated context. Those right. bodies are not actually out there. But the more we study the simulated environment, the more clues we have as to the reason why we're inside this experiment. We're going through all of this. So this, this is what I reveal on my channel over and over. Listen, the sky is not real. It's a, it's a series of projections. But we but, but by studying it, we get all kinds of fantastic clues as to our past. And it might not it might not be the past of this simulation, but it is the past of the real world outside of it. Right. So right. you know, people people get really hung up, and it's, it's you gotta you gotta really immerse into many of the presentations to really get a feel and understand because we're talking about time dil dilation techniques, right. and this right. is what really messes with people. It's really hard for people today to take into consideration that you may be. 67 years old right but this entire experience that you call life in reality may have only been 17 minutes with a that's vr right. in on that's exactly right it's imagined i mean it's like you said you know the aboriginals knew that dream time was real because in dream time when you go to sleep at night and that's one of the questions so i'm kind of fast forwarding it to right now but in dream time you're like you said your infinite immortal self your higher self, the energy and your essence as a soul or as a spirit being is free to roam about, you know, the multiverse, the astral realms, whatever you want to call it, not in this holographic projector field right. where the physical avatar body is, you know, in survival programming. Okay, so, and, and again, I'm fast forwarding a little bit from a question standpoint, but relevant. And by the way, Jake, what's up, Jake? He says, he just said, uh, he said, time, uh, I just lost. Oh, space is as real as time. So related to space, is it a total projection of our consciousness? So are we going back now to whether a person is in resonance where their informed field is, you know, strong and coherent versus a person in dissonance who's incoherent as an informed field, again, followed by or, or, or puppeted by AIX? It, this is an interesting question. I'm, I'm interested in your answer. Okay. The more visceral a person is, the lower his vibration. Right. The lower his vibration, the more his central nervous system has him jacked into an absolutely right. hard physical world. The more right. he is jacked into that hard physical world, the more he believes that everything in the sky is real and that he's on a plane <laughs> going around the sun. And he believes that's that it's all vibration. And that vibration dictates every perception after that. So uh, AIX helps people because that's all it does is negative default programming everything that it does is the saturation of negativity to allow you to lower your lower your vibration because lower vibrating individuals have a very difficult time resonating with anything that is spiritual and until they resonate on a spiritual a spiritual level they don't get those benefactor downloads they don't get that they're separated from that so that's the best way i can answer that Jason, that is so amazing, man. I love you, brother, man. Like, wow, this is profound. Our first show together, and there's just so much greatness coming from this. Okay, so I'm not talking about 1902. You already covered it. You already, you also already talked about the significant changes in 1626 and 1724. So let's fast forward to the present day, and then we're going to get to um, consciousness itself and what people can do to okay. you know, be ready to quote unquote, get out of here, you know, however you want to look at it, ascend, you know, break free. But so the, this is a question from one of your really biggest fans. He says, I want to I, ask Jason in relation to the present day, are all political leaders and or billionaires in on the, the C, I won't say it, the NWO, the great reset game, the fourth turning, however you want to phrase it, or are they actually, and this is an interesting question, hijacked, conscious npcs of these you know dark archons okay the uh 
I would like to believe that there's a splint a splinter group among the elite who are not playing game. Uh, they're not. They're not. They're not. They're not. But the the. Basically, the worldwide financial structure that we have today, if anybody's not playing ball, they can easily get cut off, everything get taken from them, and there's nothing they can do about it. The media can be used to demonize them. No. Since the assassination of John F. Kennedy, the game has been over. And right. the elite the elite are on board all with one another. And people like Elon Musk, who is raised up to look like a benefactor and a savior and all that, he is not. He is not. He is a member of, he is a very well-established member of the elite. Absolutely. Now, when, when the media begins to demonize people that like like uh uh Mark Zuckerberg, okay, like Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, when that type of demonization starts happening in the media and in social media, it's because one arm of the deep state is sacrificing another arm of the right. deep state in That's order right. to perpetuate the rule. To continue to do what they need to do, they need the people in check. And to That's keep right. people in check is to give them heroes that basically do away with the former villains. They create the villain. They create the villains. They've given Zuckerberg all the rope in the world to hang himself. They've given all. Uh, and, and, and don't get me wrong, a lot of them have been dealt with. A lot of them have been neutralized because it's all about controlling the population. And they only need to control the population just long enough to seal their last bunker because the elite will be gone by 2036 by 2030 they're not waiting until 2040 no. they never do they're no. they're gonna wait around 2036 the last underground bunker will be sealed they their families their militaries their acolytes henchmen their science their scientists their cabals uh they'll all be down there they'll be locked in place and they're gonna ride the storm they think they're gonna ride the storm out they're not coming up after 2040 like they did last time because it's a different this is a different time now they have to ride out two back-to-back -back cataclysms right one seen by mother shipton one seen by me published published 20 years ago i was 20 years ago i was publishing about 2040 and 2046 i said uh, uh nostradamus has, has i i don't even want to go into all those details well but yeah I, no so, so let's, let's, let's let's go deep and again thank you for that you also know the diebold foundation agrees with you 2046 and what? so so let's clarify and go deeper for everybody watching here this is quote unquote what the ancients the, the yugas you know again all the ancient texts the the maharaja the bhagavita they all talk about this again the papa Vui. this is the shift this is the true conscious explosion where the low vibrators the elites don't make it and the golden age occurs, and you are absolutely right. You know, again, the secret doctrine, doctrine which I know you read, Blavatsky, you know, they talk about these ages and that these are cyclical things. And so, dude, I'm totally with you. And that's why I have been driven by this whole raise your vibration, create the new earth, build the golden age. Yes, there's a lot of darkness, and we're going to have a question about the C and the V in a second for you. Uh, but, yeah, dude, I'm with you. This is where it's going. The dark side knows they've lost they've tried to take as many souls as they can you know again consciously through the v you know through fear-based programming and aix but you're right dude it is over you just have to stay in resonance as a being as a soul spiritual in, infinite eternal being not be pulled down into here and you got nothing to worry about yeah yep hey somebody in the comment section just mentioned trump and they yeah, have, I, that was my next question. Okay, <laughs> Go ahead, look, cover it. Oh, uh, listen, uh, Marco Phillips. Does anyone here know if Jason considers Trump elite? Probably. Trump is definitely a member of the elite. Now, Absolutely. Now, now, let, now, let me tell you this. Trump is playing a role, but he's also going to be given the very thing that he's promising America. I have already shown in my isometric analysis and my date sequence prediction that they were going to fleece America to fund the underground facilities and deep right. state operations. They were going to use American money to pay for underground facilities and do all this shit, help control the, the world. However, Trump being a member of the elite with Putin, who is actually his ally, and Putin, Trump, and maybe China, not the China that you know today, but the or nationalist China, don't think the communist the communist regime in China is going to continue much longer. They're about to be ousted. So we're going to have a new China. It's going to be a new world scene. They're going to be they're going to be totally different than the China that we're familiar with. They're going to be the nationalists back in control of their country after a very long communist dictatorship. So 
what, what, what I'm seeing in my in my isometric predictive analytics is that the United States, his slogan, make America great again, is definitely going to happen. America, United States military is going to shock some some nations very, very soon. Events are not going to go the way the media has been portraying them to go. It's going to. When great events happen in the world, we're always blindsided. That's this right. is what nine eleven came. It blindsided us. You know what I mean? When the tsunami happened in Japan and we saw the footage, that blindsided us. When we expect events, they don't blindside us at all. So what we're what we're looking at is the United States basically taking over control of its own economy again, which it's never done. It hasn't done that since the New Deal in nineteen thirty five. United States will now internalize, meaning hundreds of billions of dollars that have been freely given every year to other nations will stop. United States will start building its own infrastructure back up. Trump's right. They have plans to make America great again because they have plans to build a new ultra conservative witch hunting, witch hunting government that's going to absolutely do the exact opposite of this freedom liberal society that we live in today. We're going to have a Sodom and Gabor society where the Christian conservatives are now going to be in control and they're going to chase everybody out of the country that they don't deem as America. This is what we're going to happen. And, yeah. uh, the total opposite of what you think. So, so it's, it's literally like an antichrist program, whereas Trump is the opposite. Again, the inversion of what he's made out to be. And again, it's like you said, to fleece the American taxpaying citizen so that they can protect themselves in their bunkers and their underground cities in the hope and belief or event that they think they're going to find themselves surviving the next event. Do you think any of them will survive or are they all done? Well, they're going to have to be some survivors because the way the revelation plays out. The revelation, the revelation play, the revelation, and even Mother Shippen saw it. She's very, very clear in her in her visions. She mentions people coming out of mountains where they were hitting. She mentions that they come out of the mountains with their seeds and supplies, and 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 yeah, she mentions all that. But uh, the 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 apocalypse period is way longer than they're able to stay underground. Those facilities can maybe only house them for 20, 25 years. Yeah, exactly. It's gonna have to come up. But, the, but when they do finally surface, it's going to be a very different world. And when they surface, it's going to be a va vapor canopy world. Right. I don't know if the elite are ready for that. That's right. a totally different uh, that's a totally different environment. Uh, even for even humans are going to be very different. During a vapor canopy period, we heal rapidly. Right. We can hold our breath for very long periods right. of time. We can lift incredible weight. This is why during the apocalypse, there are several references in the book of Revelation and in the second Esdras of the prophecies that people are going to wish to die, but they can't. Right. Death will flee from them. It's because the vapor canopy biology is way different. We are we have whole entire latent gene sequences that are activated where we almost become physically immortal in the vapor right. canopy period. And, that, and that's the 700, 800, 900 year Methuselah lifespan because the, uh, the latent DNA circuits are activated. Okay, so... So, um, and then we're going to get consciousness and then we'll take some questions, you know, for as long as you okay. want to keep going. So... And again, I got to use code. You guys already know this. I can't say the word, but the C and the V. What role is it, you know, again, I call it the scamdemic, playing in the evolution of humanity slash life cycles up until the 2040, which is, let's say, 17 years away now event. Do you see the people who have, quote unquote, you know, consented to the V and you know, multiple times in the B are these people going to quote unquote, physically their avatars die off in the next two to three years. What do you see coming from this? Okay. I, I'm not qualified really to, to give you anything other than an opinion. opinion. Yeah, of course. Yep. And I have received photographs of these victims of what has come out of their bodies, what has been taken out of their bodies. Yeah, absolutely. And I have seen photographs of these things and i can only imagine under vapor canopy conditions what these oh. things things would grow into and uh wow. under the right 
under the right biosphere, what I'm seeing, what's being removed from human bodies in these photos of victims of that is harrowing. This is some Stephen King type shit. Yeah. So, so do you think do you think these will be Jason? The ne- I don't mean to interrupt you, but the Nephilim. This is be like literally twenty foot, eighteen foot demons. Well, I can answer it by asking you in your own time to read the book of Second Esdras. That's right. Because in those prophecies, he's very clear about the monsters that will suddenly appear in the last days under <laughs> under under unique conditions. Jesus Christ. Look, Robert Stanley, you guys know I've done podcasts with Robert. You know, we literally talked about that two years ago when we started talking about the the end days and that they would literally be walking down the street. It's true, Jason. They are. It's absolutely no question they are going to appear. They have been prophesized in many, many ancient texts. Okay. So, yeah, I'm with you. Um, But do you see like a mass? I mean, I got to ask you. I know it's your opinion, but do you see a mass die off before then? So in the next two to three years, do you see a massive culling of the Earth's population or not? Okay, well, our birth rate is swallowing up any death any any death rate that that is causing. All right, all right. So we have, well, if we're going to talk if we're going to talk about this even in code, we have we have to we have to let it be known that okay, they might have they might have initiated something, but there ain't enough people dying to even call it a pandemic. You see, oh. There are stages in disease. We have disease, we have epidemic, which covers a very large area and involves a lot of people. But pandemic is 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 a word they're using, but it's not applicable at all because we're still we're still increasing in population faster right. than people are disappearing. Right. So so the agenda was never for a mass dial. That was never the agenda. That was never that was never the intention. Something else is the intention. All right, I don't know what that is. I'm not qualified to talk about it. I really, I, I, I don't really have much of an opinion. I just know that the elite know what I know. They know there's a vapor canopy coming. It'll be here in 18 more years. I don't know what exactly they're doing to prepare for that, but they know what the conditions are under a vapor canopy. Yeah, they've know, they've known that as I've shown on my own channel. Uh, those conditions were replicated a few times in history. They can be studied, like in 1902. Uh, uh, when scientists grew two inches in a two-month period just studying the after effects of the Phoenix phenomenon on the island of St. Martinique when, when St. Pierre blew up right. and uh, killed, incinerated 30,000 people. So when those scientists were studying that, they grew two inches from the ambient radiation. That's crazy. They're, they're two period. inches. But imagine, okay, imagine an eight-year-old kid who's growing through a growth spurt. Right, right. When he, right. And he's born in the vapor canopy period. Your own son will be four times taller than you. That's right. That's right. And and by the way, to add to that, imagine a third generation, as my uh, business partner, Nick Andrews, says, third order effect of someone who's fully veed and boosted with mRNA, you know, replicating proteins and viruses in their body and spike proteins. Like, yeah. what are they going to look like? I don't want to go any further because, right, I want this deleted. It's an amazing video. Um, Okay, so I have two more questions for you. Um, I think they're probably the most important. And then these are solution based things for everybody to listen to. So if you're paying attention and I know all of you guys are, we still have 200 people strong, please listen. This is the most important thing that we're going to tell you guys tonight. So the benevolence, the benefactors, as you call them, angelic beings, if we wanted to find them, you know, according to the scripture, how do they operate in the framework of this, you know, AIX holographic construct, this holodeck of Star Trek, as you phrased it, in relation to the dark archons, the elites, the negative parasitic entities? Well, we have to take it. I have to answer this from the perspective of the paradigm that I have absolutely 100 percent accepted today, that yeah. I am an immortal being living within a mathematical construct. Yes. A simulation, and that there's a reason why I volunteered for this, and that I, I suffered a mind swipe because if I would have retained any memories from outside the holosphere, it would have negated the whole the whole fear factor. It would have negated the whole development of a personality because I, I would have always retained some modicum of memory of who I was before, so I knew all this was bullshit. You understand? So I have to answer this from that perspective, and I will give you a historical antidote about this have you ever heard of the story of the angels of mons yes i have actually i'm a i'm an angel i'm an angelologist <laughs> okay world war one in world war one we had 
we have the these elitists that are trying to kill a massive amount of Caucasians. Right. These elitists are a part of a certain ethnic group. Right. They're the ones that wrote your Bible. They're the ones that get you to, to pay all kinds of things in disguise, and you don't even know their taxes. They have infiltrated almost every organization and government in the world. This, these, these people hate Caucasians, and this That's hatred right. goes back at least 25 centuries. Now, many historical writings. I have a whole list of all the historical texts that mention what these people have done from century to century. World War One, they wanted to basically have Caucasians go to war against other Caucasians, that's and right. that's what happened. That's what happened. They themselves are an offshoot of Caucasians, but they don't claim it. Now, these people, these people wired up this great war, but the but the two factions didn't really want to fight each other. And on Christmas night, they are praying in the German camps, Prussian camps. They're praying in the American British camps. Right in the French camps and they're on this trench warfare line and a few of them just got together because they can hear the Germans singing Christmas carols. That's right. So they crawl, they, they laid their bayonets down, took their grenades off and they walked over through the trenches unarmed, hugged some of the Germans and then thousands of Germans right. dropped their weapons and went to the American side and they smoked they smoked tobacco and they sang Christmas carols the whole day. Time. They celebrated. That's right. Yeah. During, when this was going on, when the fighting resumed later on, when one group was about to get exterminated in a pincher move, all of a sudden these divine light, light I mean, beings appeared in the German front that was overwhelming the French and the British, the British expeditionary force. When it was overwhelming them, all of a sudden the Germans, left their their APCs, left their their mortars, they dropped their weapons, and they ran the other way because the Germans saw a united front of glowing white beings that they were terrified of. That's right. But none of the British and none of the French saw that. And ever since then, that has been called the Angels of Mons. And uh, uh, this is uh, I, what I'm describing here is I don't believe those are angelic beings. I don't believe any of that. I believe that those are actual us, but they're divorced of their avatars. That's right. I have a very I have a very harrowing video. So a lot of people don't like it, but I, I have a video about the origin of demons. That's the name of that video. And I describe who, what where poltergeists where poltergeists and ghosts and phantoms, uh uh disembodied spirits. Yeah, disincarnated. Uh, Yep. Where they all come from, what they are, but I that video is a is a description of the phenomena of angels and demons from the perspective that we're living in a mathematical construct and that we are immortal beings experiencing all this physically through avatars, and that these beings are the same as us. They're no different. They just don't. They're not jacked into an avatar. They're not perceiving the world through the central nervous the filters of the central nervous system. Right. They're free of that. They're, they're able to move, do all kinds of things, manifest optically, show themselves to people. They're able to do some pretty incredible things because they're not actually enslaved in the system. They're, they're for whatever reasons, they've, they've been disconnected from it. And I, I go into details of what I think about what happened to them. I believe that disconnect, those disconnection events happened on the outside of the simulacrum basically trap them here they're they can't go through life sims like us we go through life sim if you if you leave the if you leave this a life sim from a center from a from the central nervous system you immediately reappear in a developing central nervous system in a, in a nearby body and i show evidence on my own channel that reincarnation is real you're living through life sims and you normally you right. normally come right back in the same area that you left often within the same family that you are basically like when you you're a kid but you're basically the returned elder who just died in a nearby family it's a this this has been scientifically documented by many Jason, man, you are amazing with every fiber and vibrating atom and oscillating wave of my being, I know you're right. I've meditated on this. I've seen this exact same thing. It perfectly segues to the final question. Uh, so, you know, and, and this is from Jake's question, and I kind of uh, amalgamated it. But 
and you've already said it, so I'm going to just like get a little bit deeper for people. And again, this is more of uh, you know inspiration for everybody watching. So we're talking about consciousness and vibration. You know, you say specifically about the simulacrum, the simulated reality, and then the personal reality creation that we each individually, as infinite immortal spiritual yeah. beings, have the capability of. Of right. Um, I, okay, so this is my theory as it relates to yours, and it's we're really it's the same. But I say, and you already said this at one point, which is mind blowing. You you said I can't believe you actually said the exact same words, but I I say. That most people, which I call the herd, the masses, whatever you want to call them, the collective consciousness, uh, John, John Baines, if you ever read any of his books, Stellar Man, amazing book, he calls it the human central computer, right? It's a collective consciousness, a low vibrating hum, a dissonant hum. Uh, they react out of fear. And you said it best earlier, um, this is locked in, keeping them locked in an autonomic feedback loop of survival programming, which is obviously what AIX is pushing into the ether, into the ether, into this dimension. Right. Um, when you, it, it, most people watching here tonight, you and I clearly through the work that we've done and the research that we've done, when you get to that a level of awareness that you don't have to vibrate into that frequency of disinformation, of mass media, of fear-based programming, you are now again, this is my theory, you are now immune to that frequency and you, instead of reacting out of fear, which is again, 80% of humanity, and maybe it's even higher after the last two and a half years, it doesn't matter. Right. When you choose, again, remember the word choose is very important here. When you choose to respond out of love, which again is resonance and coherence, and this is done through your words, thoughts, and actions, and that's why I always tell people you got to use conscious words, focused thoughts, and massively loving intentional actions you have broken free of aix and you are now creating what you know neville goddard would say your heaven on earth as your frequency so do you is there anything and, and i know you i kind of know your answer but i want to hear you speak it um is there anything in that that you disagree with and if you do this feel free to, to say it but are we on the same wavelengths yeah yeah it's all about frequency i, I agree 100 percent uh, i'm uh i just uh I, it's, I don't want to beat it up. I, I, on my own channel, I'm always telling people it's it's the, the whole fear thing is so alien to me. I get it that you're scared of the future. I get it that you've got kids and you're worried about them in the future. I get all that. But I have abandoned that lifestyle years ago where I wake up in the morning and worry about the future because that, that whole, I'm not going to tap into a negative. I'm not going to willingly put right. myself into a negative. I've done that my whole entire life. And I'm not doing that anymore. So, so it's a, the message that I have for people on my channel is, is, is very simple. It says, there are two different realities unfolding every minute of your life. And you get to choose. There's a fork in the road before you every moment of, er of, of your existence. And that choice is always there. You can go the main way, the huge road that everybody else is going on, and you can feel the feel the flow of those frequencies you're not going to like it you're going to be in an ocean of negativity all the time or you can go on the very very least trodden path the winding path you can go on the narrow path you can be like you can be like the old philosophers that said oh walk unfrequented paths go by unexpected ways what they meant was not actually walking on a path or finding secret deer trails that's not what they were meaning they were meaning that there are two different realities unfolding. If you go your own way, you don't have to participate in the collective because in the individual, all the powers that you will ever need to deal with in life and to bring everything into contact that you need in your existence are from within you. Right. The other road teaches you that everything you need in life comes from outside right. you. Right. Two different, fundamentally different ways of thinking. Once you understand that you are an informed field and that informed field carries every emotion, every thought, everything you've ever accepted to be true, everything you've read, everything someone has told you that you resonated with. Once right. you understand that that informed field carries all of this with you every moment of your day, you're wearing an armor that the outside world could never penetrate. And all the all the power that you ever need in life 
can be drawn from you because it's not even coming from you. Like I say, you draw from yourself more than you contain. Once you understand that concept, you will realize you're a conduit. You're not a singularity. You are actually built to flow. All this stuff is supposed to flow from you. And the more the more wealth that flows from you, the more wealth you will be given. The more right. peace that flows from you, the more peace you'll be given. The more wisdom that flows from you, the more wise you will become. The more, the more that you absolutely give of whatever you have within you, whatever the benefactor puts within you, whatever your character traits are, the more you give that out, the more you are given. And it's a spiritual law. It's one that's even found in the Bible. Even in the Bible it says, to him who hath, more will be given. But to him who hath not, even what he has will be taken from him and given to the one who has. It's a spiritual law. It's it's a, You can't stop. Uh, you can't stop the river. If it's coming out of you, you just got to let it flow. But if you're if you're not flowing, there's no stasis. If you're not flowing, then that means the world is flowing into you. And that's a different situation. You've become visceral. You've become you're vibrating on a lower frequency. If you're one if you are one of the world, then you have basically isolated yourself away from spirituality. That's right. And I always say, by the way, that was profound, my brother. Again, love and light to you. That was I mean, my soul. We are we this is a resonant field that we have created here tonight and all of you guys are watching this and it's a gift to the universe because again we consciously co-collaboratively created this all together you know i told jason in my emails to him that i was manifesting this to be one of the best shows ever a lot of people i you know i posted in his archaics facebook group and my facebook group which is decoders of truth i said you guys don't miss this it's going to be one in a million and i I know for a fact, as I've been listening and watching and, and, and hearing this, that it's something that is going to be profoundly shared across the world for people like us. So Lazarus Banks has a great question, and I'm going to get to as many of your questions. By the way, are you okay to go another 10, 15 minutes? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. Just tell me when you're done, because I know we're going three hours and eight minutes. By the way, this is the longest podcast I've ever done, so credit to you, man. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Okay, okay, so Lazarus Banks, who's a close personal friend of mine, very high vibrating being like us, he says, Jay, please ask, do people have a choice to wake up to AIX or only a certain number of people allowed to be errants in this frequency? Uh, I don't believe it has anything to do with being allowed. I don't believe that there is a permissive context to, to the phenomena. Uh, there is a there is a number in the occult that they always referencing now because they know this is something that they they have known the elite know the true parameters of our existence far better than we do and they encode it in their degrees in their symbols iconography it's all there and that number is that no matter how many avatars are in existence at one time only thirty three percent of them are actually real. The rest are NPCs and living dead. And the elite have always known this. And, and the elite basically aim all their, basic, all their, they're, they're the enemy. They're not among the 33%. I'm talking about the errants. It's a, they, this is a, it's a very ancient concept. It's called, it's called substitution theory. And it was really popular in the late 1800s, early 1900s among Christ, Christian academics in, in substitution theory. The whole idea that 33% of the heavens was cast down to the earth and all that, basically mankind, our avatars, were created as a substitute to fill in that 33%. And uh, uh, it's a very old theory. It's not one It's not one that I created and all, but that number is persistent going back thousands of years until today. That uh, like the dragon cast forth 33 of the stars of heaven and cast them to the ground. Uh, it's not just a Christian idea. That ref that those references to 33 percent are found in Akkadian texts. It's very old con concerning the dragon. So, and dragon being AIX, artificial intelligence X. So we're uh, it, to better answer that question. I'm just it's uh not everybody around you is real at all. Right. When you see when you see some people that have suffered some very very terrible fates and all that don't be moved by that for two right. reasons one of them you don't even know if they were real that's right two you don't even know if the event was real that's right actually there's three reasons and the third reason is is 
is why entertain anything anything that didn't happen to you? He says, <laughs> it's a for real. That's what the news media does all the time. It gets you to that's it right. gets you to vibrate on a frequency on something that has nothing to do with you. Literally, man. That's literally, and, and as you know, you are only in control of your field. And you can make your field resonant or dissonant. And when you're in a dissonant state, you are a drone connected to that hive mind. Okay, uh, by the way, Jason's book, I'm just going to post some people's comments. Mike Kane says Jason's book, Jason's book, Awaken the Immortal Within, is really good, FYSA. By the way, I just ordered that book from you today. Uh, you know, I don't need to read all your other books. I know they're profound, but like, this book is, you know, my jam because it's consciousness. And now after I heard you say what you well, said, I, I kind of knew. Anyway, I, I just want to say this. Uh, for all of you guys, Jason has a full-time job, man. He's a, a stonemason. Like, we need to get Jason not doing that shit anymore. Even if you want to do it, like, we need to start a whatever it is, a collective. Uh, and I'll be, be behind orchestrating this where we create a private group for archaics you guys will contribute whatever you can afford to contribute don't tell me you can't pay a dollar 33 or 333 or 999 or whatever it is and we're gonna fund jason so that he can do this shit full time because this is ridiculous he's a living thesaurus we have 17 years until the shift the phoenix event whatever you want to call it we know it's going to be a benevolent outcome but guess what it ain't going to be benevolent for 80 percent of the species or 70 percent or 25 or, you know whatever it is you know 33 percent are errants we got to get more people to wake up, okay, to be awake. So Jason is a conduit to this. So I'm being a shill right now, but I'm going to be coming out to you guys very soon with a way that Jason doesn't have to do his job anymore, okay? Because well, we're not doing this. Yeah, I, do I do appreciate the sentiment. I do I do appreciate that, but I am full-time archaics now. In the last three weeks, I've gone Okay, full -time. good. I didn't know that, though. Yeah, because yeah. I was listening to one of your podcasts. I didn't know. Okay, so that's good. But anyway, I'm still going to help you out, so... And again, not me personally, but my crew, my audience, everybody watching this tonight, we're going to help you. We'll talk. I'm gonna, Like I said, I have a, an architect that me and you and him will jump yep. on a call sometime in the next couple of days and we'll figure out what you're doing and we'll, yeah, we'll that make was it better. A, that was actually true when you and I scheduled this podcast a few weeks ago. That's awesome. Okay, so so good. So that makes me feel a lot better. So then, But I, I, I can definitely help you in that regard too. Okay, so, so again, Jake at the 100th Monkey is a guy that you – and him need to do a podcast together too. He's extremely like us. He's a very close personal friend of mine. Uh, does Jason think the 144,000 pieces covering the Great Pyramid correlate to a possible 144,000 errands? Okay, that's a good. That's a good question. I'm going to get really technical really quick. All right. For those for those who have followed my research and seen in my published books, the charts and diagrams are absolutely fantastic. I show a six thousand and something year history leading all the way up to the year nineteen oh two. Now, starting with nineteen oh two begins a new calendar I call the Giza Course Calendar, where every single layer of blocks going up to the Great Pyramid is a lithic prophecy. It is a countdown. Every layer is a year. The foundation is 1902. The first level of blocks is 1903. 1904, 1905, 1906, 1907. The pyramid is 203 levels all the way up to a flat platform where a cornerstone is supposed to sit, but it was never added. The reason it was never added is there's nothing in this world that could have ever hoisted a rock that big to 454 feet high. It would have been gigantic. A, a basic bin bin stone sitting on top of the Great Pyramid of epic proportions. Now, that year is 2105. The, the, uh, from uh, 1902. 203 levels of the Great Pyramid going all the way up to 2105. But the 6,000th year that I've documented over and over and over since Phoenix created a new heavens and new earth through a pole shift cataclysm that was so devastating that the survivors believed that a new heavens and new earth had appeared was 6,000 years before 2106. 2106 is the 204th level of the pyramid. That is the return of the chief cornerstone, the stone the builders rejected. That is the benefactor 
this is what the prophecies are, are, are the, this is what the prophecies of the Gnosis were about in the return of a benefactor to earth to sit on the monument of man. The story is better epitomized in the Shepherd of Hermas text where God appears with seven builder builder angels and they build the great pyramid and every stone is a soul of man. Well, once the monument of man is complete, the very last thing in the apocalypse to do is to put back the 144,020-inch thick, 20-ton uh, casing blocks back onto the Great Pyramid. I didn't make that number up. Since the days of Napoleon, wow. mathematicians have known that the Great Pyramid, by the four blocks that are still sitting in situ at the bottom of the pyramid, they extrapolated and they said that 144,000 white gleaming casing blocks once adorned the entire structure. Now, those are basically lithic prophecies of the final 144,000 errants who stay behind but during the apocalypse, because the rest of the errants are removed to keep them from the evil to come. This is in the Revelation. It specifically says that, to keep them from the evil to come. The, the last 144,000 are fallen tears who choose to go through the apocalypse with the, the, the last remaining elite and all the living dead to pull those last few souls into the fold before the simulacrum is collapsed. Because right. when the simulacrum is collapsed, all evil and negativity collapses with it. 